Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Urban Planning Committee for December 1st, 2020. I'll call this meeting to order at 9.31. Uh, first of all, we'll do roll call with members of the committee. Uh, Councillor Henderson. I am here. Councillor Katarina. Good morning. Good morning, and Councillor Banga. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. So in addition to members of committee, uh, we can be joined by members of council. I see Councillor Knack and Councillor McKean and Councillor Cartmel. I feel like I'm on romper room and I could see all your faces. Um, no, I have a deep myself now. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, is there anyone else? I just don't want to miss anyone that I'm... I believe Councillor Paquette just joined. And Councillor Paquette, good morning. Good morning. Well, it's a pleasure to have Council and all of members of public join us this morning. Um, first of all, we'll do a motion for the adoption of the agenda. I'll move the agenda as it stands, I think. I don't think there's any changes to it. I don't see any, um, so we'll call a question. Uh, any questions? If not, uh, please vote. We have four votes, Madam Chair. Thank you, and display the vote. And that is carried. Thank you very much. And Councillor Banker, would you move the adoption of the minutes? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, please vote. And display the vote. And that too is carried, thank you. I'm not aware of any protocol items this morning. 
Um, and now we'll go to selection of items for debate. I can't, I can't click on. Councillor Henderson is trying to click on. Go okay. ahead, please. Um, uh, six one. Six three. Uh, six, uh, six five, we have a speaker. Six six, we have a speaker. Six seven, we have a speaker. And I think that will do it for me. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, for me, it's uh, six point one is already selected. Six point two. Six point two. Yeah, six point four. I don't know if that's been selected already. Not yet. Six point, six point four, then six point five and six point seven. And those two have been selected. Thank you. I see uh, no others. So, Councillor Katarina, would you move the balance? Madam Chair. <clears throat> yes, Councillor McKean. I'm sorry. I, I asked in the chat if somebody would select 6.9 yeah, on my behalf. Can we do that for you, Scott? Yeah. I'll select 6.9. Councillor Henderson. Six, nine, and I'll move the, uh, the balance if that's all. Thank you. Uh, which is six eight and six ten. Uh, please vote, um, Madam Chair. As well as uh, five point one, five point two, and five point three. My apologies. Uh, we're just missing your vote, Councillor Henderson. I'll vote yes, but it didn't come up on my machine for some reason. Thank you. And display the vote. And that is carried. And, and Madam Clerk, would you just confirm what we have done today? Certainly. Thank you, Madam Chair. This morning, Urban Planning Committee has passed the recommendations of the following reports without debate. Item 5.1, Transportation Network Performance Indicators with a revised due date of January 19th, 2021. Item 5.2, process for reviewing design and construction standards of cul-de-sac uh, with a revised due date of February 2nd, 2021. Item 5.3, Edmonton Design Committee policies and procedures with a revised due date of February 2nd, 2021. As well as items uh, 6.8 bylaw 19492 to designate the Monroe residence as a municipal historic resource and item 610 Edmonton Design Committee process for appointing architects. Thank you. And now we will do requests to speak. So I'm going to go to Councillor Henderson for those. I will move uh, that we will hear in panels on 6 1 uh, Peter uh, Vermeulen, uh, Brenda Shelton, Dave Buchanan, Karim Elbacioni, uh, Natasha Aiello, uh, Dean Stein Hassanoff, uh, Kathy Malkin, and Ashley Salvador. And on 6 5, uh, also in a panel, Francine Roy and Jane Smith. On 6-6, six, six, uh, Chris Nicholas. And on 6-7, Anand Pai. Thank you. All those in favor, please vote. And display the vote. And that is carried. We've already approved in the agenda the time specific, which was 6-1 at first item of business and 6-7 at first item at 1.30 as part of the agenda. So there's no additional time specifics requested. So at this point, we will go to uh, for 6-1, and we'll invite the administration to make their report, and then we'll ask the public to speak to it. So, Good morning, uh, Madam Chairperson, committee members, members of council. We're pleased to join you today to present the Safe Mobility Strategy, the City of Edmonton's new approach to reaching Vision Zero, the goal of zero traffic-related fatalities and serious injuries. Joining me today are Jessica Lamar, our Director of Traffic Safety, as well as Brian Simpson, 
Branch Manager of Parks and Road Services. I'm also pleased to welcome representatives from the Edmonton Police Service who are joining us online. We have Superintendent Dean Hilton as well as Acting Inspector Jason Mitzel. The Safe Mobility Strategy is a creative, modern approach to traffic safety designed to advance the strategic goals outlined in Connect Edmonton through the direction of the City Plan. Supporting our continued evolution from a city built for cars to a city built for people requires us to protect our most vulnerable road users through actions that make our, safe, our streets safer and more livable for everyone. The Safe Mobility Strategy has built a corporate approach to achieving Vision Zero and along with including work from across the corporation to advance our goals, it looks to every Edmontonian to help bring it to life. In particular, the Edmonton Police Service is a key partner in keeping our streets safe, and they have been a part of this development of the strategy and endorsed the approach. Ms. Lamar will now take us through the highlights of the strategy. Good morning, everyone. The safety and livability of our streets is deeply interconnected with the strategic goals outlined in Connect Edmonton. When we make it safer for people of all ages and abilities to move around our city by any mode and in any season, we generate broad societal benefits. We improve physical health and wellness, connect neighbours, reduce tragic impacts to lives and livelihoods, reduce the economic impact of crashes, boost local economy and contribute to our climate resilience goals. The Safe Mobility Strategy keeps top of mind actions large and small that support the vision for Edmonton as we grow to a city of 2 million people. Things like mode shift, 15-minute districts, and the development of nodes and corridors are deeply interconnected with this work. The safety of our streets shows up through the plan's contemplation of future land use, transportation, and patterns of growth. The Safe Mobility Strategy replaces our current road safety strategy, which was written for 2016 to 2020 after City Council adopted Vision Zero in 2015. This internationally recognized approach to traffic safety shaped the road safety strategy, which delivered strong results using a predominantly location-based hotspot approach. Many of the most dangerous intersections and streets have been identified and treated with countermeasures to eliminate or reduce the contributing causes to crashes. This work has resulted in a 56% reduction in fatalities and a 30% reduction in serious injuries since 2015. The purpose and principles of the Safe Mobility Strategy were created to connect this work with the larger city and community building goals in Connect Edmonton and highlight the need for changes both uh, in the traditional safety improvement context and a more modern inclusion of livability goals to continue our progress to zero. The work becomes more complex from here and we need to leverage both location-based and systemic approaches. We can no longer rely on, just, uh, on making just specific intersections safer alone. We need to shift and influence choices and behaviours uh, that guide how we move on every street and path. There is no one solution to safety and livability challenges on our streets. By working together and using a wide variety of tools and approaches, we can achieve Vision Zero. To ground the safe mobility strategy technically, we completed an extensive crash analysis to explore and understand the safe systems approach and its applications on our streets. This approach prioritizes protecting humans, and fully embracing it will help us tackle widespread issues that contribute to crashes, including street design and the deep-rooted cultural norms around traffic and mobility. A safe system focus efforts and priority on, on evidence-based action that reduces risk and harm, helping us to navigate tough conversations where we might not yet be on the same page as a society such as beliefs and perceptions relating to which modes and users the roads are dedicated to, myths and myth conceptions surrounding crash causes, and whether fatal and serious injury crashes are indeed preventable, and what measures and approaches are needed to achieve Vision Zero. Humans make mistakes, and we are prone to overestimate our skills and abilities on the road. But these mistakes shouldn't cost us our lives and livelihoods. A safe system designs with mistakes in mind, 
recognizes the massive impact of vehicle speed and works to build understanding of the limitations humans have and how we can adjust our behaviors to protect those around us. We've already been using a safe systems approach in Edmonton, so we know it works. We've made a significant impact already, and the safe mobility strategy expands and enhances that work to continue towards zero. Our crash analysis considered data from 2015 to 2019 and helps us understand where efforts need to be prioritized to reduce risk and harm on our roads. The progress we've made towards Vision Zero hasn't been realized equitably across all modes. Since 2015, serious and fatal crashes involving drivers and motorcyclists have reduced significantly, but this is not seen for those walking and cycling. The phrase vulnerable road user is often used to describe people who are walking, cycling, and rolling without the protective metal shell and safety features of a vehicle. The risk and harm possibilities present for people outside of vehicles is evident in our crash data. Just 1% of crashes between vehicles result in serious injury or fatality, while 25% of crashes involving someone walking results in tragedy. We all deserve to move safely, regardless of the mode we choose or are required to use to travel. Working to reduce this inequity while we continue towards Vision Zero is essential. Next, we turned our attention to why crashes are happening. You'll notice that drivers appear in each of the top five causes. In fact, 80% of serious injury and fatality crashes are due to driver error. This information is not intended to place blame or shame. Instead, it helps us to build out both location-based and systemic actions that will improve safety outcomes. Perhaps it's a new communications campaign to help build awareness of safety issues and how Edmontonians can participate in fixing them. Or identifying locations where enforcement may be needed to support changes in driver behavior. Or taking a deep dive into common crash dynamics at a specific location when considering engineering improvements. These causes are used in a variety of ways across our system. We've considered which modes are most affected in fatal and serious injury crashes and the underlying causes for why they're occurring, but where are they happening in our city? The high injury network shows us intersections and stretches of roads that have the highest concentration of crashes for each mode of travel. We're showing on the screen a zoomed in perspective to have a closer look at the detail but the high injury network has been developed citywide and shows us crash prone corridors that need our attention. Knowing which modes are most affected in specific areas helps us to consider where to place our best efforts to address the needs of vulnerable road users, but it also helps us to plan which types of countermeasures or changes might be applied to achieve the kind of safety uh, impacts needed. Integrating this information into transportation and city building projects across the corporation, such as neighborhood and arterial renewal, bike plan location implementation, and our snow and ice control program is represented in the strategy's key actions. The safe mobility strategy is a GBA plus pilot project for the city of Edmonton and working to reduce discrimination and create equitable outcomes for all communities we serve has been of highest priority through every step of the strategy's development. Our equity analysis inspired us to think about the neighborhoods and people that these crash-prone spaces laid out on the high injury network impact, connect, and help bring to life. 10% of Edmontonians live in the top 15 high crash neighborhoods and census data tells us that they are more likely to have low income, be indigenous peoples, or speak a language other than French or English at home. By virtue of where these folks live, they are exposed to higher numbers of fatal and serious injury crashes. When we take a closer look at the neighborhoods themselves, some trends emerge. They're dense. With, uh, they have higher number of residents and workplaces. They're frequently mixed use and they have a higher distribution of arterial streets that run through or are adjacent to them and provide access to major destinations. Many of the systems we have in place to assess traffic safety concerns and prioritize projects rely on being alerted to problems by the public through 311. We overlaid our inquiry data, which you can see on the screen in gray, 
with the high crash neighborhood map, which are outlined in pink, and found very little correlation between the two. By using a GBA plus perspective and asking ourselves who we are not hearing from, in this case, high crash neighborhood residents who may not have the time, energy, or resources to contact us, important learnings about how our systems and processes inadvertently contribute to inequity have emerged. Key actions have been included in the safe mobility strategy to address this. Two phases of public engagement were critical to gathering lived experience and insight in our draft plan. Unfortunately, the engagement plan had to pivot to mostly online due to COVID-19, but we are still pleased with the wide-ranging participation through a number of different tools. Our first, range, our first phase of engagement focused on gathering lived traffic safety experience from Edmontonians. We heard that for all modes of transportation, women reported feeling less safe than men. Driving was the mode where people reported feeling the most safe. For all road users, unsafe speeds was among the top three concerns. And 60% of the pins submitted through our online map were for locations where people felt unsafe walking. Our second phase sought feedback about the draft key actions that have been put forward in the safe mobility strategy. Whether they reflect priorities based on lived experience and if people felt they would help us move towards our vision zero goal. All key actions received majority support, with, many, or with most receiving over 70%. Additionally, 71% of respondents agreed with the concept of equitable project prioritization, meaning focusing our efforts on the high injury network, with comments highlighting that it just makes sense to prioritize locations where most crashes are happening and where most lives can be saved. Feedback on the draft key actions was used to refine, rephrase, and add to what is put forward in the safe mobility strategy. And this phase of public engagement, summarized in the four themes on the screen, was extraordinarily helpful in building a plan to reflect the lived experience and wisdom of Edmontonians. COVID-19 has had an incredible impact on Edmonton streets. We are discovering the limited carrying capacity of our sidewalks, bike lanes, and trails just when we need them the most. We are learning what travel is truly essential, how safety can be improved with even small decreases in vehicle volumes, and just how important daily physical activity is to our physical and emotional well-being. COVID-19 has been a catalyst for a rapid reimagining of our streets, and that's resonated with Edmontonians. And these learnings and, and uh, experiences are embedded in the work and vision through the safe mobility strategy. Benefits of evolving how we move are limitless and will help us to realize Vision Zero while creating a healthy, urban, climate resilient and prosperous Edmonton. The safe mobility strategy includes key actions that illustrate how this work will be brought to life across the corporation. Organized into four themes that outline what we want to achieve in the next five years, the key actions highlight opportunities to advance Vision Zero through a wide range of transportation and city building work that spans from, from planning to maintenance. For example, we're working with the Urban Forum team on the Vision Zero development initiative to create opportunity for developments to build traffic safety into their plans. Our snow and ice control program is working to integrate crash and equity analysis information into their approach to supporting safe winter roads. And together with the Edmonton Police Service, we continue to expand and enhance our partnership to keep Edmonton streets safe through automated and in-person traffic enforcement and community education. While we each have unique roles to play in safety, we're so much stronger together. We're going to take a look at two of the key actions uh, that we've included to get a flavor for what's to come and how the learnings through this, the development of the safe mobility strategy show up in the work planned. Safe crossing should sound familiar as it's an, ev an evolution of our current crosswalk improvements program. This key action highlights work that falls to the traditional side of the safe mobility spectrum as we look to make crossing safer for vulnerable road users and reduce risk and harm for everyone through engineering measures. Expanding the toolkit of measures that can be implemented at a crossing enables us to select the right tool for the right location. This could be anything from temporary curb extensions to help narrow a crossing distance 
to scramble crossings or lead pedestrian intervals at signals to our more familiar tools such as rapid flashing beacons. Safe Crossing embeds many learnings from the crash and equity analysis and public engagement. This action received the highest public support with 85% of respondents in favour of its inclusion in the strategy. We know that vulnerable road users are particularly at risk in intersections and that when crashes happen in these situations, they are often tragic. We all want safe streets that support vibrant, livable neighbourhoods. The Vision Zero Street Labs program will enable citizens to take the lead in creating customized, creative and flexible solutions to traffic safety concerns. City staff will be there every step of the way with tools, resources and expertise to help bring these projects to life using temporary adaptable equipment and structures. A high level overview of the program has been included as an attachment to the Council report and we've put together a little video to help introduce the program. The Vision Zero Street Labs are this really exciting new opportunity for Edmontonians to work with the city to improve their neighbourhoods. It could be something that we've seen on the streets lots of times before, like curb extensions or flex posts. It could be the creative use of paint, you know, maybe we're bringing attention to a crosswalk. But it could be things that we've never seen on the street before for traffic safety, like using pop-up community gardens to slow vehicles down and, and make a space truly for everyone. Start talking to your neighbours, to your family and your friends about what might need to change in your neighbourhood to make it feel safer and more livable. The city's going to be there with Edmontonians every step of the way, you know, helping to figure out the ins and outs of, of the project and the steps that we need to take and so that together we can come up with something that helps really reflect this dynamic changing city that's built for people. The Safe Mobility Strategy knits together a wide variety of inputs to build the direction for how we work towards Vision Zero in the next five years. From planning to design to activation and maintenance, this integrated approach mobilizes city building and transportation work from across the corporation to support safer and more livable streets in Edmonton. Thanks and we'll be happy to take your questions after speakers. Thank you, it was a great presentation. Um, and I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for you. Um, but we're going to go to our speakers first. So I'm just going to have to do my little blurb about having speakers before we get going. Um, so when we have uh, public speakers, uh, following the administration's presentation, we invite members of the public uh, to speak uh, virtually through Google Meet. Each of you will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer, however, those attendees participating virtually may also wish to use the timer at home. When the speaker is finished, please stay on the line as committee may wish to ask questions at the end of the panel of speakers. After comments from the public, the committee may ask questions of city administration. For those participating virtual, Virtually, please refrain from using the chat function in Google Meet during the meeting as it creates issues of decorum, provides unfair advantage, and interferes with the live stream. Additionally, remember to mute your microphone when you are not presenting or answering questions. If you are experiencing any difficulties, the Office of the City Clerk has resources available to facilitate communication with those participating virtually. Please reach out using the contact information that was provided in your registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. Uh, there's no one here in person, but uh, we would remind you to wear your face coverings if you leave your designated seat with plastic screens. Thank you. All right. So we have uh, eight speakers. So we'll have one full panel, and I will invite you in the order that I have you here. 
Uh, after everyone has been speaking for five minutes, then we will go to committee and then other councillors to ask questions. So first up is Peter Vermulian. You have the floor. Peter? Uh, I can see that Peter is unmuted and I believe is speaking, but his audio isn't isn't coming through. He may be, be muted on his end or or another option would be to leave and rejoin. The, the meet is, is often an easy fix. Peter, we can't hear you. We still can't hear you, so I'm going to suggest maybe, Peter, you um, leave the meeting and come back in, and I will uh, go to the next speaker, and we'll have you following that, just to keep us moving. So is Brenda Shelton available? Brenda? I can't hear you. You'll just need to, to unmute. Brenda, there should be a microphone icon along the bottom of your screen that's red, and if you click that, that will unmute. There, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect, thank you very much. Hello, we live in Ramsey Heights community on White Mud Road. This is the road that the houses fell into the riverbank years ago. And since that time, the street in our neighborhood has become a tourist attraction. Although that we are not against people coming to view the gorgeous vistas and, view and sunsets, we are negatively affected by the traffic in the area. And the, and the inconsiderate drivers who feel the need to race down our street. This street has seen a substantial increase in traffic of all hours of the day and night. The temporary institution of speed humps on White Mud Road was helpful in the areas of the street that they were installed, but only in these three areas. There needs to be additional humps located in the middle of the straight portion of the street to prevent drivers from the extreme accelerating or rather racing up and down the street at midnight almost every weekend. Another issue related to this increased traffic is increased parking. The city has addressed this issue by introducing parking restrictions to prevent the large group congregations, especially in the middle of the night. We are allowed 30 minutes from 7 a.m. in the morning until 11 at night and then absolutely no parking from 11 o'clock at night until seven in the morning. This has helped curb the amount of traffic. Unfortunately, there's currently no allowance for the people of the neighborhood to get a parking pass so that they may continue to park on the street. We say this as we have applied for one and have been denied that, so come we know we can't do anything for the people in the neighborhood. As a family, we have made concessions for parking by moving one of our son's vehicles on what was previously a garden area. We would appreciate being able to park our truck on the street in front of our home as we have been doing for the last 20 years. I sincerely hope the city will make some funding available for the institution of speed humps in all the appropriate locations as well as visit the parking restrictions and how they affect the neighborhood both positively and negatively. I thank you for your time for listening to my concerns. That's everything. Thank you very much, Ms. Shelton. Um, You're welcome. If you just uh, mute yourself now, we'll go to the other speakers and ask you questions when everyone's finished. Um, okay. And I'll go back you. to see if Peter Van Mulen has been able to rejoin us and if we can hear you. I'm here, everybody, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Please go ahead. Perfect. Would it be all right if I would share my screen as I have uh, my own PowerPoint presentation? I made to understand you have a PDF copy of it. There are a couple we of videos. We'll share it. your presentation on our end, uh, Peter. Okay, it's missing the videos though. But. All right, so thank you so much. Um, this presentation is related to the aforementioned location-based hotspot approach of Vision Zero policy. So the... Uh, 
The first slide there, if you go down, in 1999, houses ended up falling into the river in Ramsey Heights. Keep going down. The result of that was the lookout, also known as the edge of the earth. Go down more. And that's a general area. Keep going down. The yellow arrow or the uh, red star is where the videos in this presentation were taken. And it's unfortunate that we don't have an opportunity to see those videos because there is a lot of impact with that. The uh, three red arrows are the spots where the houses went down. Keep going down. Thank you. Why am I here today? These are me and my girls. I'm a normal Edmontonian. I drive a rusty eight-year-old minivan. My family's no different than the thousands of other Edmonton uh, families. Uh, what's different is that compared to everybody else, we live in a constant state of hypervigilance and fear. Keep going down. So what is the problem? Keep going down. Social disorder and excessive speeding secondary to that social disorder. Keep going down. Keep going down. And this is social disorder along White Mud Road, summer or winter, the party's always happening. This is quite normal. Keep going down. More empties, the byproduct, the byproduct of it. Keep going down. Keep going down. This is a video of three cars racing around a blind corner in front of my house. Um, it's unfortunate we can't watch it. Keep going down. There's two other videos that show the exact same thing. Keep going down. Keep going down to where it says start that slide, please. Thank you. So again, the start is where those cars start coming. By the time it hits the red arrow, that's where the videos were taken. And that's, as you can see, around a completely blind corner of my house. Keep going down. Little visual for effect there, we got some burnout marks. The uh, yellow arrow right there shows the blind corner right in front of my house. Keep going down, please. And that's not just one burnout, that's two. Keep going down. Thank you. As you can see, the city put a children playing sign there, but unfortunately that, as you can see, had absolutely no effect. Keep going down. And another sign with no effect. Keep going down. The response from the city of Edmonton, keep going down. So in 2019, there were three speed surveys done. The first one was done right after the start of an early snowfall, skewing the uh, validity and the accuracy of the results. Um, residents of Ramsey Crescent complained to the city. They did a second speed survey. This time, uh, they ended up having manhole construction along uh, Ramsey Crescent. Again, it would have impacted the data collected. And thirdly, after concerns about the validity of the first two speed surveys were voiced, a third speed, way, uh, third speed survey was done in mid-October. However, all the speeding concerns were majority based out of spring and summer. So keep going down. We had a meeting uh, at which point the city acknowledged that there was an 89% speed compliance rate along Ramsey Crescent. Keep going down. The policy on traffic safety, keep going down please. Kind of rattling through this quick. Uh, it is unethical to create a situation where fatalities are a likely outcome and that's direct from Vision Zero. So through the city's inaction, um, an unethical situation where fatalities are a likely outcome was created. And for more impact, I would refer you back to the videos, which we can't see. Keep going down, down a couple of slides. To the map there, thank you. So the city of Edmonton ended up putting in three randomly placed speed humps, um, of which there was no effect. If you keep going down, and again, it's really unfortunate we don't have the videos because you can see exactly how fast people are going. I'm happy to share those with you after the fact for anybody who's interested. Keep going down. The first three videos, the speed bumps were um, present, although you would never know. Um, by virtue of how fast people were going. Keep going down and down again. Uh, this last video there at the bottom there, which we can't see. Uh, I know the question's gonna come up, why don't you call the police? Prior to this video being taken, we actually did three different times from three different neighbors. We called in the same suspicious car, a well-known visitor to the edge of the earth, three calls to the police with a subject description, make and model and license plate. EPS ended up doing three different broadcasts and no cars were dispatched. Um, and this video is what happened after we actually made the call to police. So keep going down, almost done. 
So to quote the city's findings, there was no difference with this temporary pilot speed hump project. There was no difference before and after the implementation of the temporary speed humps. Um, there wasn't any change because the interventions were ineffective. Uh, people drove around the speed bumps. And, and again, I don't know where this is coming from if the city is not aware of this or that people were driving around the speed humps, um, but using that data to formulate policy and action or inaction is, it, it is, it is just wrong. I mean, there's, there's absolutely, the intervention the city did had no effect whatsoever. So keep going down. So Mr. Vermillion, that's been your five minutes. I'm going to get you, I'm going to have to get you to finish. I'm sure there'll be questions for you. Absolutely. And the very last slide there, again, I wanted to quote the uh, Vision Zero mandate there. My question for the city is what permanent and effective traffic calming measures will the city implement on Ramsey Crescent? And again, it's unfortunate I can't share the videos. I, I believe they're quite impactful. Um, that's what I have to say. So thank you so much for tuning in and I'm happy to take any questions. So we will take questions after all the speakers have spoken. Um, right now, I'm going to Mr. Buchanan uh, for Path for People. Please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, I'm speaking today on behalf of Path for People. We're an active transportation advocacy nonprofit devoted to making Edmonton a friendlier place to walk, roll, and cycle. Paths for People is glad to add our voice in support of the city's safe mobility strategy. The strategy will move the city towards achieving its goal of Vision Zero and will ensure that our streets become safer and more livable for all users. We love the safe mobility strategy. Uh, we believe that adopting it will be a huge step toward achieving Vision Zero and creating the kind of safe, connected, livable city we all want. We believe that everyone deserves to have a safe experience when they move through our city, regardless of the mode of transportation they use. And this strategy sets out a roadmap for achieving just that. There are several aspects of the strategy that we're particularly excited about. First, we fully support how the strategy is data-driven and based on research and best practices. Second, we fully support how the strategy treats different modes of transportation equitably. It's neither prioritizing nor disadvantaging certain modes over others. Rather, it simply recognizes that currently some people moving around our city feel less safe, more vulnerable than others. And in order to level the playing field, we're gonna to have to even things up, providing better infrastructure, design, and education to protect, for instance, pedestrians, cyclists, and people using mobility aids. This isn't about punishing cars or car drivers or taking away from motorists. It's about ensuring that everyone can have the same safe experience getting around our city. Third, we strongly support the strategy's recognition that a crucial step in achieving Vision Zero is building new, better, smarter infrastructure. Sidewalks, signaled crosswalks, bike lanes, traffic calming measures, these things work if done smartly. We've seen that with the downtown bike network and the 102 Ave bike lane, for instance. Fourth, we believe the strategy will achieve mode ship, shift or, or help to do that, which in turn will increase carbon emissions, sorry, decrease carbon emissions. When people feel safe walking and cycling, they'll do it. Look at the success last summer of the COVID measures to create shared streets. With the temporary measures the city quickly installed, people felt safe and they took to the streets like crazy. If you build it, people will come and walk and ride and roll on it. And that takes pressure off car routes and it lowers the overall carbon output. Finally, we appreciate the strategy's dual emphasis on both specific, concrete, location-based actions and on more abstract system-wide actions, cultural shifts in how we think about mobility. In recent years, Edmonton has seen some success with the former, but in order to truly achieve Vision Zero, we need to now also work on the latter, a task that's much more challenging. We're talking about changing the behavior of humans, but it can be done. And we particularly like how the strategy emphasizes the need for collaboration between the city, police, communities, schools, and other stakeholders. It's the only way systematic change will happen through a broad coalition of partners. In fact, we wanna be one of those partners. Fast for people's ready and, willing, ready and willing to contribute. We've had many successes through programming and events that we've facilitated with partners like Open Streets in 2019 on Jasper Avenue that showcase our, um, how our, our streets can work differently and how they can be safer and more livable. And we'd love to work with the city and community groups, for instance, on the Vision Zero Street Labs, where we can put our passion and expertise to work. The benefits of the safe mobility strategy could be enormous for physical health, but also mental health, community building, business, 
and the environment. Let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Kareem uh, Albasani. Thank you. Good morning, councillors, members of uh, governance, fellow speakers, and all Edmontonians who are joining us uh, this morning. My name is Kareem Albasani, and I'm an associate professor with the University of Alberta, as well as the City of Edmonton's Urban Traffic Safety Research Chair. I'm excited and grateful for the opportunity to be here today to express my support for the safe mobility strategy. This strategy is in line with global trends in transportation management, which are, off, which are acknowledging the need to expand our current systems to accommodate the safety of all road users. This strategy makes a bold move to highlight the impact of inequity and diversity in our society, as well as uh, in the ways we travel. I'm proud to see Edmonton taking the necessary steps to move in this direction. In 2015, City Council made the courageous move to adopt Vision Zero, which was a milestone decision to acknowledge and commit to the need for working together uh, to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries in Edmonton. To date, there have been significant improvements in following the first iteration of the road safety strategy. The new safe mobility strategy builds upon the successes that we have seen in the first strategy by expanding the focus to include new and innovative programs that work towards increasing safety and livability for all Edmontonians. I'm also pleased to see that the city is continuing its relationship with the research community as an example of the ways to leverage partnerships and to help advance the work on increasing safety. This year, I had the opportunity to collaborate with the city to use advanced monitoring monitoring techniques to evaluate the impacts of shared streets that were implemented in response to COVID-19. This experience taught us that we could quickly implement success measures and highlighted the significance of how the research community and city administration can advance the work of increasing safety in Edmonton. Using new monitoring techniques uh, allowed us to quickly measure the safety and livability impacts of the shared streets And I'm excited to see that the use of these tools is a component of the safe mobility strategy. Over the years, I've had firsthand experience measuring and evaluating the value of the work that the city has done. I look forward to continuing these partnerships as the strategy and the implementation plans unfold in the coming years. I fully support this strategy, which emphasizes the strength of the city's commitment towards improving and encouraging effective ways to improve safety and livability. Much has has been achieved uh, to date and with this strategy. Uh, It is my hope that we can uh, keep building on what has already been accomplished. A lot of hard work has gone into crafting this document and would like to thank the city for their dedication in producing another excellent strategy document. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now we'll go to Natasha Aiello. Good morning. My name is Natasha Yellow, and I'm here to express my support for the Safe Mobility Strategy and Vision Zero. I live in a newer neighborhood in Edmonton, uh, Chappelle Gardens in southwest Edmonton. In my neighborhood, there's a very dangerous pedestrian crossing, which occurs in a curve in the road, which makes visibility very difficult for southbound traffic. In our Facebook community page, many community members have expressed alarm and concern about this pedestrian crossing and have shared experiences where they were both almost hit by a car and also almost hit a pedestrian while driving in that in that boulevard. I myself have experienced both ends, almost getting hit while crossing the street with my daughter and also having to slam my brakes when seeing pedestrians crossing at the very last minute. This pedestrian crossing takes place uh, right in front of our social hall. So it is a very highly trafficked crosswalk. Uh, I was also told, oh, sorry. uh, Community members have claimed to have reported this dangerous pedestrian crossing to 311 over the last few years, but so far nothing has been done about it. I was also told that a formal request for pedestrian light at this and another dangerous crosswalk in the area had been made to our Ward 9 councillor, Tim Cartmel, but to no avail. Now, councillor Cartmel was kind enough to engage us on our community page and shared how hard he has been working to advocate on our behalf for safer roads and crosswalks. He expressed a shared frustration 
informing us that the city currently has a backlog of 700 pedestrian crossing crossings in need of lights, 15 of which are in his ward and are and he considers in dire need. He also shared that because of this massive backlog, city administration has instituted prioritization of pedestrian crossings that have already had a collision. While this makes sense when considering what those communities have already gone through, it's terrifying for me to hear that because to me that means nothing is going to be done in my neighborhood unless and until something unimaginable happens. I think about the families in my neighborhood, the kids that I see every day walking their dogs or walking to the park. These are my daughter's friends, her schoolmates and my neighbors. The thought that someone might have to be hurt, injured or worse in order for us to expedite this request is chilling and unacceptable. I know I'm preaching to the choir here because I would imagine all of you have stepped forward in public service to affect change on a municipal level, to improve neighborhoods and improve our way of life in Edmonton. Your decisions and ideas help shape what it actually is to be Edmontonian. And for that, I thank you. So I know this is not a complaint against you. Um, I know this isn't good enough for you either to have to wait until something horrible happens to another family and community in order to enact change. I believe the safe mobility strategy addresses many of my concerns. Perhaps my favorite part about the strategy is the focus on prevention through proper planning. It is proactive rather than reactive. The fact is this particular pedestrian crossing in my community was always going to be dangerous because it occurs in a curve in the road. This should never have been approved in the planning stages as it is. Had we been proactive and with safety as a priority, I would imagine this particular crossing would have been required to have lights installed from the start. While I'm hopeful that the implementation of the safe mobility strategy will help circumvent the future creation of such dangerous pedestrian crossings, we are still left with the enormous backlog the city still needs to address. As a community member and in the interest of collaboration, I'm asking you to please implement temporary measures at problem crosswalks until permanent solutions can be applied. Some immediate suggestions would include uh, no parking within three meters of a crosswalk. This improves visibility for both pedestrian and driver. This can be accomplished by painting curbs, signage, and raising awareness. Temporary signage that alerts drivers to a dangerous or hidden crosswalk. And community funding. I know in my community, there are enough people who are concerned about two pedestrian crossings in particular, that we might be able to pay for pedestrian lights through fundraising efforts. I would love for this option to be open to us and other communities who are in the same predicament. Many years ago, while I was a young girl growing up in Park Allen, I was hit by a car traveling northbound on 109th Street at 63rd Avenue, um, having used the 111th Street connector. I wonder if the car had trouble seeing me because the pedestrian crossing occurred directly after that connector road, which is a curve in the road. A traffic light was installed shortly afterwards. While I suffer chronic neck and back injuries to this day as a result of that accident, I know that I'm one of the lucky ones. What is astounding to me, however, is that almost 40 years later, we are still handling pedestrian safety in the same reactive, ineffective way. We need a change. We need a proactive approach. I believe the safe mobility strategy is a fantastic step in achieving Vision Zero. Thank you all for your time and for listening. I would especially like to thank Councillor Tim Cartmel for his continued efforts and for communicating and engaging us in Ward 9. Please count on my support going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll go to, to Deanne Stein Hasnoff. Good morning, councillors. I'm here to speak to you today in support of the safe mobility strategy and in particular, the traffic safety community activation in resolving traffic problems in individual neighborhoods. I live in Brander Gardens, a neighborhood that experiences multiple issues. 
Over the years, individual residents as well as parents of Brander Gardens Elementary raised concerns about traffic in our area with no change implemented. In the past, residents have been told our neighborhood has wide streets and can accommodate much more traffic than we currently do, the subtext being we do not have a problem. In my former career working in brain injury rehab, we often talked about the difference between how a person performed on tests on paper and how they performed in their environment, their functional performance. These two things did not always match. Next slide, please. On paper, Brander Gardens can accommodate many more cars. Functionally, the main road, Riverbend Road, is essentially a two-lane road due to the number of parked cars from the apartments and condos, as well as parents parking while dropping off or picking up their kids. Functionally, with four schools in close proximity, Brander Gardens sees, uh, sees a large number of cars entering and exiting our area during peak hours and at school dismissal time. A car count completed by a resident living just north of Brander Gardens and Tempo Schools on November the 6th saw 116 cars between 8 and 8.30 a.m. That is one car every 15 seconds. Slide, please. Functionally, whenever there is a traffic accident further south, drivers divert to Riverbend Road to avoid Twilliger Drive. As Riverbend Road backs up, drivers then divert to side roads to try and move more quickly through the area see routes A and B. Drivers taking route A to avoid Riverbend Road put even more pressure on the intersection of 56th Avenue and Riverbend Road. Slide please. This intersection is a main crossing point for children to get to Brander Gardens Elementary. Functionally, drivers trying to enter onto Riverbend Road from 56th Avenue via left-hand turn often make questionable choices that put pedestrians again, mostly children, at risk. Slide, please. As traffic congestion increases, so does frustration, and the result is safe driving behavior declines. Slide, please. Functionally, further south, residents of Ramsey Heights who need to access Riverbend Road southbound find it almost impossible to get into traffic as there is no control light to facilitate a break for a safe left-hand turn. Finally, drivers taking the alternate routes through Ramsey Heights or Brander Gardens often speed both during peak hours and throughout the day, putting the safety of other drivers and pedestrians at risk. Brander Gardens traffic on a regular day during peak hours and school arrivals and dismissals can be challenging for both pedestrians and drivers. Increased pressures will come with the road construction at 53rd Avenue, the main road to exit the neighborhood in 2021. Then there will be the Twilliger Drive reconstruction, which will very likely result in more vehicles using Riverbend Road to avoid construction traffic. And we foresee the functionality of our roads, or lack thereof, will again be highlighted. It is very important not only that our concerns are heard, but that real solutions are put into place. We are not interested in more placating responses after calls or emails to 311. We want to work on improving the safety of our roads. Possible solutions include temporary speed bumps or bump outs for roads that see speeding, signal and or sign changes for trouble areas, more pedestrian crossing signs, the addition of a traffic light to break the flow of traffic. These are some of the things residents have discussed with each other. We would welcome the opportunity to improve our streets for pedestrians and drivers and enable everyone to safely get where they need to go. We see the safe mobility makeovers and safe speeds toolkit as important steps towards working together with the city of Edmonton to become a community of safe communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll go to Kathy Mulkin. Kathy. I can see that Kathy is there, uh, but she's muted, so she may just need to use the microphone icon along the bottom of her screen. It will be red now, and there we go. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for helping me. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, all. Um, and I'm so excited about this um, safe mobility strategy, Vision Zero, and its customizable um, 
preventative nature. Um, so I live on the far south end of White Mud Road in Riverbend, just close by where Peter Vermeulen lives and just right down the street from where Brenda Shelton lives. And uh, I've lived here for nearly 20 years. It's di directly across the street from where the houses slid down into the river, as you saw on Peter's map. It's a great area. It's completely unique in the city, and we welcome lots of visitors and have over the years. Um, it's also, unfortunately, though, been a target for excessive traffic and visitors engaged in criminal activity, including drugs, drug dealing, uh, prostitution, fights, all day and late night, overnight idling of, uh, of people in their mobile offices as cars approach them, do drug deals, leave, as uh, cars idle overnight with uh, women welcoming visitors to their vehicles uh, for a while and driving away. So this has been a problem for 20 years and we've had no resolution and we've had escalating problems. Um, escalating and habitual loitering and crime that has then led to speeding as people drive into the neighborhood off River Bend Road to their mobile offices on White Mud Road and speeding out of the neighborhood uh, along 43rd Avenue and Ramsey Crescent as they have, have finished their business, as they finished their time there. Um, so this has been 20 years of um, calling police, calling by law enforcement, calling parking, calling 311 with virtually no um, resolution uh, whatsoever for many, many years. When the uh, properties were in litigation with the city and the province, um, the residents, we took it upon ourselves to clean the street, clean the graffiti, pick up the garbage, call the police, take care of the street, put up concrete um, borders so that drivers couldn't park out on the bank and so on. A few years ago, the city then took, um, took over control of that area when litigation was done and installed a low um, wooden fence as well as park signs. Uh, the residents at that point um, unanimously agreed to refuse any other um, installations of picnic tables or benches or anything else uh, that would increase traffic to the neighborhood, graffiti, vandalism, or any other effects. Um, so, Frankly, I've gotten so exhausted over the years of calling police, calling everybody, and um, not much happening. I felt like a car spluttering nearly out of gas. But the reason I am talking here today is because um, uh, two, um, two, two and a half weeks ago, I was out shoveling snow, and I was accosted at the end of my driveway, farthest from my front door, by a man with a scarf over his face who came, snuck, snuck up on me in the dark and uh, came from one of the vehicles, two houses up the street, idling there. I'd seen that vehicle when they were idling with three men in it and there had been people on the street, but once everybody else on the street had left and my back was turned, um, this man in the dark snuck up on me. And um, as I tried to sidle into, up to safety at the far end of my driveway and up my steps. I engaged him and suggested that uh, the street signs, the parking signs, they ought to pay attention to them because police might be coming. Um, so anyways, um, that is an escalation of threat that has never happened before, where we've been accosted on the street by the strangers who've come to visit there. And um, I called the police. They took it very seriously. They sent a cruiser out who went around the streets looking for that, um, that vehicle, those people, and the helicopter flew over. So what we're talking about here is an escalation of crime, an escalation of excessive traffic, an escalation of uh, people coming into the west part of Ramsey Heights, uh, along where Peter and along where Ms. Stein have indicated the traffic and the problems have been increasing. Um, <clears throat> so 
I'm going to have to get you wrap up right away, please. Okay. So we have, um, in the document that I sent, we have some proposed solutions. I've included proposed solutions that are traffic related that could um, deter people from coming into Ramsey Heights and speeding along the um, Ramsey Crescent area, along the Riverbend Road area, along the White Mud Road area. And this needs to be uh, accompanied with psychologically sound behavior extent, extinction ticketing um, enforcement and proper signage and other um, areas and other possible strategies uh, that, that seem to be outlined in this uh, Vision Zero. Okay. Um, Thank you. And I'm sure we'll have some questions of some of your other ideas. I really appreciate that. And... I'm really sorry for your experience. It certainly would have been difficult. Yeah, so thank you, and thank you to Councillor Cartmel for beginning to help us have some solutions for these problems. All right, thank you. And I'm going to turn our attention over to our last speaker on this item from the public, which is Ashley Salvador. Ashley, please go ahead. All right, good morning, Council. I'd like to express my full support for the safe mobility strategy. The conclusions of this body of work are clear. We're saving lives, reducing injury, and continuing to move towards vision zero. Things are getting better, uh, but as we've heard today, there's, there's still work to do. I'm really pleased to see a combined approach that addresses both system-wide and location-based improvements. And I'm particularly hopeful about vision zero street labs creating opportunities for community members to play an active role in remaking their neighborhoods to be safer and more livable is a critical component of this holistic approach. And as we've all seen, there's no shortage of passionate Edmontonians who understand which crossings in their community are problematic, where drivers speed, and which sidewalks are inaccessible. Being able to tap into their local knowledge and expertise and collaborate with them should really enable our city to address safety and livability in a pragmatic, flexible manner without making communities wait until neighborhood renewal comes through. There are a host of inexpensive semi-permanent solutions that can be implemented quickly with tangible benefits. As Vision Zero Street Labs rolls out, it will be imperative to have a clear channel for neighborhood teams to take their plans to reality with, this, uh, with the help of city resources. And at the same time, I think it's important to uh, embed these location-based activations within a system-wide approach to ensure an equitable distribution of inter uh, interventions and resources. As outlined um, in, in the report and the strategy, the relationship between high crash neighborhoods and 311 related inquiries is weak. And that means that although certain neighborhoods and demographics are exposed to higher risks, they may not be the ones forming teams to participate in street labs. So the high crash and high injury network provides us with some really great spatial data and knowledge, and that'll help us prioritize certain areas. Finally, I just wanna reiterate uh, the clear connection the safe mobility strategy has to the city plan. A healthy, urban, prosperous, and climate resilient city depends on creating communities where all residents can safely meet their needs, whether that's biking to work, walking to school, rolling to a bus stop, or driving to the grocery store. Concepts like 15-minute districts are premised on the idea of being able to walk or bike to the essentials of life. And safe mobility alongside land use is the foundation for realizing this vision. Uh, going forward, just a quick thing I'd like to encourage Council to consider, and that's the connection between the city plan, safe mobility, and our zoning bylaw renewal that's currently underway to help ensure that our zoning bylaw is aligned with the safe mobility strategy so that elements like front setbacks, street furniture, the location of vehicular access and parking are conducive to safer, more livable neighbourhoods. And development does have a role to play in the creation of less auto-centric uh, cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashley. Um, so now we're going to go to questions of our speakers, um, and I'll start with Councillor Henderson. Uh, well, maybe just, um, and I'm guessing uh, uh, Councillor Carmel will have some 
questions about uh, the issues in um, uh, in Ramsey. Uh, but I just as an observation, um, it it sounds very familiar to me um, because we had the same issues with End of the World in Belgravia, uh, almost identical situation. Although probably that space was a bit more um, harder to get into and out of. Uh, and so the solutions that we came up with there was actually to make the space nicer um, and more accessible so that the general public could use it and therefore push some of the, the negative use away. Um, so I don't, know, uh, I don't know what the solutions will be, but it was multifaceted in that case and we had to bring an awful lot of different people to the table to brainstorm what the answers would be. So I just share that story because it sounds so familiar um, from the experiences we went through in Belgravia. Um, and it might be possible to take some of the learning from that and apply it to your situation, which sounds a little bit different, but ironically when you decided, it might for instance be when you decided not to improve the space that it actually may have been counter, counterproductive because it actually made it less pleasant for everybody else to use. So I just share that, um, but I'll leave the questions around that for, for Councillor Carmel, but I just wanted to, uh, and I'm more than happy to speak with him about the experience and how we work through the Belgravia situation as well. My main questions, though, um, uh, were um, for Dr. Albus Uni. Um, there were a number of things that jumped out at me from the reports, and I wouldn't mind your thinking on them. Um, the, one of them was that so much of our data uh, comes from the police who are measuring it based on the level of property damage. And it doesn't strike, you know, so the, so the, the cutoff is $2,000 of property damage. It's not actually, doesn't deal with a cutoff that deals with severity of injury or, and I'm just wondering your thinking on how, and I'll ask the same question of administration, but I'm, you're thinking on how we can make sure whether or not that's skewing the data and whether or not there's a way, any thoughts you have on how to chew up the data to make sure that we're actually measuring the right things here if our objectives are injury and, 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 and fatality? Well, that's an, an excellent question, uh, Councillor, and I agree. Um, and I would, I would actually say that there is no need for us to actually wait for the crash data uh, for us to start taking uh, proactive or, or sort of uh, uh, actions. I would, I would argue that uh, we have an ethical obligation to understand and, and demonstrate the levels of unsafety, perhaps using other surrogate measures. And so we have speeding is a, is a great way for us to, um, or, or one of the ways we can use to uh, talk about how unsafe a certain location is. But there are other measures. There are basically the interactions between the different road users. And the city has been really progressive in using um, new innovative monitoring techniques uh, to basically demonstrate both that there is a concern and to actually showcase that what they put into place has been actually effective. And so I, I would say we should really st strive to move away from using collision data for purposes of, of making safety decisions. It, it, it's interesting, too. I know one of the things that the Swedes started looking at, um, and this came up through some of the winter city work that we've done, um, was, was emergency room data and hospital data. Um, to capture some of the kind of slips and falls and other kind of things that are just as much transportation injuries. Um, but have we done any of that kind of work? And I don't know how doable that is in our context. I am not aware, and so I'll leave that to the administration to... Okay, I'll uh, ask them. I just thought I'd ask you the question when I had the chance. Okay. The one other thing that jumped out at me from the data um, was that in actual fact, when you look at, uh, um, at serious injury and at... Um, um, and, and at fatality, that those numbers go down in winter. Um, they, 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 the number of collisions may go up, the number of crashes may go up, but then actually the severity goes down. And I'm wondering, yeah, I mean, I can begin to guess what that's about, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I thought it was a really interesting, interesting discovery. And, and you know, I, I, it's a very common occurrence that we see in, in most winter cities. And I think the reason is potentially because of the reduced speeds, the more alertness, the fact that there is snow on the ground. All of these factors um, are being used by drivers to potentially maybe reduce their speed or pay more attention while they're driving, uh, which is quite different when you contrast it to the driving conditions in the summer. Great. Thanks. I'm out of time. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I will go to Councillor Banga. I'll do members of the committee first and then other councillors. Councillor Banga. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my question would be first from uh, Ms. Salvador. Uh, Ms. Salvador, you commented uh, that the relationship between high risk locations and 311 is weak. What do you mean by that? Could you elaborate further on Sure. This? Yeah, and um, I'm sure the, the project team can speak about this uh, better than I can. But um, my takeaway, at least uh, one of the many takeaways from the report, was that. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be a really strong relationship between where the city is getting a lot of 311 uh, traffic related inquiries and the, the high, high collision, um, high incidence locations. So what that says to me is just because uh, a neighborhood may have a lot of 311 calls doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that's a, a really high risk location or neighborhood. And for me, there's some equity implications there because it says, well, maybe we're getting less calls because it's a maybe it's a lower income neighborhood. Uh, maybe there's a higher percentage of folks who um, who where English isn't their first language and they just don't feel comfortable making those calls. So I think it's important to consider. Um, yeah, just that that equity lens when we're thinking about where where things are being reported and where issues and um, and dangerous locations actually exist. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. And uh, again, another question is uh, uh, the safe mobility strategy is, uh, is addressing the overall behavior and everything that's included in the to make people safe in, for all modes of uh, transportation. Do uh, you think those uh, high traffic locations or high collision locations should be given preference? Yes. Um, so, I mean, I, I did speak a little bit about this in my presentation, but um, thinking about how to, how to prioritize certain areas, uh, I think it is really critical that we, again, apply that equity lens. Uh, just because um, certain areas may have a lot of community members who are, are interested in a certain intervention, that's that's awesome and that's great and I think we should pay attention to that. But at the same time, if we've already identified locations where we know um, certain populations, certain groups, certain communities are exposed to higher risks because of the built environment, uh, we, we should be prioritizing interventions in those areas. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vermeulen, a uh, question for you is, uh, you said people uh, drive around the speed bumps. Could you explain to me why, like, are those speed bumps not throughout the width of the road? I mean, are they partial? That is that is correct, Councillor Banga. Um, the, the speed bump placement for the temporary speed bump uh, pilot project, uh, the speed bumps did not span the width of the road. People drove around them and uh, our sidewalks are not the um, the straight 90 degree edge. They're more of the sloped. So people were actually speeding, mounting the sidewalks to get around these speed bumps. Um, so you, you can actually drive your car directly beside the speed bump and not have to slow down. So, so in, in my view, in my interpretation, to form a conclusion based on, based on essentially an orange pylon in the road would have had the same effect. There was no difference pre and post implementation of the temporary speed bumps. So okay. effective intervention is my, my opinion. Perhaps I'll uh, clarify those questions from the administration for the reasoning of it, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that's all my questions for now. Thank you, Councillor Banga. I have a couple of questions and then I'll go to Councillor Cartmel. Uh, first of all, um, to Dr. Albassani, um, 
you reference the value of the inequity and diversity uh, lens or the equity lens going to be used. And I was just curious of in your research if you've seen many other jurisdictions going down this path because I, I feel very strongly that this is a really a positive way to engage some who haven't had a voice in this uh, discussion. Uh, definitely, I definitely agree. I think this this is one of the most unique components of the strategy is putting forefront and forward uh, the, the equity and diversity piece. And, and I really appreciate seeing um, language in the proposal that addresses that. As far as seeing that in other jurisdictions, I have to say that this is probably one of the most unique uh, strategies out there. Um, a lot of them talk around the issue, but never really take it head on. And so this is one of the things that makes uh, this safety mobility strategy quite unique and, and a sort of a first of its kind. Thank you. And I, I certainly appreciate that approach and the, the human aspect of it. The other approach I want to talk to uh, Ms. Ayello, um, if you're still with us there. Um, yes, sir. You really seem to support the strategy and key in uh, whether it was the street labs or the community discussion on safety, because you felt like you were in a place as a community members to, uh, to see what's needed. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I, as I said, my favorite part of the strategy is that it takes place in the planning stages as well for neighborhoods. Um, that you're implementing safety uh, guidelines and priority in neighborhoods while you build them because in the situation that I'm in, I live in a newer neighborhood and I feel the danger has been built into my neighborhood because safety was not a priority and it wasn't planned accordingly. Uh, you also made a comment that, you know, if you knew you could make change, you would be more than happy to raise funds to do so. Yeah. Was that you? That was me um, because I do... I love the safe mobility strategy, but I also feel like my personal uh, my personal concern with the crosswalk near my house that's highly trafficked is um, is probably not going to get addressed very quickly because we're gonna we're at the point now where we have to wait to become a priority, and I'm not willing to wait for a child or somebody to get hurt or worse in order for that to happen. So I'm trying to think of solutions that we can do now that we can collaborate with you to try and to try and prevent that situation from happening. And I would absolutely be willing to get involved in my community and fundraise if, if that's what is necessary. I would absolutely love that opportunity. Well, I think those who live in a neighborhood often see how traffic uh, uses their neighborhood and are at the front lines to make recommendations. So I'm very excited about that aspect as well. And many neighborhoods, I think, would be happy to uh, engage in that. I know we, we do raise funds for many things, including playgrounds. Why not traffic safety? It's a whole big conversation. Exactly. But yeah. it might allow us to address more areas quicker because not every neighborhood has that ability, but some do. That's right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those are all my questions of the speakers. I go to Councillor Carmel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks uh, to all of you for, uh, for attending today. I know it's not easy to fit into your daily schedule. Um, in the interest of... of uh, Respecting the time of committee, I'll only ask questions of some of you, and I'll start with you, Peter. Uh, you know, both you and Ms. Malkin and uh, Ms. Shelton described some real social disorder in that neighborhood. And uh, just maybe following up on Councillor Henderson's comments, this is this is different in a couple respects. This activity is literally across the street from the front doors of people that live there. And secondly. It's in an area that's not stable. Uh, the bank is slowly eroding away. So building infrastructure is simply not in the cards. That, is that your understanding? That's mine. That, that is my understanding as well. Um, bear in mind with my presentation, the social disorder and the speeding, in my opinion, are, have a direct correlation to one another. So if one gets taken care of, the other by, by virtue, um, by default, uh, should subside. Um, in terms of um, adding in traffic calming measures along Ramsey Crescent, if that stems the attractiveness of the area where the houses fell in, less traffic, less speeding. 
right? Right. So it's, I mean, the, the, the traffic calming element doesn't necessarily solve all the social uh, ills, but maybe it makes some of them go away. Correct. And so we've heard some discussion around this street labs concept. Um, we've been trying to do that in, in this neighborhood for the better part of two years, perhaps longer, where we've had the conversation, we've gathered the input from the neighbors, we've implemented some solutions. Uh, we put in speed bumps, you know, down the middle of the road, but not the edges of the road. What's your confidence in this this concept of a street labs approach to some of these solutions? You know, I thank you for the question. I think that's that's something that I think would affect more of the folks living on on White Mud Road than it would be myself around the corner on Ramsey Crescent. At at the end of the day, I see people speeding excessively in front of my house. That's my major concern. Um, no different than, than, um, Kathy would be concerned with what's in front of her house. I'm concerned with what's in front of my house. And, uh, it's, this meeting is just terrifying. I, I, I wish I had the opportunity to present those videos there because they're actually quite shocking. Yeah, I've um, seen those videos. I hear you. Yeah. Right. And, and again, specifically the videos showing the excessive speeding during the temporary speed bump project. Um, you, there's no difference. There's absolutely no difference before and after. Would there be so, Peter? Would there? Do you think there would have been at least some difference had those bumps gone from curb to curb? Or oh, curb? absolutely, absolutely, yeah. right? And 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 that I guess is the frustration: is a the placement of those speed bumps in the temporary project, um, a the the placement of the speed bumps, and b the fact that you could drive around them. So why even bother doing it in the first place if they're going to be ineffective? And yeah. to take that data to form a decision that you know, well, there's no change in speeding. You're right. There's no change in speeding because the intervention was completely ineffective. Well, that leads to a further point that, you know, data informed decisions depends on having good data in the first place. And, uh, yeah. you know, between the speed surveys and the, you know, the, the bump pilot, and uh, perhaps we haven't got a lot of info. And, and my apologies, just one more point there. If anything, I think it was much more dangerous to actually put that intervention into place because it led to significantly more dangerous driving of, People are still speeding and now they're mounting the sidewalk. Yeah. So they don't have to slow down. Mr. Vermillion, uh, uh, Ms. Aiello uh, raised the issue of potentially fundraising amongst, um, uh, amongst the residents. Uh, and we have other ways of, we've done other things like tax improvement levies and things like that, where we collect from different residents to execute solutions. There's an equity piece there. Some neighborhoods can afford to, to pay for some of these things. Some neighborhoods can't. Where do you, what do you think about that? It's it's interesting you mention equity. Um, my thoughts is is there is a stigma attached to Riverbend, and I mean, like I said in my presentation, I drive an eight year old rusty minivan. It's um, there's there's an interpretation amongst the city that we're very much a have neighborhood um, in comparison to some of the other areas of Edmonton. So it, you know, at the end of the day, um, from last year to this year, my monthly taxes for the city have gone up one hundred and fifty dollars, and I get it. Um, you know, we're, we're an expanding city and there's bills to pay. Um, you know, I, I don't think anybody would be opposed to, um, to doing the, uh, the neighborhood levy. You know, I, my old, my old neighborhood, we had to pay for new sidewalks and we incorporated them into that, into our taxes over 20 years. And you couldn't notice a difference. I, I certainly don't think anybody's opposed to it. Um, equally, I think that there are some people that are wanting to know you know, myself in particular, you know, my, my taxes are going up 150 bucks a month and I'm not seeing anything in front of my house. You know, that's, that's the frustration, I guess. Thank but, you. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Peter, didn't mean to cut you off. My time is up. Uh, Madam Chair, I would like a second round if I could. Sorry, turn my mic on. Uh, yes, please go ahead. There's no one else at the moment, so I'll start with the second round. Thank you, and I appreciate the indulgence of committee. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Uh, thank you, Peter, for your comments. Ms. Aiello, uh, you spoke to uh, the, the pieces that you like about this plan, that it speaks to, um, to proactive planning, that it speaks to prevention through proper planning. Yes. Uh, that's great for the neighborhoods to come, but the neighborhoods that are here, uh, we're, we're stuck with a situation like the one you're living with. Fair to say? That's exactly right. That's, it, that's fair to say. And um, 
you know, like I said, when, when I was hit by a car at 10 years old, um, this was the same approach. And so it's a little bit deflating to have, you know, almost, almost 40 years later, if I'm to be completely honest, we're still, we're still doing the same thing. Um, and I think what's compounding the issue is that I live in a newer neighborhood. So I do wonder if the safe mobility strategy were put in place beforehand, would this crosswalk situation exist? I don't think it would. So I understand issues of equity. I do want to speak to that a little bit. Um, I'm not saying, you know, I, of course, equity is an issue, but I think instead of neighborhood levies, if, if the community, if I fundraise privately, then the people who want to be involved will be involved. And the people who don't want to be involved won't be forced to be involved. Um, like Madam Chairperson said too, if we are able to fundraise for, for school playgrounds, then why not safety for our kids as well? Yeah, I think that's a question that's going to be asked of administration uh, you know, once we've uh, finished our session here. Uh, Ms. Aiello, describe your neighborhood a little bit, if you would. I mean, it's a newer neighborhood. Uh, but yeah. Mr. Vermillion spoke to the perception of Southwest Edmonton. Describe your neighborhood. Okay, well, my neighborhood is a master plan neighborhood. Um, it's a very young family neighborhood, very, very family oriented. Uh, there's a very active community league, a very active social hall. Um, there are nature trails throughout the neighborhood. There's a big spray park. Uh, there's parks throughout as well. And there, there are a lot of families who have dogs. So you see, this, I'm in a neighborhood where you see people out and about. They're walking their dogs. They're taking their children to go sledding in the park. Um, I'm one of those neighborhoods too where Halloween is actually still a thing where people go trick-or-treating around here because there's so many children. Um, yeah, Christmas right. lights around. So it's, it's very idyllic in that way. And there is a lot of pedestrian traffic. Uh, the crosswalk that I'm most concerned with actually bridges a great deal of our residents to the social hall and to our major shopping area where the grocery store, our eyeglass, our optician, everyone is on that side. So it's heavily used and it's right in the middle of a curve. So it's very, very hard to see. And then with winter roads on top of it all, yeah. it's really hard to stop. And, and we're, we are all petrified that something horrible is going to happen. So I want, I'm wanting to find a solution pretty quickly, and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I'm limited on time. I'm really sorry. I don't mean to be rude. Is this a neighborhood that's filled with giant houses and giant properties? No, we have, um, I would say we are financially diverse. We have apartments. We have townhouses. We have duplexes. We have big houses. We have average size houses. We have everything. In fact, these neighborhoods south of the Henday are the most dense neighborhoods outside of the core in Edmonton. Uh, little factoid there. So we're talking about a, a crosswalk that is on the main path that makes this neighborhood walkable, that gets yeah. you to the, the social gathering, gets you to the commerce gathering. Yeah. It should be a priority to get a crossing in there. But you've seen in the presentation today that there's uh, a couple of maps that have been thrown up. You know, maps that show that priorities ought to be where all the accidents are happening or the priorities ought to be in particular neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Do you have confidence that the crossing that, that is so key to your neighborhood is going to be a priority? No, um, I have zero confidence in that. Knowing that there is a 700 crossing backlog currently and then not seeing my own neighborhood in that map cause, you know, that makes me believe we're probably in the, in the high 600s. So... That's why I'm appealing to you. We, we need to do something sooner than that. Which leads to that, and don't take this the wrong way, but that somewhat desperate plea to say, we'll, we'll pay for it if we'll just, the city would just install it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, all of you, for participating today. I really appreciate your time. Those are all my questions, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll echo those comments. Thank you to all of our speakers today. We really appreciate it um, that you've taken the time, that you've shared your experiences and your wisdom with us. Um, now we're going to turn our attention over to administration. Um, I'm sure there'll be a few questions, and I'm going to start with Councillor Henderson, who had selected this item. Councillor Henderson. Uh, yeah, maybe just to start, I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm interested, you know, that we have two issues here. One is how we 
don't make these mistakes going forward in the design of our next set of communities. And two is how we retrofit. Because I, you know, what I'm really struck by with the speakers we have today is they tend to be from a certain era of neighborhood that have, I'm guessing, big, wide, curving roads um, that felt like they were the right thing to do in terms of safety at the time, but are now incenting traffic and incenting speeding. Um, so, I mean, uh, you, you know, what are, what are our solutions to that? Obviously, as, we, you know, as, we're, as we're rebuilding neighborhoods, we're trying to fix some of those problems, but there's a lot of neighborhoods that have already been rebuilt and we didn't do that work or, um, or may still be significantly down the list for rebuilds. Councillor, uh, we hear this concern frequently. So one piece I think we should highlight is that lots of good work has happened over the last few years on city policy and design guidelines to help integrate Vision Zero, whether that be through complete streets, whether that be through neighborhood renewal. But to your point on communities that are already built, um, this, you know, one of the areas of focus that we have in the strategy is a key action around working with developers. And that's not just on new neighborhoods, that's on infill as well, to identify opportunities to include traffic safety improvements along with the plan. So I think it's a multifaceted approach, um, but lots of good work has happened. We just may not have always seen it because yeah. some of these neighborhoods we're talking about are of the recent past. Yeah, no, and, and, and it's striking to me because the, for the most part, the neighbors I represent, I have a few of them that are like that, and unfortunately, we've already rebuilt them. Um, but that I'm dealing with a lot of neighborhoods that are older than that, that have, that we're able to go in and do some of these 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 things, and hopefully we'll be making improvements. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in one of the reports as reference to the work that the Dutch have done um, in terms of recategorizing the functionality um, and I mean, they do more than that, and I'm and I'm, I'm, I, w I was struck by that, and I'm wondering if, in terms of the way we will now start looking at the design of our the redesign of our existing roads and the design of our new roads, if we are going to go to that level of of change of thinking, because I think it is a radical change of thinking about what roads are about and and how we should adjudicate their their functionality. On the redesign aspect, it's another feature of the strategy from a key action perspective is taking what we've learned from that crash and equity analysis, taking the high injury network in particular, and helping to consider that in, in the work of arterial and neighborhood renewal in particular. Uh, we know that 69% of our serious injury and fatality crashes happen on arterial roads. So that's a key feature of this plan is to consider how we influence that work. It, it, but it was, you know, it's... It, what struck me, and maybe I'm misunderstanding and I'm putting more more weight on it, but the fact that they've gone down to basically two functions, one is traffic flow and the other ex is exchange, and separated those two and understood that that, you know, has simplified the challenge, um, I think, that specifically. I, you know, I think that's a massive change in terms of the kind of expectations we have of our engineers in terms of doing design. Um, it really rethinks, I think, you know, what, what the challenge is, and I... And I'm, and I'm just wondering if, if we're going to be that bold in terms of changing our thinking in terms of what we expect our roads to do for us and how we approach it. Because I, I think that's the level of shift that I'm not convinced we've entirely made yet. Um, but I think that's the level of shift both in terms of how we retrofit and in terms of, of how we build new that we're going to have to do here. So, Councillor, I'll, I'll take a stab at this and then... Perhaps Ms. McCabe, if she's on the line, can jump in. But I think what you're talking about is 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 a, a change in philosophy and culture of design, but also that translates into a change in, in the culture in terms of expectations of the public, what our roadway network is, is um, intended to do. And certainly we've been moving in that direction, as you can see, the difference between the previous uh, traffic safety strategy versus this one. It is a continuum we're moving down, and, and that could possibly be the next evolution of where we go. Well, I, I asked the question because I, I think it forces us to ask a different set of questions when we're designing and ask it, you know, just put a different mindset in there. And if we're not going to have neighborhoods coming to us that we're building now, 10 or 15 years from now, going, you got it wrong, like we've just heard. It seems to me is that, you know, somehow or other, that's the kind of radical mind shift about what we're trying to do when we engineer a road. And it's not about disadvantaging a user. I don't think the Dutch are doing that at all. It's just about 
giving ourselves a different set of challenges and a different lens in terms of how we think about what we try to achieve with these designs. Correct, and I think what you're speaking to is, is the overall goal is, is the livability of the na neighborhood uh, and, and not necessarily just moving through it. It's how is it, what are the things that we do that will make it the best in terms of the residents and their livability? Okay. I'm out of time. I have to come out for a second round. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let's start with uh, the general questions. Um, the report indicates that the previous strategy uh, did deliver strong results and reduce the number of uh, collisions and injuries and everything else uh, that comes along with it. If the previous strategy has proven successful, what inspired administration to develop a new strategy rather than Councilor Banga, new just, existence one? Yeah, Councilor Banga, appreciate the question. And the stats do demonstrate value, but if, as was mentioned in the presentation, uh, we're seeing the movability pedestrians being an area where we do still see issue and concern relative to the movement in our, our uh, walkable lanes. So uh, it is an area that's we see a need to address, and this is part of what this plan will do. And, and Councillor, I can just add a little bit. In terms of the strategy, so we're not saying that we um, disregard the previous elements of the work done, and specifically when you look at location-based enhancements, whether that be enforcement or, or engineering. Those are, are part of it, but what this strategy is doing is expanding it to talk about uh, livability and, and other aspects that impact... Um, mobility safety so we are not saying we don't do the other elements those need to continue but we need to balance them with with other things in terms of changing behaviors and and enabling neighborhoods to take on uh, part of that um, that responsibility and sharing their uh, inputs so that we can shape that so some of these uh, corrective measures uh, we're uh, taking with this new approach are they a result of uh, any distinct issues that arose in the last four years? Or are they new altogether? Councillor Banga, we do have a couple of new programs coming forward through the strategy that's in response to a couple of pieces. Uh, first of all, uh, the significant um, public engagement and, and what we hear from Edmontonians about their lived experience about wanting to feel safer and, and have more livable streets in their neighbourhoods. And that's, of course, through the, street, um, the Vision Zero Street Labs program. Um, but in particular, when we're talking about some of the pivot and other work, it's as we've addressed some of you know, the areas with this, the strongest issue on the high injury network, um, we've come down the list and, and now we need to, to pivot and include more systemic options as well. Um, as the, the cost, you know, the, the benefit in terms of identifying just specific intersections doesn't have the same rate of return that we've had anymore. We need a both and approach to this work rather than just choosing one over the other. Okay, and then uh, in the presentation, you indicated that uh, we need, uh, I guess, consistent and uh, uniform approach by everyone that's involved. Could you be able to tell me what would be the expectation from EPS? Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Benga, uh, Edmonton Police Service is a, is a key partner in keeping our streets safe. So we work closely with them in a few ways, but primarily on our enforcement program. So we share information and data between the two groups to make sure that our automated enforcement program, which is led through the city, and the in-person enforcement program through EPS is coordinated and strategic. We share information for things like repeat and serious offenders who are not responding to the automated enforcement program. We share information from our driver feedback signs and our automated enforcement equipment to help Edmonton Police Service know um, where they may need to put some of their own attention in terms of in-person enforcement. And additionally, we work together and will continue to do so in an expanded way on public education as a part of this new strategy, specifically with the Safe Speeds Toolkit and support of the speed limit reductions piece coming forward this summer. 
Okay, I believe EPS is also on the call. Could you, uh, somebody from EPS, tell me what they think they will be, I should say, probably responsible for, or what is their part on the EPS side? Hi, good, good morning. Uh, what was your question again there, Councilor Benny? I didn't hear you quite. Uh, well. The question was, uh, I know administration is expecting something, but what is your feeling that you could, how you could contribute to this uh, new strategy? Oh, we're going to contribute. Basically, we're going to work uh, more collaboratively with traffic safety section in order to achieve our traffic safety goals, which is the five E's, which is education, enforcement, uh, engineering, evaluation and engagement so that's the biggest thing but we want to work with the community a little more specifically to try and change the culture of the traffic uh, flow out there and we we're doing that with some of our reorg changes within uh, within traffic services branch like traffic safety unit and then we're working hand in hand with traffic safety section and trying to deal with some of our issues out on out on the streets like for example traffic speed so we'll work, we'll get information from traffic safety section based upon mobile radar sites. And then we use some of that data with our enforcement teams as far as how we deploy uh, some of our enforcement uh, strategies. So uh, that's probably the biggest way we'll do it. Thank you. My time's way up. Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, I'll just follow up with uh, the police on one question before I go ahead. Um, it was just, I think you use data to determine where you go, where you set up for enforcement. So getting more data is probably helpful to you as you do your work throughout the city. Would that be correct? Yes, that's correct. So as we gather this kind of intelligence, it allows you to deploy most effectively uh, to help on that and then educate people around it as you go. Is that correct? Yes, education is a big component uh, of our strategy. That's correct. And do you work? Do you work directly? I'm not sure what that is. Um, but do you direct directly with communities if they call you in on uh, traffic issues, or do you refer them to the uh, this unit? Well, we we get we communicate the best with the community with our traffic complaint process where we'll get complaints from the community and then we'll follow them up accordingly uh, and that addresses a lot of the issues with specific communities when we get them that way and then our, we'll follow up accordingly with business associations if we need to uh, and go that route. All right thank you. Um, the speakers today really talked about the value of the uh, street labs and the community work that you have planned. <clears throat> Uh, one of them erased funding, and I'm not sure about that. There's an equity piece, but it really talks to me about the, the willingness of community to uh, be engaged in this. Um, but not every community is the same. So do you imagine different solutions in different communities? Do you imagine just giving them some ideas? Could you just speak to me a little bit about that? We do anticipate that there are communities in Edmonton who won't be able to take on the community-led approach of a Vision Zero Street Lab. Um, that there is, you know, significant emotional labor involved in uh, in those types of programs. What we know from working with organizations that that provide support to those communities is that they may not have the time, energy, and resources to do that kind of work. So we'll be looking for other community partners who may want to be involved in helping to animate those spaces. One of the interesting aspects of the high crash neighborhoods in particular are that they're spaces that lots of us frequent for other reasons. They're not just residential. So I anticipate that there would be interest from other organizations in helping to participate in those programs. And we'll be working with leaders in those communities to make sure that the kinds of things that we're putting in place as solutions work with the folks who live there as well. So we heard speakers today talk about community specific problems and I have emails from other communities with community specific problems so 
Your hope is then to give them a toolbox to allow them to identify through a process and provide some resources of what could possibly be. I, I love the community garden box, flower boxes to reduce that. Um, so, but they're not just left, here's what you can do. You kind of walk them through the process, correct? That's right. We'll be there every step of the way um, to make sure that people have the right resources and tools, the expertise that's Im important in putting traffic safety measures on the streets to bring a project to life, as well as navigating internally any of the systems and processes we need to to help projects happen. Because I still wear the wounds of traffic safety common from the old program, um, but it really seemed to uh, set neighbor against neighbor. It was, and they had a vote, and there was very, it was very strict. Um, though we did get some great results, the process was cumbersome on neighborhoods. Um, do you envision a more user-friendly approach? Uh, we really want to build community, not you know be disruptive. Are you envisioning something a little bit different? Because I think this replaces that old program. Neighborhood traffic safety issues, I think as we've heard today, are pretty complex um, conversations. And so part of the resource uh, toolkit that we'll be providing is how to help uh, community conversations happen, how to gather insights from neighbors, how do we support that with information from the city um, so that folks can navigate those kinds of conversations together. We don't anticipate it being a, a, a long, cumbersome process because that'll get in the way of, of progress. And the purpose of the Street Labs program with using temporary adaptable measures is that we can explore and adjust and evolve as we need to over time. And that allows us a bit more flexibility in the, in the process versus those long-term permanent measures um, where you can't make changes as easily as you go. Well, this is a great conversation, but my portion is up. My time is up. I am going to, uh, Councillor Katerina is on the committee. Councillor Katerina. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, uh, I agree, this is an interesting conversation. Uh, in my right, I get the impression that we're looking at uh, sort of forward thinking and what we're going to do in the future. And what we've heard from uh, many of the speakers today is what already exists, uh, what's already happening. So uh, just a clarity on that, uh, Ms. Lamar, how do you see this? Uh, your presentation is a new plan again, I, another reiteration more information, more community consultation, and on and on and on. Yet, the circumstances that these people and others in the city, including my ward, or this, this is common, uh, to hear social disorder uh, from somewhere on the other side of the river is a surprise to me, because this is something that we've been dealing with for 40 years. So, Ms. Lamar, is this forward thinking and more information and data or are we actually going to be looking at some measures that we already have in our toolbox to address these issues? Thanks for the question, Councillor Katerina. And the work is happening as we speak. We know locations that need safe crossing improvements. Um, that needs to expand with an additional number of tools that we can be using to input measures, but we're not pausing any of that work. That continues. The safe streets... Okay, Mr. Mr. Mark, can I cut you off just for a second here? Sure. Just to concentrate on that. So you know the locations, uh, you know what's needed. Uh, are you bringing forward a package for uh, the supplemental budget to address those issues? Are you that confident that you have the right information and you're willing to come to council and say, give me money to address the issues that exist now. We'll continue on the plan, but come for funding. If this is that important, which it is, have you got a package ready to come? Mr. Simpson, maybe to you. Right now we're existing. Councillor Katarina, right now we're working within the existing budget process that we have uh, through the taser funding. Okay. So you don't have you don't have a budget request in order to speed up the work or add more areas to uh, to this. See that I think is a mistake because if if everybody's making this out to be as serious as it is, which it is serious, then I would expect the department responsible to come forward with a budget request along with everybody else. So, okay. Councillor, maybe I can add a little bit to that. So. 
Yeah, Mr. Seabrook. In the past, we've come with uh, the categorized list of, uh, in particular, crosswalk locations and some other enhancements. So we do have that list and, and direction, and we've gone on a year-by-year -year basis given the state of the funding that's been available. So the plan that we have is still intact, and the funding is still uh, appropriated to the end of this year. So what we've got is uh, a fixed amount of dollars that we would be coming forward with once this plan uh, receives uh, either endorsement or correction from council, then we would be coming forward with uh, the appropriate funding packages in the form of capital or operating, and that would, would be the next phase. So depending on the direction that we get today, if this report is received for information, we will have the direction to continue on. We would come back with whether that be um, profiles for uh, crosswalk enhancements or profiles for uh, temporary uh, measures to support the Vision Zero Street Labs. That would be the next piece of work that would happen. But we do have the prioritization of a number of locations. So that the prioritization work is done. And now it's a matter of uh, seeing how far uh, we can go and what the trade-offs are given the finite amount of dollars that are currently available in the reserve. Well, uh, that's why I'm asking you to have a package ready. You're using the reserve money. That's fine. But if you need additional funding in order to get some of these priorities done and add others to it, uh, I'd like to see a package from you. Uh, this supplemental budget in a week from now that you require this because it's so important. So, Councillor, um, I, I totally hear what you're saying. I think, though, what we were looking for today is uh, are we going in the right direction, balancing all the different aspects? Again, we've we've identified, I believe it was... Mr. A Mr. Seabrook, plan. you're asking us if you're going in the right direction. You're the experts in this, and you're presenting to us that you are going in the right direction, that you've figured this out, and you know the issues, you know the problems. Lack of funding is what's stopping you from implementing it. So come with a package and make your argument. So I think that's the intent, but again, we wanted to have this conversation to get a sense of how much in each direction, because there are a number of different aspects uh, to the strategy, and, and we need to figure out how far we want to go in each of those aspects, whether that be crosswalks or neighborhood traffic measures or other measures. So it's, again, balancing all the different aspects, and then how far do we want to go in each of those paths? Thank you. I'm out of time. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I guess in a related way, I've got the poster up for the street labs. And uh, there's four steps there. Build the team, engage and learn, create a plan, action. I guess my question is, as you've heard today, there's at least three neighbourhoods that are those existing neighborhoods where infill and renewal is not coming anytime soon, but they are existing neighborhoods. How fast can you execute solutions using this street labs approach? Councillor Cartmel, as a result of um, Councillor Knack's motion in August, we had advanced the work to start building out the framework for this program so we could hit the ground running in 2021. So I do expect programs, uh, projects from that program to be in place for this summer. So by projects in place, does that mean we'll start having a conversation or does that mean we'll be nailing uh, temporary bumps down onto the road? I would be looking at projects actually coming to streets in the summertime. We'll start work on uh, getting the program up and running for um, applications and, and for starting that process right away in the first quarter. So I guess I share uh, Councillor's Katarina, Councillor Katarina's uh, concerns. I'd, I'd express it in a different way, perhaps. There is a lot of policy and process here. Uh, a lot, a lot of pages of policy and process here. Uh, if there was uh, unlimited budget, do you, would you know what you were building next week? Would you know what you would spend that money on? Councillor Cartmel, it was important for us to establish that 
corporate strategy that looked at city building and transportation work and expanded what we had previously seen in the road safety strategy to include livability. Getting that right so that we can then move into the implementation phase was really important. Lots of this work is already underway. The crosswalks program had been previously funded and does have capital projects that were assigned for 21 and 22. Some of these programs that are already in existence just have a shift coming to them in terms of new contemplations. The new ones uh, we would see coming forward for budget approval from TASER in, in the first quarter of next year, but the work behind it to get the program moving has already started. So there still seems to be, though, this undertone that there's, uh, there's not quite the resources required to execute a lot of what communities would like to see done. So um, how are, you, are you contemplating or do you need a motion to contemplate things like alternative revenue uh, sources? Uh, so, and I'm speaking primarily of those neighborhoods that are not getting infill anytime soon, but, but exist uh, today. Uh, I want to circle back on the new neighborhood conversation when we get to off-site levies later today. But for those neighborhoods that came here and presented their issues, uh, what is your view on alternative ways of generating the revenue to support those community building projects? Have you contemplated that? So, Councillor Carmel, uh, we have th thought about it, um, and this isn't really the, the first time that we've talked about how we could look at potential funding from, um, say, neighbourhood groups. Um, we've never gone down that path, and I think if we want to go down that path and look at alternate revenue streams for funding these different initiatives, then it would be, uh, it would be helpful if Council provided some direction in the form of a motion to specifically look at... Um, different community methods of funding or alternate uh, funding um, methodology because right now currently there's it's it's really limited to the taser uh, funding and any supplement through tax levy and we have a very challenging week next week so I, I completely understand that um, perhaps my last question then uh, we've we've heard discussion of the priority and the prioritization process and Ms. Aiello very rightly uh, expressed concern about uh, your crosswalk isn't a priority until the first person gets hit in that crosswalk. Uh, is there going to be a further shift in prioritization with some of the work you've presented today with both the, uh, the what sounds like prioritized neighborhoods and what sounds like prioritized uh, routes in terms of accidents? In other words, are we pushing some of these crosswalks and other measures farther down the list coming out of today's uh, work? Councillor, work is underway right now actually to look at the system that we use to assess locations for crossings uh, in particular. We're taking into consideration some future planning through the growth modeling and city plan in that uh, build it and they will come kind of mentality. The not just planning for the safety of today, but also for the safety as we grow to a city of two million. And we hear that frequently, that comment uh, around, well, there's not enough here in terms of flow now, so we can't do anything. We want to address that. We also don't want to base our decision solely off of whether or not someone has tragically died or been seriously injured in an intersection. That's not the purpose of this program. So yes, the assessment criteria for these will need to shift to be more in line with what we're talking about in this strategy. I also think expanding the number of measures available in the Safe Crossings program allows us to explore more opportunities to increase in different ways at more locations. So, Councillor, if I could just quickly add as well, we did uh, in, two years ago come before Council and present uh, an update to the methodology behind selecting crosswalk locations and moving it uh, more to a risk-based as opposed to a, a, a lagging indicator basis. So we did uh, bring that forward and we did align it with the auditor's work when they assessed the crosswalk program. So we have shifted to be more risk-based as opposed to waiting for something to happen. But certainly what Ms. Lamar has described is, is even the next evolution of looking more about risk and opportunity to try and uh, um, make those enhancements before something happens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Knack.
Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for all of this work. Uh, first question just related to crosswalks. When we had that report back, I think it was in May 2018, we had 659 locations of crosswalks that needed either to have an installation that didn't have one already or an upgraded uh, crosswalk. So what are we at now? What's, the, what's our number at on that list? Councillor Neck, I'm just checking on that for you and I can give you that information in a moment. Perfect. Excellent. Just wanted to get an idea of the scope of what we're what we're still looking at, and uh, and then maybe a follow up question is is if it'd be possible to get that updated list. We we got it two years ago, and just it would be nice to know where we're at now, because that informs some of the other pieces here. So uh, I will come to the introducing Vision Zero Street Labs, which I'm excited about right away, but. Uh, just reporting traffic safety concerns. So I know you did the online mapping tool, uh, which I thought was great. I thought it was a great resource, uh, but that was there for a limited time. And there is a conversation around being able to report through 311, but um, my conversations with a number of communities, this is that still inconsistent. So I want to know where we're at right now when somebody has a near miss where, where can they actually report that and how is that captured and then how are we using that data to inform the other work? Because I don't think there's a clear process at this point. You're right, Councillor Knack. There, there isn't a great process at the moment for capturing near misses or, or also known as near crashes. Um, and that's a gap that we've identified and need to keep working on. The lived experience map was a public engagement tool and it gave us some interesting insight and some experience with gathering that, that aspect of information. People can of course report through 311 when they're having issues um, that result in near crashes as well. Um, at the same time, we are looking at expanding the data that we have available to us. We're in conversations with Alberta Health Services right now around emergency room data in particular, which will help us with some of the gap that Councillor Henderson identified earlier with crash reporting. Um, not always a crash report by its nature only contemplates when a vehicle's been involved. And we know that there are lots of people who are having lots of experiences that may not include a vehicle or an actual crash, but those shouldn't be undervalued simply because they haven't shown up through police information. So uh, just walk me through, because you did mention it, so I want to make sure I'm clear because I, I, I don't know if I was certain on where we're at. So if I experience a near miss because I'm trying to cross across the street at a crosswalk or a, maybe a crosswalk that doesn't yet exist, a corner to corner, does 311 have a clear scripting process and a data capturing process that then gets to you and your team to inform the, that prioritization list? Is there something clearly in place right now for communities to use on that? When someone calls into 311 uh, and they tell them that they have a concern around traffic safety, that, that experience gets captured and does get funneled over to us. So th that particular piece, they don't need to say it was a near crash in order to you know, cue a certain kind of script, just that they have a concern and then they would explain that what that is and that information is passed to my team. Okay, so we have that to help inform some of the work that we might be doing in the street labs piece now. Okay. <laughs> So, so to the Street Labs piece, which again, I, I think is exactly where we were headed. We wanted to make sure, and, and, I, and I appreciated that when we talked about this previously, uh, there was a concern about how quickly we could get through everything. So uh, in your answer to Councillor Cartmel, I heard that this summer we would have curb extensions, temporary curb extensions in the grounds or, you know, painted crosswalks with, you know, 3D designs or whatever tool somebody wants based off that that community engagement we'll have that in place in action at that point for communities is that uh, pending a funding conversation for those items is that correct that's correct councillor knack and that would be a balance of communities putting forward interest in participating in that program that would be an important impetus for us to be able to do that work as well as looking at opportunities to move that forward in the high crash neighborhoods and the idea is, is that uh, with this process, communities that have capacity to organize and, and do that work would be able to move on without having to always wait on the city to be there. Because part of the challenge is I, I know there's at least four communities in, in Ward 1 ready to go on this work tomorrow. If we give the okay, they're ready to go. I'm sure there's 
equally amounts in the, I should, I'm out of time. So I'm going to self-police and come back to my question. Thank you, Councillor Knack. We're going to second round with uh, Councillor Henderson. Well, I just really quickly want to explore the near miss question because I think that would speak to Ms. Aiello's concerns in some ways. Because, uh, and we, you know, we did that, I think, very informative pilot at Saskatchewan Drive and 99th Street, where it became clear that although there hadn't been significant problems, we are, were coming very close to some very serious problems and the near miss technology told us that. And I'm just wondering if there's more work we can use to deal so that we can understand that we may be getting close to some serious problems and have been lucky so far that they haven't happened. Um, and I think that would be a far better way to be able to deal with this question than waiting for it to happen. So are we looking at any of those kind of technologies? We are. One of the key actions in the safe mobility strategy is to explore some of that new monitoring technology. This is an emerging field where we're taking a look at different kinds of technology, you know, through video-based conflict analysis, for example, that allows us to understand what's going on in an intersection um, using LIDAR or other kind of trajectory-based technologies. Yeah. So those are opportunities we'd be looking at. I think it would be helpful in the Street Labs program, but also in our other yeah. major programs like but, I, but I, I'm thinking for Ms. Wait, you know, that would give us much better information on what was happening at a crosswalk like the one that Mr. Ms. Ms. Aiello is talking about. Um, it also helps us understand the public's concern and yeah, their experience, yeah. too, and to translate that. Which is what exactly what happened on 99th Street and Sass Drive. They had told us there was a problem. We didn't believe them. We put up the near mess technology, and big surprise, the community was right. So, um, and we, were, we had just been lucky. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm interested, there's some of the data that I'm, uh, well, I, maybe just to give you a chance to speak a little bit to the, to the questions I asked um, earlier in terms of making sure that we're getting all the data and not just depending on, on everything that shows up with a property damage piece. And, and I'm interested because I know the Swedes did some really interesting work grabbing hospital data and emergency data. I think that might, you know, I, I'm guessing, and that ties as well into this winter anomaly, but I'm guessing the increase, there, there probably is an increase in those kind of slip and fall injuries and those other kind of things in wintertime that we're not capturing, um, uh, that we could capture another way that may not, that may be f not being captured in that property, that over $2,000 property piece. So um, are, we, are we looking at those kind of other data points to really understand what's happening? So, Councillor, one point of clarification is that a crash report that involves an injury doesn't have to have a property damage right. amount over 2000 So we do capture those. But a vehicle would have to be involved. That's correct. And so you're right. You're on the right track with the emergency room data. That's a partnership that we need to work on with Alberta Health Services. Obviously, there's some privacy pieces there yeah. we need to work through. Yeah. But the most globally, the most successful road safety programs have access to that information and are leveraging it to do their work. And it's, it's aggregate data we have here. It's not specific data, correct? Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit puzzled by, in, in the, there, there's this thing around, um, around the weight and the threshold that we used, and I'm just not sure I understand what that graph is all about. You know, we've got, we're weighting pedestrians at five, bicycles at three, motorcycles at five, and then we have thresholds, and I just don't quite understand that chart. I got a bit lost in it. Yeah, um, thanks for that. It's uh, it's a bit technical in trying to understand the background. But of it's how at the it basis works. of I, it's, it seems to be pretty pivotal in terms of understanding our data, which is why I wanted to understand it. So, at its crux, what it's trying to reflect is that our system needs to take into account force and it needs to take into account mode, enable to understand where the most critical risk exists. So when we go back to that, we're talking about how the metal protective shell of a vehicle. Uh, provides a different level of safety yeah. to the folks inside it than outside. And that's where those weightings around mode in particular will come into account. We also weight the type of crash differently. So serious injury and fatality crashes on the high injury network are weighted more heavily than those that don't result in those kinds of tragedy. What are the thresholds then? It essentially is the mathematical formula, how that all gets plugged in with the crash data right. to come I, up I with I probably network. should go offline to understand this better. I, that's, that's, I, I don't want to... Uh, um, uh, sorry, I'm just looking for my other... Um, yeah, and then I, and I'm just wondering what, in terms of that winter piece and those, those kind of anomalies, what learning there is out of that um, that would be useful to us? Because it's really back... You know, in terms of 
trying to achieve safety, um, it feels like the pedestrian and now there may be less pedestrians out there, there may be less bikes out there, there may be part of this number, but I'm wondering what learning there is from, from that anomaly between winter and summer that can help us understand what we can do here. Dr. Albacioni hit the nail on the head that in the wintertime we do see less uh, less crashes overall. We see a higher proportion of property damage crashes happening, fender benders in particular, um, but less of the serious injury and fatality crashes. Those tend to come up in the warmer months uh, where conditions are different. You're seeing more folks moving around in an active capacity, but you also see speeds increase. And so all of those are at play in that. In particular, uh, pedestrian, cyclists, and motorcycle crashes, you're going to see more of those happening in those warmer months um, while primarily you're seeing more of the vehicle crashes in the winter time on the property damage side. Great. I'm out of time again. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, a few more questions. Uh, again, uh, what uh, we heard from the speakers today, I am hearing from uh, um, Board 12 residents uh, all the time. So some of those uh, concerns... Uh, uh, regarding those uh, uh, flashing traffic lights and uh, and crosswalk lights, there is a list, and some of those areas are way down the list. With this new strategy, is it or is it going to be some kind of reclassification of uh, that list or uh, that list states? Councillor Bengo, we wouldn't be um, we wouldn't be removing uh, areas that have already been identified for upgrade from a list. We would probably uh, just be adding and also diversifying the kinds of information and, and criteria we're looking at in terms of prioritizing where we go next. Okay, and uh, my next question is about uh, uh, again traffic safety is uh, usually approached or tend to be reactive. Uh, when uh, we, uh, I guess, establish new neighborhoods, uh, developing new uh, NSPs, is traffic safety department consulted during those planning phases for new neighborhoods? Councillor Benga, the development of the safe mobility strategy has given us an excellent opportunity to grow and expand the connections that my team has with the other teams that impact city building and transportation work across the city. So I am very happy to say that we are working closely with those folks and that we have included a key action on the development initiative in particular uh, to help do some of that, that work. And, and I see Ms. McCabe on the line as well. Yeah, Councillor Bang, I'd just like to add that uh, a lot of this happens at the subdivision phase and what's considered at the subdivision phase is the design and construction standards and operations and urban form were both heavily involved in the last design of the design and construction standards, which was done last year. And that last update of the design and construction standards took a complete streets approach. So it was a, a traffic safety approach that was applied to the update of those roadway designs. Okay, and uh, again, this question might be a little bit similar to what Councillor Kathleen asked. At this point in time, we are just um, not looking for any new funding. It's just uh, we're depending upon traffic safety automated enforcement reserve. Is that correct? Councillor Benga, the work that's led by my team in traffic safety is funded through the Traffic Safety Automated Enforcement Reserve. There is funding already in place, and that allows some of the critical programs that were in existence before to continue. We will be bringing forward in the first quarter of next year some realigned capital profiles to help fund the new work that's coming forward in the strategy. Okay, and uh, again, my next question is about uh, this... Uh, Strategy again is uh, very, I guess, uh, uh, long-term vision. Is there any effect on on something that uh, people are asking? Let's say today, how we are going to help those folks rather than uh, 
I guess, uh, trying to think about when we are a city of two million people. Councillor Bank, I think it's a both end. The work is already underway and it has been through the road safety strategy. That hasn't stopped as a result of the development of this strategy. The safe mobility strategy uh, looks to evolve some of that work moving forward and look at it in different ways, but it doesn't ignore that the work is already happening and will continue to do so. Okay, I guess my time is almost up. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Knack. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I just want to maybe, well, maybe I'll first double check. Did we get an answer to the uh, crosswalks question? Do we have that? Yes, Councillor Knack. So we have around 400 on the list right now. Um, some of them have been addressed. Some of them are being addressed as a part of the developer funded program and other work that's happening through other programs in the city. Well, that's actually pretty good progress from the 659. So I uh, encourage to hear that. Um, and, and would it be possible to, to again get that prioritization list sent to members of council through a memo? I, I just found that very helpful in, in understanding where we're looking at dealing with certain problems. Councillor, we can certainly provide you uh, with an overview of what's uh, been accomplished uh, as well as what was previously identified and then what's outstanding. And perhaps Perfect. that would be able to shape what we need to do in terms of if there's a desire to accelerate. Absolutely. That's why I ask for it, because I think that will inform that, that budget conversation. So uh, that, that leads me to my final set of questions around this, this uh, Street Labs uh, approach, which, so let's, and again, I recognize there's a dollar conversation that we have to have that you've suggested is coming in Q1, uh, and that you, you've also suggested it could be possible to have this in place this summer. Here's the question, though. Uh, I mentioned there's at least four communities in Ward 1. I got a you know, text from Councillor Carmel saying the same thing. I'm expecting every community across the city or every ward across the city has four or six communities that are in similar positions that if we said go tomorrow, they're going. So assuming we have the budget to acquire the necessary traffic calming measures, those curb extensions, speed bumps, you name it, whatever the tools are, what if 60 communities on January 1st say we're going do we do we have the capacity to get all of those addressed assuming the budget is in place to buy that equipment councillor right now I would say no uh, we would need to map out what uh, what the plan would look like in terms of how fast we want to get all of those addressed and some prioritization and just uh, just another piece to consider is that we are um, in in this pandemic working with a, a bit more of a confined resource and ability to deliver we are moving forward but I think that's a consideration we have to think about how fast we'll be able to move forward uh, in the next three to six months which is why I so and that's the part that gives me pause then because I, I I worry that like with the crosswalk situation which again you've done great work in reducing it from where you're where we were at to where we are now um, I'm worried we're going to create another six year long list or ten year long list to get through everything and so my hope and and the way I interpreted the, the attachment seven was that. Generally, we're trying to actually stay out of it because we don't have the staffing resources to go into every single community and lead a conversation and do that work. We've got communities that are willing to do it. So, so how, how do we scale up to that? You know, is there something that can be done in preparation of a, of a street labs project that allows us to, to support that many communities if, we're, if they're ready to go? What, what, is the, what is the mechanism we need to give you as a council or what, is, what do you need on your end to, to achieve that if, if we were to see that materialize? Councillor Nack, I think a, a first year of experience with the program is critical for us to know the answers to all those questions. We need to give this a go and see how it goes with communities. We need to understand what the resource implications are for the city over time with supporting those projects and the varied potential financial commitment to each program depending on the location. 
can I offer, I, I, I want to offer a respectful challenge in the sense that we, we know that, don't we? Like, I mean, you know, we rebuilt, uh, as an example, a very specific example, we rebuilt 182nd Street in Belmead three years ago and incorporated curb extensions in that rebuild because we know the tangible benefit that has in narrowing down the road and thereby reducing the speed of traffic. So, so I'm wondering, do we, do we actually need to capture more? What, what more would we capture knowing the set of tools that we would be using anyways, knowing that the city of Calgary has been using the temporary curb extensions now for a couple of years and clearly advertises it on their site. So I, I just want to know how we can help you make sure that if we have 40 or 50 or 60 communities that want to see action, that we could deliver that for them and support you and the needs that you have to do that. Councillor, I think you're right that there are some measures that we know how to put in and can do that quickly. The difference, I think, in this particular program is, is that we were encouraged to look at a community-led program and that having those conversations in neighbourhoods can be complex and that there are many different ideas and perspectives and experiences out there. And that's perhaps an X factor in this process that we have to explore through rolling it out one year to best understand um, what folks are looking for, what they need, and, and how we roll the program out. Okay. I'm out of time. I might speak to it when we get to that point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions, and then I was happy to move it, though I do see Councillor Bang has popped on again. Um, my, my question was, we talked about uh, a funding, and right now, if uh, a community wanted to do a levy to put lights in their alley, they can do that, correct? Councillor, I would, I would need to, uh, to seek some input from, uh, from law in particular to see what the options would be on that. So I couldn't give you a definite answer. We can get back to you. Well, certainly. I, I think I've had a community explore that and they looked that they could use it in a safety aspect. That's um, correct, Councillor Esslinger. It's Adam here. Um, communities can do that. So that mechanism is in place. What's not in place is for them to use it for traffic safety items. Um, and we heard today about, you know, could communities fundraise for traffic safety? Uh, and I, I'm not sure it's a way we should go. Um, and I, I guess I just want some advice because is that something you would like to explore now or should we wait until we've got street labs working and seeing if there is a need? Because um, I don't want the cart before the horse or more work that's not necessary. So, uh, Councillor, I think, there, there's definitely sensing an indication that there's a desire to move faster uh, on on many aspects of the safety uh, and mobility system. So I think one of the things we'll need to address is how we fund this if we do want to move faster. So certainly I think looking at what funding options would be um, available would be something that we should start on fairly quickly so that if we do decide uh, to move faster that we've kind of identified and, and flushed out how, what and how we could do that. Okay, so I, I'm happy to do, to make a motion, I'll, I'll, just to explore it. I'm not sure what we should apply it for. I, I think we want, community wants more. And we're going to be faced with those challenges. So um, I think we have a draft something out there. You could put that up and I'll move that. So that administration explore alternative funding opportunities for community traffic safety infrastructure, including impacts on equity interpretation with existing funding prioritization and provide a report to committee. Um, my hope is that allow you to explore other items to, and it, the equity lens is very important to me. And so I, I think it's important we consider whether we should or shouldn't and how that works. So. Does this allow you to do that work? I just want to make sure I'm not going to send you in a way that's not helpful. No, th this would provide direction and, and this would be done in parallel with the work that we have underway. Because I think we're going to run into things that community wants something 
a little looking nicer than we're providing on a temporary basis, and that might be where that works. I don't know. Um, so I have moved that. Um, and I guess I'll take questions on that. Is that what I have to do now? I have a few more folks on the run since that's happened. So I've moved that. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Banga. Thank you, Madam Chair. I only have one question. Uh, I know it was uh, raised uh, during uh, when the speakers were talking. And uh, again, the question is those uh, speed bumps. Could somebody explain to me why they are not throughout the width of the road rather than covering partial? Councillor Banga, just uh, the work temporary speed bumps, they are removed for winter work. Uh, they do not take on the whole length of the road in consideration of some of the drainage issues it may create. So if you have permanent uh, structures in there, that would be a consideration in the design. So with these, that was part of the consideration. Okay, thanks a lot. Councillor Banga, that's all? That is all. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cartmel? Uh, just speaking to your motion, Madam Chair. Okay, why don't we, we have... Uh, Two minutes left till we're completed. Um, I'm just going to see if I have a consensus to finish I'll, this item. I'll move to, to, to extend orders to finish this item. Okay. Uh, we have a movement to finish this item. I'm just looking to committee for consensus on doing that. Yes, I see nodding heads. So we're going to consider that pass to finish this item. Uh, we'll go back to Cartmel, Councillor Cartmel to speak to it. Go ahead. Thank please. you, Madam Chair. I'll be, uh, I'll be brief. I really like uh, this motion. Uh, really understand the, that there may be some concerns about, uh, about equity, about uh, you know, the idea that some communities may have the capacity to raise funds and deliver some of these solutions and that other communities may not. And I think we need to balance that with uh, you know, the perspective that uh, those communities that might be able to take on some of these things on their own uh, reduces the burden on the city to deliver the, the whole list of priorities that we're talking about. So I think, uh, you know, an examination and a balancing of, of both of those perspectives would be valuable. Uh, I think it's not lost on anyone that we are going to be extremely challenged as a city, as a council, and as an administration to find our way through our budget pressures over the next couple of years. So uh, we've talked uh, previously about uh, the opportunity for partnerships, for unique funding uh, uh, ideas, for uh, the community coming together and solving community problems collectively. So there may be uh, some life in that perspective for these kinds of solutions. But I think more than anything, we have heard today, we have heard today that we need particular solutions in particular places for particular communities. And those places run across the city. They run right from the, from the very extremes of the suburbs to the core. They uh, are very local. When we talk about a city plan that talks about 15-minute communities, that talks about walkable communities, that talks about community for community, these things are critical. Uh, when we have situations where we've got people, and, and that this is something we didn't get a chance to talk to a little bit earlier, that where we've got neighborhoods south of the Hende that don't have schools in their neighborhood yet, and those people are funneling their way into established neighborhoods to deliver their kids to school and get out of them. That, that creates congestion, which creates impatience, which creates shortcutting, which creates speeding. And all the signs in the world, as Mr. Vermillion showed, will not stop that frustration from having people act badly. But things like speed bumps and curb ball boats and other active, permanent, uh, deliberate measures that make people behave better in their car are critical. And if communities can deliver those things for themselves, I think we need to find the, op find the way to provide them that opportunity. So this motion at least explores that, it examines those, uh, those matters, and it's very timely because come spring, we're gonna be dealing with a lot of pressure coming out of our budget discussions next week. So thank you for the motion. Obviously, I wholeheartedly support it. I really wish I could vote for it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, but you can't. Uh, and I'm going to committee members who can first, and then I'll go to Councillor Knack. So, Councillor Katarina first. Thank you very much. And uh, just uh, this motion here, and I guess uh, to the uh, receipt for information uh, that we'll follow, this is part of in that. My, my concern is that, uh, even though I agree with this, my concern is that we uh, uh, start to pit uh, half communities with non, uh, not half communities. And that I can see as coming up as an issue. Uh, so hopefully this discussion, as far as equity is concerned, that that lens is put on it as well, too. Uh, that just because you have the capacity uh, should not put you in front of the line uh, where others uh, have been waiting. Uh, so there has to be a balance in uh, the prioritization of uh, all the issues that we're, we're dealing with in the neighborhoods that uh, uh, obviously need it uh, immediately. And everybody needs it as soon as possible. There, there's no question about that. But uh, uh, certainly the other thing that I'd like to see in this, and hopefully that's part of the report, is that when you took a, take a look at the mapping, the most serious uh, areas of the city, most of it seems to be, the majority of it seems to be in uh, grid neighborhoods. Older, uh, the grid uh, neighborhoods versus the uh, uh, winding roads to the uh, 20, 30-year-old neighborhoods and the future ones uh, coming, hopefully, will be different than that as well, too. So uh, I, I hope that there's some uh, information there, coordination of, of of uh, why the grid system seems to be presenting uh, uh, more uh, challenges uh, uh, right now uh, with the information that we have. So uh, with that, hopefully th there is a good balance and uh, uh, I hope that uh, what I said before, the communities aren't pitted against each other because of uh, economics uh, or uh, capacity, uh, uh, make it uh, a fight uh, that uh, I don't think any community wins. So. I'll support this uh, with that information to follow. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, just uh, really quickly. One, I wanted to thank, um, you know, because I think this will be the motion. We won't need to receive it for information. We pass this. So I wanted to thank for really good, thank the, the administration for really good work in, in moving us forward. I think this is another huge step forward. It may not be the definitive one, but I think it's a big step forward. I just wanted to speak to the equity question a little bit because I think we're imagining this as an amenity and it isn't amenity, what we're really trying to do is save lives. So I'm not sure, as long as we don't let some, a neighborhood that comes forward that can, that can use resources to help save lives, as long as we don't let them push somebody else off the table, as long as the resources that we're putting there are still going to those neighborhoods that are high priority, that can't afford it, I don't think the equity question is quite as prevalent as it would be as if you were using this as a way of replacing work. So I think, I think we can do this if we're really, really vigilant to make sure that this doesn't become a way of replacing the work in those more challenged communities that has to be done as long as those programs stay in place. If other communities have the wherewithal to save lives in their community faster, I don't see the downside to that. I don't see this as a case of somebody saving themselves at somebody else's expense. But we would have to keep both programs going. This has to be a way of speeding up the work uh, and adding work that we would not otherwise be able to do rather than replacing work. And as long as we're careful not to replace work um, with money that comes to the community, I think the equity question is separate. We have to keep our focus on making sure that all unsafe conditions in all neighborhoods are dealt with whether or not they can afford to do it or not. But if we can take some neighborhoods and help them speed up as an add-on to the existing program, I think that benefits everybody because ultimately, hopefully, that is life saved. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Thank you, just quickly speaking to it. Uh, yeah, the, every neighborhood uh, is of concern to us as far as the traffic uh, safety is concerned. Um, we do not, however, uh, want to pit neighborhood against neighborhood. Uh, and uh, uh, this motion, I know it's at this point in time, it's only exploration of alternate, uh, alternate funding. And uh, we will get the information and, uh, and then uh, we need to decide what is there, how it's going to be implemented, and if it can be implemented without any of these uh, repercussions. So uh, I will uh, 
I am uh, in full support of this uh, motion and uh, waiting for uh, March 2nd or a 13 week default for this to come back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mayor Iveson. There we go. Sorry, I'm not essentially I'm in chambers. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I listened to uh, the presentations from most of the members of the public. I had a regional meeting, so I missed uh, the first few. But uh, first, I'm going to start with uh, thanks to all of the community leaders uh, who continue to bring these issues to the attention of elected officials and, of course, our, our experts at the city and our uh, partners at the university who help us ensure that we're taking an evidence-based approach. Uh, uh, to this important work, but I think uh, all of us will remember from all of the door knocking we've done over the years that um, traffic safety issues are near and dear uh, to to our citizens in every part of the city. Um, and there is always a combination of real issues and perceived issues, um, but even the perceived issues are of, of critical importance to the full sense of safety. Uh, in our community uh, and reflect people's desire for safety for themselves and for their loved ones who may be more vulnerable users of the roadway system. So um, I think this work is important. Uh, I think administration's innovative approach to it and inclusive approach to it is to be lauded, uh, and, but again, is built very much on the values of this community and the input from uh, folks like those who presented today. So uh, thank you everyone for this. Um, on the specifics of uh, the motion here, I'm, I'm willing to take a further look at how we might manage this. Uh, I, I do think the equity issues are, are, are a, a genuine concern. Uh, I wouldn't want to create have and have not traffic safety conditions in our, system, uh, in our city. Um, if there is a way to mitigate against that, uh, and if the argument can be made that we can get to safer communities for everyone uh, as a sort of um, map for how to make the change uh, by, by leveraging partner resources, you know, I'm willing to look at that, but, uh, but I think we would have to have a pretty strong commitment to ensure that that is additive and not, uh, uh, not at all at the, uh, which I haven't heard any, anyone say it would uh, offset of funding that's going in today. Now, here's the other thing that we're going to have to deal with, and the budget questions are, are real going forward because uh, we are uh, victims of some of our traffic safety success to the extent that folks slowing down and getting the message uh, and the physical modifications to the roadway system also reinforcing that cue and the culture changing around this slowly but surely. Uh, those fine revenues that fund some of this work are, um, are declining. Uh, so um, I think we've got to keep an eye on that, and there may come a time where uh, it will require a further top-up. Um, but I think whether that comes from partner resources, whether it comes from, from the tax levy, I think is a, a fair budget debate in any year, even one that's this difficult. Uh, but we do still have the benefit of the automated enforcement revenues, um, which you kind of don't go to the city bottom line. Those uh, Those... Those automated enforcement revenues uh, go to fund work like this, and I think we'll get great leverage by partnering with the community with the uh, with the lab project. And so, I just want to again applaud the innovative approach. I think that we'll get better value for dollars. Willing to look at the the, the partner uh, funding, um, uh, an alternate funding scenario, but just want to put a really big marker down that that can't for a minute erode our baseline commitment to this work, which. Uh, I think we've heard, um, you know, needs to be amplified, if anything, uh, especially, and we had a good conversation yesterday about what it would take to really achieve our healthy city goals and our safe city goals. Uh, and this is a critical part of that work um, and also a critical part, therefore, of some of the related goals in the city plan. So I'll leave it there, but uh, thanks for uh, a few moments to react and applaud the work. Thank you. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and again, first thanks to all the speakers today, and, and uh, I, I do want to really thank the administration. I thought the, the safe mobility strategy was excellent, and, and so to answer the high-level question, yeah, we're absolutely headed in the right direction with it. Uh, and, and I just I want to make sure I say that clearly, because I do want to focus on, on this, and so I appreciate the motion. Um, 
I want to offer a caution, which is that what I heard in today's answers, and I'd like to maybe do a separate follow-up on it, not today in the committee meeting, but just maybe offline, is even if we had the money to do 60 communities next year, that we are hesitant as a city to authorize that because we want to set up a process that allows us to, and and rightfully so, I understand why we want to make sure we can closely measure the success of those actions, that we've made sh- that we can verify that the community did do whatever requirement of engagement that we have. Uh, and, and, and so my worry is, yes, we're going to do this work and say, sure, communities can go fundraise, but that's, all that does is take the money portion of the funding out of the equation, and it doesn't take the other part of work that I just heard that we want to do. And and so I, I, I'd like to throw out a challenge and, and explore this and see if maybe at a separate time we will need a motion for this, which is to say, um, are we willing to be a little, little, little less risk adverse in saying that if we've got communities, and it, let's say we have 50 communities that do the work next year and are ready to see something implemented this in, in summer 2021, why we would say no to that. Can we set this up in a way that is going to empower communities to identify those challenges and measure them, and, and measure them by pilot, by actually putting the test into action? So what I worry about is that we're going to only do 10 communities next year, and that we're going to want to see how that went before ramping up and then getting through a lot, what is now a, a fairly large backlog of communities, I think. So I, I, I'm wondering if we can help reduce the risk on administration's ends as a council by saying, yes, we're okay with trying this out in a lot of different communities and then using that data from all of those various communities to understand the success of the program or the failures of the program or possibly both because we'll have a a larger data sample to then inform ongoing changes. Because the the biggest impact I see is is truly changing out the tools that we're going to be using to try this. And these tools can be moved to other communities. So it's not even like we would be wasting money by trying this in 50 communities and having 10 where it didn't quite work. And then saying, okay, that's fine. Well, the tools there get removed tomorrow and we put in some new tools and we transfer those other tools to the next 10 communities that have now started doing that work. So, yeah, we can ask the communities to fundraise themselves, but it's not actually going to change the work that I just heard stated by administration, which is monitoring and testing. So I, 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 I'm interested in exploring this further, and so I will reach out uh, uh, to, to see are there opportunities. You know, to, we're, I think council is, wants to empower admin to maybe feel like they, they don't have to um, be worried about the risk of, of trying a bunch of these very quickly, just like we're trying through other uh, conversations that we're going to have tomorrow around halls and, and ways to do this. I, 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 so I'm just hesitant and, and say, uh, appreciate, absolutely support this motion, but I don't actually think it's going to solve the problem I just heard of potentially many communities in every ward wanting solutions. And so I would hope that we can maybe through this work say, well, instead of worrying about who's paying for it, we have potentially enough money to do that many communities. Let's set up a process that allows that many communities to have that work implemented in summer 2021. So uh, thanks. Uh, sorry for taking up some extra time in lunch here, but just wanted to offer that as a, as a caution. Thank you. Thank you. And just to close, I, I really appreciated everybody's input today. I think the safe mobility strategy and that the 2021 work plan that's embedded in the plan is great. I'm excited to see the additional collaboration and data and uh, really appreciated using the GBA Plus lens and how that has informed our work in a new way. And really, we're one of a kind doing some of that work and really wanted to say thank you about that. Um, The intent of this motion is just to explore some other ideas. Right now, my understanding is if you want to add lights to an alleyway, neighbors can come together and get a levy and improve the safety of that alley. Uh, If you are in neighborhood renewal, you can uh, 
get different blades and there's some ways to uh, that you have different levees to different things. So I think we do take a bit of a hybrid approach uh, in many areas. Um, and I'm not sure if there's things that we think a community could add through additional funding. Maybe it's a levy that they need to use. Uh, maybe it is to get prettier, more than the basic uh, speed bumps. I don't know. Uh, I just think that we need to explore it and then be really clear. I'm very concerned about the equity concern and I think uh, I heard that from some of my colleagues as well. I, am, I do not want to impact the, the safety of any neighborhood, but I think there's ways that we might need to think differently. And I think we're at a time and a space that we need to think differently about how we do our business. Is there some things that can be done differently? Maybe it's fundraising, maybe it's levy. I do not know. And maybe with equity issues, we can't do that. But I, I think we need to explore all options and see maybe there is a few things that we need to be clear and we, they could do. Uh, I, like Councillor Nack, am concerned about the how many communities can get in the street <coughs> labs. Because um, I think many will, will want to try. Um, and I hope that we're going to say as many as possible can have those community conversations. What a great problem to have that so many communities came up with solutions. Um, and maybe that's something when we have the March conversation, we'll be able to say, hey, it's been an awesome ride and we need funds to do this. Um, I don't know. But at the end of the day, we're committed to building safer communities. That's the thing that we have, uh, we talked about it yesterday with the city plan, safer communities by 2030. Uh, I think they all link together. The city plan, the safe mobility strategy, they all are, are pieces of the big plan. And I, I think um, we're building the city for today and for the next generation and safety is on our horizon. So thank you for the work you do each and every day and for your partners to keep our city safe. And with that, I will call the vote on this motion. We're still yes, for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Katarina. We're also missing Councillor Benga and, and your vote, Madam Chair. Oh, I did submit. Uh, okay. Yes. I can see that you're in the correct meeting, but it hasn't come through. It's just Councillor Benga. Councillor Benga, can you verbal? M mine is yes. Okay. Thank you. We have five votes. And Madam display Chair. the vote then. And that is carried unanimously. I believe that addresses the receipt for information on this item as well. So we have completed 6.1. We will return. Uh, we're going into recess at 1.30, and we have a time specific for item 6.7 at 1.30. All the others will go numerically following that. Stay tuned. Thank you.
So we're ready to roll. Welcome back to the uh, Urban Planning Committee meeting of December 1st. Um, it is 1.30, so we are going to our time-specific item. Our first item is 6.7. Um, the off-site levy, so I'll go to administration for uh, presentation. Uh, good afternoon, committee. We just have some short opening comments. Uh, Rhonda Tui, who's the acting branch manager of the city planning branch, will provide those comments. So the report that we're bringing forward today brings an update on stakeholder engagement for off-site levies, including an overview of the engagement process, associated outcomes, and the next steps, including further refinement of our operating principles, a governance model, and the development of the offsite levies bylaw. We recognize that our engagement with industry partners is important and we'll continue to engage with them in the offsite levies. We will return to Council in Q2 of 2021. With me today to answer questions is Lindsay Butterfield, Director of Urban Growth and Open Space open space strategy, who's leading the offsite project. In addition, we have Deborah Rhodes, Chief Financial Officer with the Edmonton Public Library, and our Fire Chief, Joel Zattenley. Thank you. And Madam Chair, apologies. Uh, we haven't conducted a roll call since returning from the recess. I can confirm that I see all members of the committee here, but just in case you wanted to, to conduct that. Okay, I'm just confirming that all members of the committee are here. Councillor Banga. I definitely am here. Thank you. Councillor Katerina. Hello. Councillor Henderson. Yes, I'm here. All right, and I'm here. I don't see anyone else. We do have a couple of other members of council on. I see Councillor Knack. Are there any other members of council with us this afternoon? Councillor Esslinger, I'm here as well. Thank uh, you. Councillor McKean. I'm here too, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Carmel. I think we have more than enough to continue, so we will. And at this point, we are going to hear from our speaker. Um, Mr. Pye, please go ahead. Thanks to the committee for the opportunity to speak today. I think uh, uh, you've probably received some letters from other industry associations. My name's Anand Pai and I'm the executive director of NEA. We're an association for commercial and industrial developers. And I just wanted to uh, give our perspectives on, uh, on, on the report today. Uh, you know, the report is, is really correct in saying so much has changed in 2020 uh, with the crash in oil prices and, and, uh, you know, global economic recession hitting Edmonton harder than other communities uh, now with the highest unemployment of any major city. Uh, it's necessitated a, a real shift in, in our thinking. As well, we see that uh, the COVID's affected just the actual logistics of our meetings. Uh, so prioritizing health and safety uh, and pivoting to critical new areas, the committee met less often than in 2020. I just wanted to, uh, to come in person to uh, hopefully answer any questions and give you a sense of the conversations that we've been having uh, in, in this committee so far. It's a big change, uh, it, you know, uh, new levies for, uh, for, for development areas are, are a huge change in, in the way that the city is built out. And so uh, commercial and industrial representatives have been consistent uh, in, in our uh, assertion that there should be no new levies in commercial and industrial areas for three reasons. One is that these areas don't benefit from services such as libraries, uh, which, are, which are paid for primarily through taxes right now. Also, these areas pay a higher non-residential tax rate, making them net contributors to city revenues. And that's why keeping these areas competitive is important for jobs in the overall tax ratio of the city. So we feel the city's hurt us on these points uh, and, uh, and we also feel that that uh, that some of the exemptions that we've been discussing so far should be uh, extended to commercial and retail areas, as well as mixed use, to hit our city uh, goals. Uh, 
these areas have been hit really hard by the by the current economic conditions, retail especially, uh, mixed use in, in terms of financing and investment. And so we see some opportunities there. Also wanted just to touch on really quickly uh, some of the other opportunities that we see going forward that might be relevant to council that we've discussed in this committee, uh, which is which have been really positive. One of the areas is, is in some of the policies that make uh, that make city buildings more expensive than in surrounding municipalities and more expensive than privately built facilities. We feel that some of these in, enhanced design criteria, identifying them, uh, getting them out in the open and, and, and analyzing whether they're a benefit for new areas uh, or whether they should be excluded from levy calculations as an area that we're actively discussing uh, in our committee. The, the governance of the... Of, of levies, uh, we right now have an ARA committee. How can new levies uh, uh, be understood through through that governance model is something we're working on, as well as the timing of new facilities for new areas. This is something really relevant for council. You know, new residents and businesses uh, who may have to pay more through this process. We feel should have some certainty of when that infrastructure uh, will be built. Another positive. Uh, out of these conversations is the push for more efficient facilities uh, like libraries being built into new rec centers. I think council has another report on, on new rec centers uh, coming soon and we've had really positive discussions so far uh, with our partners at, at public libraries. In the event that this can't happen uh, by combining libraries and, and, and rec centers to make more efficient parking and, and land use decisions, we feel that, uh, that we've been pushing towards uh, looking at lease structures like happens in, in St. Albert and Sherwood Park, where uh, where public libraries could be leased in new commercial areas to share the land and, and, and parking there. So uh, overall, we remain working with the city as stakeholders in this process and uh, look forward to updating you further as the process continues. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. So we'll, uh, we'll open it up now for questions. Councillor Henderson. Well, just really quickly, because I understand the argument around libraries, but for you know, for commercial industrial, I'm guessing things like fire halls, um, you 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 probably do benefit from. And in actual fact, I'm guessing getting a fire hall faster to you actually probably helps on your insurance costs and those other kind of things. So there is benefit there. Yes. Yeah, there is some benefit. In, so in you're just far. saying there's a certain kind of thing that you that you might want to you might want to carve out for the industrial and commercial pieces, but not that all of the stuff that we're talking about would necessarily be carved out. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, good. Okay. I just I just wanted to I just and and I, and I guess another another thing in terms of because I think what we're talking about here and just your thinking on this. What we're talking about here are long, much longer term plays, I think, than what's happening this year or even next year. So that's why I'm struggling a little bit with the argument that what's happening to us in this particular case right now, none of this stuff would really likely come into play. I'm thinking for another year or two at the fastest. Um, so I'm not sure why the, the kind of COVID and, and, and gas price issue is, is you know, I, 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 I'm really nervous that we start making short-term decisions that have long-term impacts. And this seems to me as a long-term impact kind of decision. Yeah, I think uh, I think overall it accelerates a trend uh, away from oil and gas and as well in industrial and commercial areas, which I'm speaking to specifically, uh, you know, the, the in those areas locating more and more outside of the city. So I, I think, I, I, I think the COVID is accelerating trends just broadly, uh, as, as, as you know, it being a singular point in time. Well, I mean, this comes down to the same problem we've always had: is it becomes the lowest common denominator rush to the bottom, um, and that if 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 one of the things that we can put on the table is is a higher level of facility, a higher level of of of, of industrial neighborhood, um, then how we pay for that is going to be one of the challenges. So there's a, there's a trade-off there, is there not? Yeah, I think there's a trade-off, and I think you know we're, we're seeing the results of the of that trade-off with the uh, with the decisions that that some of the large industrial users have been making. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. We'll go to Councillor Banga. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
Mr. Pai, uh, thanks for coming today and uh, uh, expressing your concerns and uh, enlightening us. So I know you're uh, you're advocating for uh, for uh, I guess your clients or your members, and uh, my question to you would be: uh, since the cost is always trickling down to the consumer. So whether it's industrial or it is uh, residential. So if somebody uh, who is living in the outlying areas of the city where this uh, off-site levy is uh, gonna build a library or fire hall or whatever else, you think they would have the same kind of argument because they are supporting the whole city infrastructure while their their own is being funded by themselves. Comments, please. Thank you, Councillor. That's a really good question. I think you know it goes down to the uh, to the dichotomy there is between between levies, which are an upfront payment, or or property taxes, which is you know as you say a payment um, uh, continuing on, and and of course you know. Uh, we, we we don't like either, so we you know so we, we try to we try to advocate for uh, for ways in which we can uh, we can rationalize those costs. And so some of the areas that we're looking at is is the overall cost of the uh, uh, of the facility, how we can make that lower while still providing the the valuable services that that libraries and fire halls provide, as well as how can we ensure uh, some level of certainty on the timing. Of those uh, of those new facilities, and these are areas we've been working really well with administration on. Um, so, so I, I know that's that's a bit of, that's a bit of a non-answer, but I think uh, I think those are the areas we've been working on the most in in this committee, and I think we may uh, you know we, we may never come to a full agreement with with all industry players on uh, on on exactly everything, but but those are areas that we're that the these are areas that we've been able to explore lately. Okay, I know it has to be explored. Um, at the same time, uh, let's say, I think in the previous uh, uh, councillor's uh, answer, you un you answered uh, about the fire hall. But there are some things, uh, uh, like library, of course, uh, they're not going to use it. But fire hall, everybody's going to use it. So how do we go from service to service in, in distinguishing words so somebody should be paying or somebody shouldn't be playing, yeah, paying. One of the areas that we've been uh, really uh, uh, united on as, in, as different industry associations is that is that new areas that benefit should, should pay. And, and while I can't speak on behalf of the other organizations, you know, I think that's a good principle to hold in mind. Um, what, the other area I think that that is specific to commercial and industrial areas is the is the differential in tax rate uh, of those areas and the and the ability of those businesses uh, to to move you know inside or outside of the city and so I think uh, I think you know through taxes the city uh, the city is making money on new industrial areas and so I've I've seen at least uh, you know a real effort by administration and council in attracting uh, attracting those businesses. And I think that's kind of the direction that, that, that we're moving in. Okay. So uh, just a general comment on my, on, for, uh, on I guess my own comments it is, uh, let's say, as a citizen, uh, um, I am, uh, I guess, uh, spending my tax dollars on some of those uh, amenities that I amenities or necessities that the industrial areas enjoy, whether it be roads, whatever else it may be. Um, but again, uh, the thing is, it's uh, when it comes to myself, I'm not getting no benefit. Another comment, please. No, thanks. Thanks for that question. I think it comes down to the to a whole city approach that we have uh, with with property taxes. 
right? Uh, you know, I might not use a rec center out in uh, out in a suburban area because I live downtown, uh, but but through property taxes, we're able to make these make these decisions or or have these amenities that that help the whole city. Where where those are necessitated by uh, you know by new growth, I think we're talking about uh, we're talking about to what level new developments should uh, should pay. But I think that overall, a lot of these things help the whole city. So that's a broad comment. But thank, thank you so much. Thank you. And now we'll go to Councillor Katarina. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'd like uh, your industry's take on it, in, in particular to uh, industrial commercial. Uh, so uh, have you factored in or has your industry factored in uh, that uh, Edmonton proper uh, uh, has eliminated business tax? It's been shifted over to, uh, to property and that uh, no M&E uh, tax in Edmonton. So this, this idea of... Uh, uh, people locating outside our boundaries. Uh, that was one of the reasons for the shift in business tax, uh, given that it was based on square footage and industrial, you could have a 20,000 square foot warehouse or yard space. Uh, so has that gone into your uh, thinking on on this or the industry's thinking on this? I, th I think so. I think that, uh, that when... Uh, Companies like Altus Group publish the the differential tax rates. They they'll now include the overall uh, the, the overall tax burden uh, from from property taxes that it would include uh, the the what you know at least include in some areas a, a, an M and E uh, tax. But I, I, so I think the companies are making those decisions all the time using the using the best information available. But uh, but I know what you're saying that those those have been positive. Uh, positive moves. I, I, I don't have a, a ton of information about them. I think they're a bit, uh, you know, before uh, before we work. Yeah, I, I'd uh, I'd be curious in finding out whether the industry themselves is really uh, uh, like in, even individually. Uh, certainly, uh, um, someone that's building their own premise and is the owner operator. Uh, they're you know the tax shift from business to property is one thing, but if it's a large um, a uh, developer with uh, many tenants, uh, that, that's a huge benefit to the tenant, unless unless the property owner is uh, actually including that in his triple net for uh, for the cost uh, of it. So have, has, have you seen where people have taken advantage of that uh, tax elimination uh, that we uh, introduced in the city? And it's been going on now for a number of years, whether that's attracted or, or not attracted, uh, Industry uh, into uh, our boundaries. I'd have to take that back and and uh, and ask around to our folks. I think it's a good, you know, it is a good marketing uh, push inside the inside the city, and there are definite advantages to locating uh, inside the city versus outside, and 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 that that's one. And I think putting those putting all of those together is a way that the city can attract more of that kind of investment. Yeah, no, I'm sure from our perspective, cities are administration perspective that. I would think would be a normal sort of uh, sales pitch, uh, but I'm more concerned about the industry themselves. If uh, if they're just uh, concentrating on on property tax and using that as the wow, the city is really getting us because of the property tax yeah. lift. But that's not actually all property tax. That's uh, the business tax that was shifted over as well. So you would have had to pay that and M and E. Uh, uh, tax, uh, which we don't charge for, or here you have to pay for that somewhere else. So, uh, when all things being equal, where do we stand as a city versus the region? That's a that's a great comment, and I think uh, maybe I could connect with our with our friends at uh, at groups like MNP and, and Altus, which which uh, publish reports on on that kind of thing, and and uh, and, and come back because it is a good it, it is it's definitely a consideration for sure. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. That's all my questions. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Pye. That is all the questions that we have for you. Appreciate you coming and speaking today on this issue. 
Um, now we'll turn over to administration and questions of administration. And Councillor Henderson selected this item, so I'll start there. Councillor Henderson. Um, yeah, no, I just, um, I, you know, understanding that the, the, the work continues on this. I mean, I, I guess I would ask you the same question I asked Mr. Pye about, you know, long-term versus short-term, because I, this really does seem to me is a long-term a long-term consideration, and I'd be nervous that we make choices based on the short term that, um, you know, that that have a long-term impact. Agreed with you, Councillor Henderson, and this is one of those forward with focus projects where we need to continue to keep our eye on the long game of the type of city that we're trying to build and the type of city that's articulated in city plan. But with that being said, what's important is that engagement uh, is required uh, through uh, the requirements for the provincial government, as well as we want to be transparent in our processes that we develop with industry. Yeah. So in the short term, what's been, what's been important is engagement has been impacted and the ability to engage over the course of this project. So short term, we need to continue to engage, but we need to keep our eye on the long term through this one for sure. Yeah, no, and I, and I, I don't have a problem if it has to slow down a little bit. I mean, that's, that's not my concern. My concern is that we begin to compromise some of those pieces that are about long-term sustainability for the city because we're worried about a, a, a very short-term kind of concern. And I, I, if that, I, that, th I just wanted to ask that question because I think, I think this is about long-term sustainability and I, um, I, I can't speak for the rest of council, but I, for me that would take precedence over, over, over what, what the short-term looks like. Um, my other question is one, and it's interesting because I, I just had a chat a long overdue one with some of the folks from IDEA over lunch. Um, and, you know, they were talking about the ways in which, uh, and I know this has come up, for instance, in the report that we were supposed to get tomorrow, but it's actually been put off um, on, the, on the whole uh, Rolly Miles uh, rec center piece. Um, the ways in which we may be able to look at this kind of levy uh, to deal with some of the need um, for facilities or rena restoration of facilities, particularly in areas of our, existing areas of our city, um, where we're going to see a lot of infill, we're going to see a lot of more people moving in, and whether or not we're looking at that piece of the puzzle as well. Councillor Henderson, at this point, we're not, not in phase one. However, as we look uh, to develop the growth management framework for the for implementation of the city plan, we will need to look at that in the longer run. Okay, so it is so it is part of the longer term thinking. I mean, I, I recognize it's more complicated, um, although, interestingly enough, we do have that, that sort of pilot report that's coming back to us on the Raleigh Miles piece that is a very similar kind of conversation about other ways in which you may be able to look to neighborhood and what's happening in neighborhoods, both existing and, and new build, in order to make some of these amenities that you know amenities that are going to be critical to make the neighborhoods work happen. So, um, so, uh, but so that it's in our long term site, but not in our short term. It does have to be in our long term site, and perhaps a project team could speak to that if they'd like. Uh, it is about pace of development and being thoughtful about how we implement that. Ms. Butterfield, do you want to add anything? Oh, thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. I think that is within our site. Um, one of the things we want to do through growth management is examine um, a full suite of tools. Um, and we know that through Reimagine, Council is looking for different opportunities to generate revenue. Offsite levies is very narrow in its focus and, and our ability to apply it. And so we want to ensure that if we were to use levies in redeveloping areas, that that would be the best tool for us to pick. Right. But I mean, some of I mean, some of the principles would probably be the same. That the benefit, you know, that there that there's benefit both to the people that are already living in a community, but also for people that are going to redevelop into a community. That if you can have amenities there, it makes the neighborhood that much more attractive and easy to redevelop. So, I, I'm guessing the principle is the same behind why you would look at a look at a what would still be an offsite levy. Essentially, you would just have to apply it in a different way because it wouldn't all be applied to new construction. It would have to probably be applied a bit more broadly, correct? That's correct, Councillor Henderson. And just a reminder to the policy that you just approved on financial management about the fiscal policy. And it says in there that we would look at uh, distributing costs to who benefits uh, within the community. Yep. So we've yep. got the policy framework uh, and what Ms. Butterfield was suggesting is it's just about what's the right tool. And no, 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 I get may that. Or may, may or may not. Tool. Yeah, it may it may may be a clumsy tool. I get it. I just I just I think it's a kind of big picture. I I just wanted to make sure that we weren't not you know that we were thinking about that piece as well and not assuming that these are only going to be useful to us 
in greenfield situations. Great. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, uh, again, similar, I guess, uh, what I was asking uh, the speaker about. Anyway, uh, first of all, could you tell me what would be included in the off-site levies other than fire hall and libraries? What else can be included? I'll let Ms. Butterfield speak to what tools we have um, under the MGA and what we're looking at right now. Right, so under the MGA, um, there's an ability for a city to apply levies for uh, water and uh, sewer infrastructure, roadways, um, and some of the new items that were included in the last revision to the MGA were libraries, fire halls, police stations, recreation facilities, um, and interchanges. And so we've looked at which ones are um, the best immediate fit in this first phase of the bylaw, um, understanding that we'll continue to explore opportunities in the future. Okay. So um, is this off-site le levy being deployed in any other jurisdictions that we know of? Uh, yes, they are, and uh, they're used in the city of Calgary, for example, and I'll let Ms. Butterfield uh, expand on that uh, answer as well. Sure, we do know that uh, the Calgary, has, uh, they applied many of these charges very early on. Um, I would say that a number of municipalities in the region are looking to see what the city of Edmonton uh, does before um, they would make any changes. Do you know that it's been explored at a preliminary level elsewhere, but I don't have a, a complete list of municipalities at my at my fingertips right now. Uh, no problem. And uh, so, I guess uh, uh, Alberta government gave the okay in uh, 2019. So I suppose Calgary jumped on it right away. Is that the case? I know Calgary has had, long had uh, off-site levies in, and perhaps uh, Mr. Johnson could speak to the timing of uh, what uh, the provincial government rolled out when. Thanks, Stephanie. So, yeah, provincial government gave two different rollouts of this. There was the expanded powers that happened in 2019, and then there was also city charter powers that go even beyond that. Um, Calgary uh, was already utilizing some of the expanded powers and this kind of ratified that. And now we are looking at, uh, with the methodical engagement with industry of what is available in our context up here. But 2019, um, they already had levies before then, but um, that's where they became legitimized. Okay. And uh, how it is different from BIAs and, uh, or LE improvement or whatever? Uh, Ms. Butterfield, could you speak to the, the mechanism of how an off-site levy is collected and then how the infrastructure is built as a result of that? Sure. So levies are a very specific charge outlined in the MGA. Um, I, I don't know all the nuance of how it's different from other specific charges uh, necessarily, but um, the basic intent is that the capital costs are able to be covered through a levy it's generally applied as an area charge. So you take the cost divided by um, the area of benefit and that benefit needs to be proven. And, and so those are um, the very highest level basic principles that we're looking at when we're applying levies in the city of Edmonton. Okay, so right now we're only considering the newly developing areas. Um, do you think there are people are going to be raising the question of fairness about basically what I asked the speaker, that uh, they're paying for the whole, whole city infrastructure, but they themselves are supporting their own? Yeah, Councillor Banga, that's ultimately going to be the uh, decision of council when the bylaw comes forward, whether or not you choose to approve it. We do have a lot of policy that supports um, us continuing to look at offsite levies. It's a 
uh, component of the city plan. It's also a component of the financial management strategy that recently went uh, forward to council. Uh, but ultimately, it'll be council's decision whether or not you'd like to approve that bylaw, and then we will go and implement it upon approval. Right now, what we're doing is exploring uh, what levies uh, to look at with industry, exploring what the implementation mechanism is, and making sure that we've got transparent calculation methods. Uh, so we're still early days, and we're giving uh, an update on the engagement process to date because engagement is so fundamentally important to this project. Thank you very much. My time's up. Thank you. Councillor Katerina. Thank you. Uh, so, Ms. McCabe, uh, you heard my questions to uh, the presenter uh, there. How does uh, the no business tax and uh, the M&E uh, policy, uh, uh, how does that help or hinder uh, this, uh, this policy or bylaw going forward? What, what, are the, what are some maybe the challenges that uh, might be there or not? Uh, well, right now we're, we're just looking at um, uh, residential and in new greenfield areas. So I think, you know, we do have a, we have some competitive advantages on the industrial side in terms of access to transit, in terms of the types of industrial areas. Uh, also, we've been working really uh, diligently on our client liaison unit and making sure that industry who is investing here, that they've got uh, certainty with their timelines, because I hear that's really important. And so I think we've got some other competitive advantages uh, in addition to what you're pointing out, the no M&E as, as an example of our tax, uh, uh, of our taxes. So with that, I mean, the strategy goes back uh, a number of years ago, and that was primarily linked to uh, um, the Horse Hill area, the industrial side of things, uh, 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 and given that uh, um, taxes on uh, industrial property is three times the mill rate sort of thing. That, that's why the, the shifting of the business tax and that. But it doesn't seem like it's uh, um, taking on any momentum. I, I mean, given the time, certainly that's understandable. But the last number of years, we haven't seen that influx of uh, uh, industrial commercial that pay higher taxes uh, that we were looking for uh, desperately uh, uh, to improve because we can't continue to uh, operate based on residential tax uh, assessment properties unless we up that uh, uh, industrial side of things. And it doesn't seem like we've shifted very much and uh, whether this is going to help or hinder with the offside levies uh, uh, residentially where you might not pay it in Sherwood Park, for example, and, and what the strategy is to make sure that 13 of the region, 13 members of the regional board and that all agree to, to the same ideas. So we have been talking at the regional table and perhaps um, Adam could add some more to this about offsite levies and potentially looking at them regionally. Very, very, very early days on that. Uh, but the region is looking to see what the city of Edmonton does. Uh, and uh, they're very interested in understanding what we implement. Um, you're correct. We need to look across the region to make sure that we're still competitive uh, as part of the industrial investment uh, action plan work that was done, you know, maintaining our ratio uh, is is challenging uh, and so making sure that we are competitive in terms of our timelines uh, in terms of our fees and in terms of the way that we deliver our service is really critically important so with that Ms. McCabe uh, when when the bylaw comes forward uh, obviously in that all these things will be considered obviously in what what the bylaw should look like or what the charges should be what the actual levies themselves should be in order to maintain that uh, um, um, uh, being competitive with uh, with the region at that point, so I, I just assurance that we're, we'll look at some of the advantages that we have now uh, to include in the package uh, for the offside levies and to justify what we're doing versus what others are doing. Yeah, Councillor Katarina, we will consider that as we bring the but the bylaw forward and uh, put that in the report in terms of some of the trade offs associated with implementing the the bylaw. Uh, but ultimately, uh, to recognize and realize the vision um, as outlined in the city plan, offsite levies will be part of the toolkit that we will be looking at. So we will make sure to continue uh, to articulate the trade-offs associated with it, as well as the value proposition. Okay, and going back to the regional part of this, is there uh, uh, a mechanism uh, or, well, sort of not a forced agreement, but a a mutual agreement with the region that cannot be reversed 
as elections come and go and mayors and councillors come and go, uh, that once it's set, uh, that we have some sort of agreement that we know uh, cannot be changed for a, a certain amount of time anyway. Well, that's a challenging one, Councillor Katerina. Um, you know, I think uh, ultimately the elected officials are the decision makers here. And if the decision makers within the region want to make different decisions, then, uh, you know, we'll continue to work at the regional table because we believe in the importance of that um, and the importance of us to be able to work together to be able to attract people to the Edmonton metro area. Uh, but ultimately, it's up to the the, the politicians of the decision make, as the decision makers. So um, I think we can put some work at the regional table about MOUs if we were to go down that pathway, uh, uh, as well as look at what other tools there are. But ultimately, city councils are the decision makers. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ms. McCabe. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to circle back to the conversation we were having earlier today about crosswalks. And it seems to me that the arterial road assessment, which is essentially an off-site levy, uh, was uh, crafted and created in response to an ongoing backlog of arterial road twinning, arterial road construction that the city simply could not keep up with. It could not keep up with the pace of development and keep up with its obligations uh, to supplement what developers were doing by building the, the, you know, the second half of that road or, you know, going back a number of years, the whole road. Has, the, has uh, some sort of levy for crosswalks been discussed uh, or has there been a conversation uh, around expanding the ARA uh, levy to include crosswalks? Is that a possibility or should it be a design and standard conversation? Uh, Ms. Tui, perhaps you could answer that question. I'm going to ask if Jamie knows further. I, I know we hadn't included crosswalks uh, at the time, and ARAs were developed in conjunction with industry. It was a kind of an industry-led, and we worked with them and worked together with gradually being looking at what the needs are and adding them in. But perhaps Jamie could uh, weigh in there. Sure. So, Councillor, there's the, there's the ability to add the ancillary infrastructure into the ARAs, um, as, as Rhonda mentions, though, we, you'd want to have that conversation with industry and make sure that we have buy-in on that. The other aspect you mentioned there actually is probably worth pursuing as well, and that is where are we at with the design and construction standards? We do a lot of uh, development of roads and construction of roads is done by industry at the time of subdivision. That includes the local ones as well. And so you have the opportunity to look at those design standards and say, what is our traffic safety mechanisms in relation to these? And that that is a clear opportunity there. As far as the authority goes, yes, the, the city charter gives us very raw authority on what we can do an offsite levy for. It's just whether it's palatable in the current economic climate and where we're at here. Yeah, and, and so very good point. It speaks to a conversation with our development partners. I guess the question then is, you know, is there a subsequent motion in order here uh, to ask for that conversation to be had? Do you do you need uh, that motion or is it better in the standards? Looking for some guidance here, but just from the perspective that the only way we ever get rid of the backlog is if we stop adding to the backlog. And I, it seems to me that, you know, crosswalks are a very, very small part of the overall roadway infra infrastructure that, that is already within the ARA uh, parameters. So thoughts, Ms. McKee? Yeah, Councillor uh, Carmel, if you'd like us to look at that, perhaps a motion would be in order, but I would widen the motion to look at what the mechanisms are for funding um, in for additional crosswalks in new neighbourhoods, because I'm assuming you're are you asking about just new neighbourhoods here, not retrofit? Yes, just, just going forward, not looking back, yeah. That's my view. Yeah. Uh, if you could give us a few minutes to take a look at that. Sure. That's not that that on the committee, so. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon me? I'm not on committee, so I, I can merely suggest and not move. At this Fair point. enough, yes. I'll just offer that up. Thank you, Ms. McCabe. Thanks, everyone. So I am not sure we were going. I was going to go to Councillor Henderson to move to receive this information, but I'm not sure if you want to. I'll ask some questions about that while we're standing up. Okay, Councillor Henderson. Well, maybe just to ask some questions about that, because it was, you know, from the conversation this morning, um, it was my understanding that that was the kind of lens we were going to be putting on new neighborhood design anyway. Um, that, that uh, so 
which would mean that it would be built, you know, because I would have assumed things like crosswalks and, and those pieces of the puzzle would be part of part of what was being approved by us as acceptable or not acceptable to begin with and part of what would go into the cost of, uh, paid for by the ARA or by the developers themselves. So I, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand this motion. Um, given given what we given what we heard from the traffic safety this morning was that that lens was going to be put on new design anyway. So uh, am, am I missing something here? Yeah, no, Councillor Henderson, I think you're making a good point, and uh, you're right. In new neighborhoods, the developer pays for the transportation related infrastructure, and perhaps I'd let Ms. Petron add and, to that. Yeah, and they pay, that, and they have to build it to our standards. They don't get to make the right. standards up themselves, and and our standards, I think, based on our traffic safety stuff this morning are going to be different in the future than they were in the past. And Mr. Seabrick's here as well. He, he's looking like he wants to weigh in on this. <laughs> uh, Councillor, definitely um, just to, to expand on what Ms. McCabe said is that we do uh, include uh, different traffic amenities as part of the neighborhood uh, design and, and safety. I think to Ms. Uh, Lamar's point was we were trying to, um, I think, engage the development industry a bit more in terms of looking at it from a proactive perspective, but they're already contained within what we, uh, what we do review and approve. And, and that, so this has more to do with our standards than whether, you know, they have to build what our standards say they have to build when it comes to this, do they not? That's correct, and our design and construction standards were updated last year to reflect uh, to fully co reflect the complete streets approach to the design. And and we'll have the traffic safety lens on it that was part of the report that that we green green lit this morning. Correct. We'll continue. Yes, we'll and we'll continue to look for ways to embed that lens into our decision making. So I so I'm, I I I don't know I. I um, I'd have to hear from Councillor Cartmel if I'm missing something here, but I, I just assume from what we were told this morning that in terms of new neighborhoods, this should now be happening anyway, and if it's not happening anyway, then, I'm, we, then I misunderstood the answer we got this morning. No, it is, and I, sorry, that was to Councillor Cartmel, not to me. Go ahead, Councillor Cartmel. No, 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 I, I can't ask him a question if he wants to click back on, uh, but no, <laughs> uh, 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 Mr. Seabrick also tried to answer, so. Go ahead, Mr. Seabrick. Thanks. So uh, I think you're right, Councillor. We are trying to, the intent of this morning's conversation was basically in line with what you're saying. Okay. So. Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll wait to hear from Councillor Cartmel if he wants to come back on, but I'm, I'm guessing, I'm hoping I will be deeply disappointed if the motion that he's working on isn't redundant. So, and I think, I'm, 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 I'm guessing he's hoping that as well, but uh, we'll see if he has any thoughts on it. Well, we'll wait for a few moments. Right now we have Councillor Banga, then Cartmel. Councillor Banga. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, my questions are probably similar to uh, Councillor Henderson's questions. Uh, this morning, when we heard from the speakers, it was all about all existing um, places where people are exper experiencing those issues. Uh, for the new ones, I believed again that. Uh, all those uh, issues are going to be considered, at least uh, factored in. Uh, for f With this motion, uh, if we can't do anything for the existing one, then what's the sense having it? Then we are just uh, repeating what we discussed this morning. Yeah, Councillor Banga, uh, if I have the opportunity to answer that, I think there's a question there. Uh, I was going to say that a motion isn't needed. So if I could clarify my previous um, answer to my question, what happens in new neighborhoods is the latest design and construction standards are used uh, uh, for design of the roadways and they're added to subdivision. And, um, and we continue to, and we work with the developer on that. And so we will make sure to continue to look at that as we, as we look at new neighborhoods that come in. And it's more about the retrofit of existing neighborhoods. Okay. And uh, for the new uh, neighborhoods, uh, um, they are already paying for the road, for the, for some of the infrastructure there. And uh, this is uh, nothing new, I suppose. Um, but if we could also add uh, 
for example, sidewalks in there too? Most of our design and construction standards require sidewalks on both sides. Uh, and I know in some industrial areas, it's sidewalks on one side. So yeah. that's already I, included. I should say crosswalks. I'm sorry. Ah, crosswalks. So uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Petron could speak to uh, where we require crosswalks or Ms. Sizer if she's on the call. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so when we're working through uh, design with uh, developers in new neighborhoods, we do discuss where crosswalks may be needed on arterial roads and then uh, as well as pedestrian signals as well can be included. And then that is uh, dealt with through the arterial roadway assessment bylaw in terms of the cost. So in that case, uh, do you think what we perceive from the initial I guess evaluation could actually change when all the development around that area uh, kind of completes. I think that's the the difference between a developing community and a new uh, an existing community where there's maybe some retrofit needed. Um, so there's always the opportunity to go back and look at um, how the safety of our roadway can be improved. Okay, thanks. That's all my questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. Uh, so just in the uh, chats alongside, I, I'm understanding that a motion is not needed and then we can have some further conversation with our development industry. I'm, I appreciate your comments, Councillor Henderson. It's, uh, uh, and maybe it's just my bad memory of, of calendars, but it just seems that very new neighbourhoods don't have crosswalks. We hear from somebody this morning who's, who's in a house that's three years old and the crosswalk isn't there. So I'm you know, if it's in the design standards and they should be built with the subdivision, then why aren't they there? And so maybe it's it's simply a matter of reinforcing that need uh, on approval of subdivision or those kinds of things. But I'm happy to leave it at that. Thank you. Um, well, Councillor Henderson. With that being said, I'm I'm prepared to move, which is just to receive this for information. I think is it not? Yep. So uh, and uh, and. Um, you know, I think, I, and, and just to say, I think this, the, the big picture, this is important work that's really about our financial sustainability going forward. But I think, you know, I think Councillor Cartmell's point is well taken, you know, that if, that we also need to, to make sure that we're building neighbourhoods that we don't have to be retrofitting 10 years from now. Um, and that really has more to do with our current, with, you know, making sure that our design standards and our expectations for safety are part of our thinking going forward. But that's part of the existing ARA. That's more about our processes um, of what we're doing with the money we're already connecting through levies. Um, and uh, this is, uh, this, this hopefully will give us some tools, um, which I think are as much in the new neighborhood's interest as any. I mean, fire stations are such an interesting one in that you know, the, the, the cost of insurance, the cost of building, the kind of building that you can put up is very different if you have a fire station than if you don't. So arguably there's, there's, there is real interest and, and, and if, you, if you know you can be, that a, that a neighborhood's going to have a library or gonna have a rec center, it makes it that much easier um, to, to, to make these neighborhoods that people are gonna wanna choose to move into. Um, and, and I'm really looking forward as well, longer term to understanding how that applies the neighborhoods where we're trying to encourage redevelopment and infill in the future and how we can make how we can facilitate their amenities as well to make them equally attractive so that being said i really looking forward to the next stage of this work thank you very much uh with that i will call the vote please vote We have four votes, Madam Chair. Thank you, we'll display the vote. And that is carried. Thank you very much. So now that we've finished our time specific at 1.30, we'll go back to start <laughs> with 6.2. And uh, Councillor Banker, you had selected that. It's information report, do you have questions? Or did you need more information? Councillor Banga? I, yeah, I do need uh, more information, please, if there is a presentation. Is there opening remarks or presentation? Or? Uh, Councillor, um, Madam Chairperson, we 
uh, don't have a presentation. We are just providing uh, a summary of the uh, results of the pilot and uh, acknowledge that uh, this was the initial use of this technology in Edmonton um, in, to this, this level. Uh, but we do realize that it's a starting point and we think that uh, this is the way that um, the industry is going. So we do uh, see that this is a part of our future with our traffic signals. Okay. Okay, then um, my couple questions uh, in regards to that are, when I was reading the report, I I was, uh, I think I should uh, first click on it. Or, uh, I was reading the report, I was uh, kind of confused. Is the administration in support of these measures or are we're not sure yet? It's uh, like, what's the conclusion of uh, the pilot project? I think, Councillor, the conclusion is that uh, we know that it has potential, but certainly for us to, uh, to really understand um, its potential longer term, we need to work with it more. Uh, this is some of the feedback we got from other cities that we talked to that are uh, piloting the technology as well. It does have, uh, you know, advantages, um, you know, in terms of automation and um, more real-time adjustment. However, we need to understand it more and see how it would work because right now, um, you know, we've only used it for a brief period of time and certainly haven't understood how it could work on a system-wide basis as well as uh, how we would fine-tune it so that we are getting benefit because I think that's the intent is that we do provide better accessibility for both uh, vulnerable road users being pedestrians as well as um, uh, the uh, traveling uh, vehicle travel. So uh, if, if it came across um, as, as um, not fully uh, understanding the technology, it is because we do, do believe we did need to work with it more to really uh, get the full benefit and understanding of how it would fit within our system. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Seabrook, uh, when you're saying it does have uh, advantages, what do you base that statement on? So the, the potential of the technology is, is so that it is more real-time adjustment and more responsive to changing demands. Um, certainly uh, more, more easily uh, or more quickly than uh, a human can, can action. So I think that's where this is, has got potential. It's just understanding how you would really optimize it and work with what we have and integrate it. You know, because there are locations where uh, traffic patterns uh, can be very predictable. So the technology we have already uh, does a good job at that. It's where you have changing conditions and, and you want to provide the best real-time uh, service levels. Okay, and uh, then again, uh, uh, I guess the original intent was to reduce energy consumption uh, by dimming lights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, do we have any idea about that portion of the of the equation? So, uh, I'll, I'll just put some clarification. I was I was speaking more to the traffic signal piece. I think you're. Are you referencing the uh, smart street lighting component? That's correct. So the smart street lighting component certainly uh, has opportunity for energy savings. We are already experiencing uh, energy savings and power uh, reductions through the use of LED technology. What this uh, new technologies uh, out there allow us to do is to do things like light dimming and motion sensing. We have started that. We have actually been operating uh, some motion sensing uh, circuits for about five years now and we are seeing that there is potential for both power uh, consumption as well as uh, light reductions uh, and, and this helps in areas where we're trying to uh, align with more of the dark skies and minimizing light pollution. Okay, so uh, in regards to this, what are our next steps? 
So the report was for information. Our uh, intent would be to continue uh, with the programs we have in place, um, the continuous in innovation that we're incorporating into our street lights. I'll just have Mr. Uh, Simpson or potentially uh, Ms. Massini on the line to speak to a little bit about what the plan is with the smart street lights. Um, sure, I can I can jump in. It's uh, Olga Massini. Uh, so with the with the smart street lights, um, some of the ongoing work that um, that we are focusing on right now um, is is around um, the energy reductions and the LED LED um, street light conversion project. So that work is carrying on throughout this budget cycle. Um, the next connection um, around around that is in relation to the smart transportation action plan. And um, with smart with street lights in general, we have some opportunities for adaptations to um, to increase pole attachments that um, that can give us feedback and um, and tell us a, a greater story of um, of what's happening on our streets in terms of um, lighting conditions, um, you know, weather related um, issues. But um, all of that tying back into um, actions within the Smart Transportation Action Plan and um, future city plan alignment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll uh, move the recommendation when the time comes. Thank you. That'll be for information. But first, we have Councillor Henderson. Yeah, just really quickly, since we've had it selected, I'm curious to know, do we have any theories why we didn't see benefits from it? Is there a limitation in the programming, or is it because it's... Or is it in part because it throws the it doesn't fit well with the rest of the system and throws everything out of sync? So perhaps I'll have uh, Miss Massini uh, just provide some detail in terms of the specifics of the pilot. So you know we when we chose this um, this particular corridor we we chose it because it had a high variability in in terms of traffic patterns. Now um, I, I think. Um, if we had a greater opportunity to expand on the, the testing periods, so we really only tested between October and January, and we, we tested the, kind of the peak event period around Rogers Plate. Um, I, I believe that some of those, um, those issues that we experienced around the transition, around the, the signal timing and coordination, um, we could potentially have worked with the vendor um, closely to understand limitations in the system um, because it is still rel relatively new and in, um, in, in a testing, testing phase. Um, it's that transition period that actually increased travel time. Um, so the transition from identifying a new pattern and implementing a new, a new timing was, um, was one of our biggest issues. So, so it's not that this will never give us benefit, but it's just either we haven't played with it enough yet or it's not quite sophisticated enough to give us the benefits, which is why you want to keep on going with it. Yeah? Is that yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we're, we're, we're continuing to use a lot of that, that equipment today. So, um, you know, even with, um, with traffic volumes in the downtown dropping with, um, with the pandemic, we're still using a lot of that equipment to continue to measure. So it, it really hasn't all, all gone to, uh, yeah, to no, waste. I'm, I'm, I'm just surprised there weren't advantages, but, but it may be that, you know, that computers aren't quite as smart yet as we think they are. So great, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you very much. And, and maybe I, I do, and I guess that's the, the challenge that we ran into, like you said, is that we got we got to do it for three months. And I think we were originally hoping to do it longer, but there were some hiccups uh, at, the, at the beginning of the process. So uh, what I'm maybe not clear on based on the answers is that are we looking to try this on other corridors? Because, you know, I, I know there's been the conversation with other cities Um you know, from what I have understood, the latest in Pittsburgh, where this is where, where I originally read up on it, they actually expanded it to another 200 intersections, or at least started that work in uh, 2019, because they were seeing such an improvement. Uh, and so they I think they were focusing on sort of five core spines in their city to do that. So are we looking to identify corridors where we can maybe try this again and and maybe less in the downtown core and more on spots like you know i, I don't want to speak for councillor carmel but i mean like you know twilliger expressway you know if we're going to be doing something and have lights or or any of those major more focused vehicle corridors so broadly i would say i would say yes we would, we would be looking at um at, at implementing or integrating um you know 
more much more current systems. You know, quite quite similarly to um, a lot of our current systems today. So, you know, in part, um, what what you experienced, um, Councillor Nack, was um, we were upgrading our central um, our central um, controllers. So that's our central traffic management system to be able to um, to align and adapt, and and we'll be able to integrate a lot more of these systems in, into the future. Um, that said, with um, with a lot of the um, new capital work, we are on an ongoing basis integrating, um, you know, the most current technologies. That said, I think with um, with emerging technologies um, such as this, and and I and I recognize Pittsburgh is um, is a great example. Um, a lot of, um, from what I understand, the um, um, the signalization equipment that that they're testing is in partnership with their um, with their universities, and so we we do something really quite similar with um, you know coordinating with um, partnerships through the Center of, for Smart Transportation, um, and then of course um, some of the dynamic traffic management um, strategies that um, have been outlined in, in City Plan. So that there definitely is a is a future. Um, we do own this, um, the I guess the, the hardware uh, for this this particular system, and so do think that as we have some um, further discussions, we can align and um, and look at um, testing these systems elsewhere. Of course, um, the the licensing, the software licensing component, is the proprietary component, which um, which we would need to work with a vendor. Okay. Have we talked, and, and, and my own fault, because I actually haven't also contacted the city of Pittsburgh. Have we contacted the city of Pittsburgh? Because I, it, it just seems to be such a glowing example of, of what can go right. And, and and so likewise to Councillor Henderson's point, I was a little surprised to see such uh, different results and, and recognizing we were testing it in a bit of a unique environment with the Rogers Place traffic as well. Um, so I just don't know what, what's, What's so different between one city versus another? And I'm not picking on them, but just since they're, I think, the most uh, active in this area. So while we did a jurisdictional scan to understand how um, how adaptive traffic um, technologies work and, and who is who is working with these technologies, we didn't directly contact um, the city of Pittsburgh, but rather relied on the available literature that um, um, that's just been available for us to review and integrate to see how we can adapt these systems. Uh, I'm wondering, and I, I'm going to take it on myself to also reach out to them, but I'm wondering if that's an opportunity because I, I just, uh, you know, I my, my biggest worry is that we're just going to say, well, there's li literally nothing we can do. We'll throw up our hands in the air and say there's nothing we can do to improve traffic flow. It's just going to continuously, and, and yes, as our population grows, it's obviously going to get worse. Congestion will get worse. We can't build our way out of congestion, but I'd like to see if we can try to minimize how quickly it increases by by using some of these other tools that um, that may or may not be effective in other areas. So, so Councillor, uh, I think one of the things that this pilot did was it was um, it was an opportunity uh, for us to you know initially get our our uh, our feet wet in in this sort of new new realm of technology for traffic signals. So it's it's a starting point. Uh, I think it it aligns well with where we're going as an organization as we talk about reimagine and creating a culture of innovation. So I think for us, you know, we've we've got kind of a base level of understanding now and we can use that to grow on. So it's not, um, you know, not that we didn't learn from the pilot. I think we learned what we don't know uh, and we don't know a lot about it. So we know that there's a lot of potential and, and to your point, Pittsburgh has obviously figured it out. So, uh, as we work with it more, I think there's really good potential. And I think part of the work we can do now is looking at, you know, how we use what we've, we've got on hand to, uh, look at other corridors that would give us more insight into how to use it on a longer term basis. Okay. I'm out of time. I'll have one more question. Well, you are the last question, so please ask your second question. Oh. <laughs> sure. Well, I, I, I just wanted to add, so, so because I don't want to lose sight of this, this is something that, because I think we're getting annual reporting on the Smart Transportation Action Plan. Is that correct? Councillor, I, yeah. I believe that's correct. Um, whether it's in the form of memo or a council report, I would need to double check that. That's either way is fine. I thought there was some type of annual check-in, and and so the reason I ask is just making sure that 
I, I hope we would then also go explore some of these other corridors and be able to report back on this as we as we do all of that work. This is just one piece of this entire puzzle, but it's it's one that I and maybe I'm got blind hope that this will somehow help everything. But I feel like it's it's working other it's at least working in one other spot, and I, I'd like to make sure we haven't given up on it. So and just know that I have a way to check in without doing a separate motion on anything like this. So, Council, can, I, can, can I just jump in real? Can I just jump in real quick? I just need to add a, um, a bit of a correction. We did connect in with uh, the city of Pittsburgh. Um, it was actually on, um, on on a previous report, but not for this this exact report. But it also was on um, an adaptive technology item. Mm. Okay. Was there another comment? Somebody, there were a couple of people that were responding when I... Sorry, Councillor, uh, it's Gord Sebrick. We can commit to, uh, as part of the uh, regular update on the Smart uh, Transportation Action Plan, we can commit to uh, moving forward with um, any updates as we examine other corridor locations and potential learnings for um, this, this technology. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you, and I think Councillor Bank indicated he was going to move to receive this for information. Any other comments, Councillor Bank, or is that good? No, it's all good. Thank you, and uh, I move the recommendation. Thank you. All those in favor, I guess, please vote. And display the vote. And that is carried. Now, Madam Clerk, uh, before we go to the next item, we do have some speakers on 6.5 and 6.6. Are they still with us? or? I believe that we would need a moment to get them on the line. There was one speaker that we had committed to uh, calling um, and another that I know checked in this morning, but I don't see on the line now. So shall we just go ahead with the next item then? Yes, if you want to proceed in, in the order of the okay. agenda, I can have our team reach out to the speakers. Okay, I just didn't want to keep holding them up. So we are at 6-3, and uh, I think Councillor Henderson selected this. Oh. Did you want the presentation? I, I don't need it. I just have questions, um, but I don't know if others want the presentation. I don't need it. I see shaking head, so no. Okay, then I can go direct go to my questions. So um, thanks for this. I w was good to see this piece of work. I did have some questions, though, that were not clear to me. I guess the first question is, and I, this didn't even cross my mind until I got to the what we heard part of it and saw some of the concerns, is what kind of, how are we going to use this and what kind of teeth is going to have to make sure that in actual fact, um, you know, we, we don't just, do a whole bunch of studies that then get ignored because we don't have the ability to enforce them. Well, uh, Councillor Henderson, I think that's the benefit of looking at through the zoning bylaw renewal because then that gets embedded into our development processes. But I could let uh, someone from the team speak more, uh, uh, provide some more detail to that. Perhaps Christian Lee or Kim Petron. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Henderson. Um, as, as you're aware, we had to, um, in terms of the teeth, uh, this is kind of laying the foundations for us to be able to potentially add additional quote-unquote enforcement measures down the road. Uh, right now, um, at the time you, you had made that initial motion for us to do this work, um, there was no um, consistent set of criteria that these, these wind studies were even being evaluated against. And so now uh, we have a set of, of, of criteria that allow for us to um, evaluate them in a consistent manner and set us up for um, being able to get the, the desired outcomes that we want to have um, in the future. Um, you know, as uh, Stephanie had mentioned, um, you know, potential for this to be part of the zoning bylaw, we do plan on bringing back um, amendments to the zoning bylaw to ensure that um, they are, they become actually in effect, especially at the development permit stage, because right now uh, the only way we get wind studies um, clearly outlined in terms of, of the information we request and what to do with them is through the direct control provision process. And so we don't have any provisions really for our standard zones either. Um, 
Yeah. So that's kind of the idea that yeah. we're, we're trying to go through. Good. Okay. Well, I mean, as long as we're going down that road, and I, I didn't really worry about this until I saw some of the comments that came back, you know, and, and, I, and that worried me a little bit because there's no point in doing this, asking for the studies, if we're not going to have an ability to say no, at, uh, either at the DO stage or, at the, or, or, you know, if we're doing direct control zones to say, you know, this, this isn't good enough. Um, and you have to improve it. So uh, as long as we're going to get ourselves those teeth at some point, because we've made reference to wind studies in the past that you have to do one, but I'm not sure we've ever said once you've done it, what you have to do about it. And I and that's going to be just as important. That's absolutely right. And that's the gap we're going to be trying to fill here, right. um, especially for our standard zones. Perfect. Um, the other thing that I wasn't sure quite got captured in the report um, was the seasonal conditions. Because clearly, you know, and this is one of, the, you know, this came out of the winter city work. Um, and one of the things we said loudly and clearly from that is if you can minimize wind, you can make spaces, particularly outdoor public spaces, quite pleasant in the winter um, that are, that become, even with small, small amounts of wind, become um, uh, can much colder. I mean, it really changes the temperature. Um, and I'm, so I'm wondering, in terms of our measurement, there was no real reference to that seasonality piece when we came up with, the, with what's, what's, you know, those, those five different stages of what's good and not. It really didn't speak to temperature, outdoor temperature, because, I mean, there's cities where, where arguably you'd want a breeze in order to make it comfortable. We're not one of them. Um, right. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how that will get factored in. That's a really good question, and uh, you know Edmonton's identity as a winter city did play a factor here. Uh, we we went uh, we requested um, some some evaluation of of uh, two different sets of criteria, one for winter and the other one for non-winter. Um, and for winter, um, there within the technical document um, that that was attachment, uh, I believe attachment two, yeah. um, outlines two sets of criteria, one for winter and one for non-winter. And in winter, the tolerance for um, uh, wind speeds for sitting, standing, walking are, are different than what they would be in the summer. And part of the terms of reference and, and what we would require in those uh, wind study reports would be to differentiate be between the two so that um, the report would identify these these areas within the site are appropriate for those types of activities, i.e. sitting, standing, walking, having a coffee, et cetera. Um, the other question, I'm gonna run out of time, so I'll need a second round, but, but I, maybe I'll start with this one. One of the things I think that we've done in the past, we've always looked at buildings in isolation and we haven't looked at the cumulative effect um, and that, you know, and clearly, um, clearly that cumulative impact is part of what we need to be able to understand as we do these wind studies. So. Um, is that part of the work that we will do in the future, that it's not just what happens in one building, but what that building will do um, in its larger context, or the way in which the larger context may actually change the way a building itself functions and operates? That's, that's an excellent question, Councillor Henderson. Um, we currently don't, to my knowledge, have a comprehensive 3D model of our entire city. Um, we have had requests over the years to have this information developed, but it, it, it's resource intensive and takes a lot of time. Um, and the appetite for it hasn't been strong enough to be able to get it done. But my understanding in a, on a high level is that we are in the process of finally being able to do that um, do that work. And yes, we do intend for this in, this information that we get out of the terms of reference as these taller buildings that impact wind conditions get developed um, to be evaluated and see the before and after effects, not just on a, lo on a local micro level, but on a more macro level as well. Okay, I'm out of time. I would keep on going, but there I, may I be others that have questions. No one else having questions, so if you would like will, to go to your second round, I, please I will, go okay. ahead. Okay, um, so I'm, uh, I guess uh, based on that too, um, I was a little bit concerned that we were looking at base conditions as a kind of starting place to measure against. Because if a base condition is negative to begin with, is already problematic. Um, I'm just a little bit worried that, you know, that, that um, again, it has to do with that cumulative piece. You know, I'm thinking, you know, and we're, it's, you know, it's interesting. I mean, the, the story I always tell is the piece that is now called Euler's Way that is connecting City Hall through to the, to the, to, you know, which was, is not just, you know, it's an imperfect, it is, it is a perfect but not pleasant microclimate where the wind actually direct, changes directions halfway along. 
I flagged that for the Oilers and said, if you want to make this Oilers way, you're going to have to do something to fix this. And nobody, they said yes, yes, and then I think did nothing. In actual fact, I think we've made it worse, not better. And now we're going back in and doing a retrofit to try and put stuff down at ground level to deal with that wind piece. So, um, you know, I, I, that's why my concern about base level, you know, we, we might have been able to do some things with, with the new buildings we've added in, including our own tower, that could have helped rather than make it worse. And I'm wondering how we're going to look at that piece of the puzzle. That's certainly. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead and start, Paul. Uh, sure. That's that's certainly um, a, a valid concern. And as a starting as a starting point, I think the threshold we should be aiming for is not to make it worse. Um, through our engagement over over the summer with uh, with industry. Um, and again, with all the other slew of factors that played into the development of this, um, this again sets the foundations for us to be able to, first of all, consistently evaluate, but in the future also sets us up to be able to, again, add additional measures to be able to perhaps, again, have taller buildings um, reduce rather than just have the benchmark be the status quo, but reduce the impact of those wind conditions on the public realm. Yeah, because I would, I would just say, and Ms. McCabe, I think you wanted to weigh in on that, but, but uh, I would just say quickly um, that it would have been in their interests, quite frankly, to have reduced, and, and we lost that opportunity. Um, and it would have made their space, which they were trying to promote, that much more pleasant. But Ms. McCabe, did you have something you wanted to add? That's exactly what I was going to add, is that in an individual development, sometimes it's to the benefit of the developer to improve the space for a, whatever, a mixed-use development and what's at the ground floor. Uh, and those are the types of things that we negotiate uh, when a developer comes in with the tower, and uh, we, look at the, we look at that one by one with, with the developer. Well, thanks for that. That's all my questions. You know, I'm prepared to, to, to move for seat of this and just speak to it really briefly. It's just, this is just to receive for information at this point, is it not? Yes, it is. Yeah, so I'm prepared to move that if nobody so, else wants to weigh in. Uh, I see none on the board, so uh, go ahead and uh, speak yeah, to it. Yeah, thank, thanks for this work. I, 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 uh, and I'm assured, reassured by the idea that this is just the kind of first stage to give us um, some really good benchmarking to do the work next. I think what we do with it is going to be really critical. Um, so I look forward to seeing where that goes next. And the, the point is well taken that we need to build it in, if, especially if we're going to move away from direct control zoning, which I think is part of our desire. We need to make sure that these are, that these are tools that the DO has, even with standard zoning. I, I would also really, really encourage, uh, you know, I think maybe not the whole city 3D modeling, but I think there are definitely contacts like downtown, like some other areas, you probably some of the areas. Um, uh, well, there's other areas that are now developing with 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 more of these kind of microclimatic effects. We should be able to tell where those are beginning to happen, and and I think in those circumstances, I think this becomes a pointless exercise unless we have the 3D modeling. So I would really encourage us to look at building that for areas where we do have cumulative impact, because uh, otherwise, I think we're going to miss things. We're going to ask for buildings to do, to do one thing that will make no difference because they have not taken into consideration um, the cumulative impacts of what's happening around them. And, and it will be a great effort that will go no. So I think we have to do that. I know it's complicated, but uh, it's way easier to do now You know, with, with, with some of the tools that you're talking about than it probably would have been even five years ago in terms of the technologies that are available to us. But if we're going to keep on building the kind of areas we want to build and make them people friendly for our climate, um, we have to have the tools to do that. And that means the 3D modeling, and that means then having also the tools to make sure that, that, um, that we can enforce the choices that actually can make sure we end up with good, good pedestrian space. So thank you for this. I look forward to see what happens next. Thank you. I see no further speakers, so I will call the vote. Please vote. And display the vote. And that is carried. We're now at 6.4, um, and Councillor Banga selected that. So I'll go. There is no um, presentation. Is there opening remarks? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just joining with me today are um, some folks I'd like to introduce um, Unjum Mullock and Ryan Stromberg, who are representing our engineering services group. And then Bradley Lehman and Pascal Letisur, who are representing our asset management lifecycle management group. And we're just here to take questions. 
Perfect. I'll go to Councillor Banga first as he selected it. Councillor Banga. Thank you. Just a few questions. Uh, uh, it is, uh, I know uh, the specific, uh, specifications uh, for the construction are either being done by the city or, uh, or by the developer. Could you be able to tell me those standards are uniform, whether the city does it or the developer does it? They are the exact same standards. Um, the same standards when it's the same products and same materials. In some cases, there may be uh, unique or specific products or materials that the city might use outside of our traditional um, forms of uh, material specifications. And in those cases, where they don't conform to our standard list of materials, we will develop our own unique ones. But when we're using the same products and the same materials, we use the same standards. So in that case, who does the testing to maintain integrity of the system? Uh, for developer contributed assets, uh, the quality assurance is provided um, through the developer. Um, as part of their obligations through their servicing agreements and for capital funded city funded uh, construction projects it's done uh, primarily through our engineering ser services lab uh, materials testing lab located in the West End so after two years uh, developer has no responsibility in any of the infrastructure it falls back to the city uh, I'm just a little bit confused that some area areas are, uh, you know, for some reason they're more prone to, uh, I don't know, develop uh, potholes or, uh, or damage somehow. And uh, how, how can we make sure that, that uh, is, there is something that city should be doing to make sure that uh, we are not leaving it to the third party to just decide, yeah, it's good enough. So it, as, as part of the process um, to contribute assets, and I perhaps maybe there's somebody from Ms. McCabe's area that could um, also add to this, but the developer is responsible for providing independent third party verified results. Um, the quality assurance is provided by a third party and then submit it to the city for review and verification, at which point we um, inspect the work, go through the quality assurance material, and then um, there's a kind of a two-stage process uh, construction completion certificate uh, when the work is complete, which then um, the warranty period starts for, depending on the, the type of asset, it can be one or two years, and then um, a final acceptance certificate is also then issued by the city again doing an, a site inspection as well as a review of any of the corresponding uh, quality assurance documents to support that work. Okay, and uh, my next question is about uh, uh, the road surfacing. It's, uh, for some reason, it seems like Edmonton, uh, I mean, it's not for some reason, I mean, our freeze and thaw cycles, they have been changing um, over time. Is... Uh, have we noticed more than usual number of potholes that we repaired in the last few years rather than number being same, kind of consistent? Councillor Banga, it's uh, Gord Sebrick. Uh, we do uh, notice fluctuations. Uh, we do see that it, it, the number of uh, potholes we experience every year uh, does fluctuate based on uh, the uh, severity and timing of the winter. But we also know that we've uh, been making headway in the investments that Council's approved with respect to rehabilitation and renewal. So, you know, the work that's been done in the neighbourhoods as well as the arterial road uh, rehabilitation program has uh, allowed us to... Um, not have to be on those roads fixing potholes as much. So there are a couple of factors, but certainly the investments in rehabilitation are having an impact. Okay, so uh, in uh, in freezing and thaw cycles, uh, there would be another jurisdictions that are pretty similar to us. 
have we consulted them? It seems like we have more uh, potholes or uh, road repairs needed. Um, are we talking to them? Uh, there are a number of contributing environmental factors that uh, influence the, as the report outlines, that the 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 prop propagation of, of potholes and. Um, You've mentioned one of them. One of them is free thaw cycles. Um, that's kind of a, at the immediate surface. There's underlying some um, conditions as well in terms of the geotechnical substructure um, and what that material is made out of. So it's, you know, I'd, I'd say there's a lot of lessons learned to be gained by what other municipalities are doing, and that's part of the process. It's part of the second part of the motion that we've out identified is that we would go out and engage with some of our, um, you know, benchmark some of the work that we have around what other municipalities are doing. That's part of the work that we would set out to do um, because there are similarities, but I wouldn't say that they're, they're all identical. Every location um, has something unique about them, whether it's the geotechnical conditions or if it's the number of freeze thaw cycles or the types of temperature extremes and the variability around what that looks like. Um, there are a lot of different things that influence the, the presence of potholes. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Just a quick question following up on that. Uh, I'm surprised by the fact that we're going out to engage others. Um, I mean, I, a motion has directed that. But isn't that part of our ongoing work to keep tweaking how we address asphalt construction potholes? Isn't that something that we've done and for a long time? Yes, it's uh, asphalt is, is something that municipalities invest significantly in and then it's part of our due diligence and making sure that we're getting good value for that investment. Um, you know, and it's a large credit to the work that happens out of the engineering services group where they're continually monitoring the effectiveness of, of our, our recipe. Um, and it's always looking at trying to kind of approach it from a continuous improvement lens. In the past, we've had... Uh, reports like this where we've provided information around some of the work that we're doing with uh, post-secondary education um, like the U of A. Um, we've also had, uh, we sit at uh, the national level at tables with our Transportation Association of Canada where we meet with peers around different th things that they're doing with new products and materials to be able to, all with a focus of being able to extend the service life and extend this, the condition of assets like asphalt. So I don't know how to ask this nicely. Um, what do we really hope to learn from, like, are you expecting something revolutionary or confirm what we're already doing? I, I mean, it's hard to imagine that we haven't been on the cutting edge and moving forward. Well, I, I think um, we're, we're not opposed to doing this work. We're certainly open and transparent about the work that we do around this. Um, we're certainly always willing to learn from whoever and whomever about whatever related to this. And it's uh, a large part of our work often can be done with a, a very inward perspective. We're always looking uh, within our teams, um, you know, extending over the life cycle from folks that are involved in operations um, at the back end to people that are involved in planning at the front end. Um, but if we can learn something from, from somebody outside and if we're missing a perspective and, and we need to... Um, extend this work to be able to do a bit of a check-in with our local industry. Um, I think um, we're certainly open to doing that and, and sharing that information with council as requested. I hope we do learn something new, but I've always been very proud of the fact that we've really been adjusting over time to what we do, so thank you. Um, Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and perhaps just following up on, uh, on Councillor Esslinger's uh, comments there. Uh, I believe it was me that brought forward this motion and it was brought forward in response to uh, several industry partners that were expressing concerns about uh, our asphalt, the quality of our asphalt and our asphalt mix design. So it was to provide this opportunity to have uh, have some uh, industry stakeholders and other, and other third, uh, interested third parties participate in that. And so with respect to the work plan, I just wanted to check in on a couple of details. Um, just reading through the attachment three, 
Uh, and it speaks to a survey or a, a stakeholder survey. Is, is a survey the only opportunity that interested third parties and partner uh, stakeholders might have to get involved in this conversation? This is the first step towards engagement to help prioritize and understand where we would need to prioritize our focus, our efforts around. So the idea was looking through these different industry groups, uh, um, lenses, whether it's academic, uh, surrounding municipalities or construction associations, try to be able to solicit who might be interested, who has a perspective to share, and then from that it would carry on to uh, f further discussion. So if there's a specific stakeholder that you have in mind, Councillor Cartmel, that you'd like us to be able to reach out to, um, we're happy to include whomever uh, that is. Thank, yeah, thank you. I'll connect you in. And, you know, I was just waiting for this opportunity for the, primarily for the work plan uh, report to come back. So, so I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Merlista. Uh, my understanding is that the work then that comes out of the work plan or at the completion of the work plan uh, administration will return to committee in Q2 of 2021. And, and that's where you'll present the findings of any uh, conversations or engagement that you've had. Is that correct? Correct. The, the key outcome there being the prioritized themes and areas for potential future work, which will be reported back to committee. So at that point, we come back and say, um, you know, based on the entire, looking over the entire life cycle of our work, we think that there's the greatest opportunity to be able to take a bit of a deeper dive or do a, some additional research or review um, related to our maintenance standards or our mixed designs. And then from that, we'd be able to inform council on what the implications are of doing that work, what the timelines are, if there's any additional resources that are required, and we'd, we'd share that at that point in time. If we need to refine our practices and procedures to, you know, to uh, address particular concerns, if that it makes the most sense, then that would be the time that we would talk about that. Correct. Yep. Yes? Yes. Uh, we talked a lot yesterday about the quality and, and uh, state of our infrastructure. So I don't want to repeat uh, very much of that today. There's a bit of overlap here. And I really appreciate the uh, information provided in the report with respect to uh, the condition of our roadway system. That's really helpful. Uh, is there something you can share that, that describes how the condition of roadways are assessed? So, for instance, we say that X kilometers of road are in fair condition. X kilometers are in uh, you know, good condition. Um, but can, is there something we can share, sort of a, uh, a higher level document that says how we evaluate that? Is it qualitative or quantitative? Um, because, you know, as, as you know, uh, and as we talked about all day today, there's lots of interested people that have an opinion on the quality of our roads. And it'd be interesting to have that, that common understanding of how we're evaluating the, the state and condition of our road system. Yeah, I might ask... Uh, Mr. Lehman to answer that question. I know the process to be able to um, come up with what's called a pavement quality index takes into account multiple considerations like the crown of the road, the surface deterioration, the types of cracking and whether it's longitudinal or transverse. Um, there are a number of different kind of attributes and technical details that go into shaping how you come out with a, a very specific score. Some of it is quantitative, um, some of it is qualitative, but it's a, a multi-criteria approach. Um, and maybe perhaps Mr. Lehman can augment that. Uh, if I could, Mr. Relief, so I'll just interject. I really appreciate Mr. Lehman's uh, uh, ability to comment on that. We can do that offline if you can share that with me or if there's you know, some document or memo to share just you know, in consideration of committee's time. I'm just, I would like further information that I can refer to and that I can help my, my constituents refer to so that they understand what we think is a good quality pavement and what, where they may disagree or, you know, that kind of a thing. Sure. We can follow up with you offline. Great. Thank you. Thanks for this report today and, and thanks for the report yesterday as well. I really appreciate the work. Thank you. I see no further questions. Councillor Banger, do you want to move to receive this for information? I will, but uh, I want to speak to it briefly. Go ahead. Okay, uh, so anyway, a lot of good work uh, being done, thanks to the administration for that. And, uh, but I hope this work just doesn't um, get buried in the paper there. There is uh, hopefully follow up to it and we get uh, regular reports. I don't know when we do hear from people that Edmonton roads are the worst, it kind of, I guess, hurts. 
So we just want to make sure that uh, we are in uh, constant communication between the council and uh, administration so that we know where our road structure, et cetera, et cetera, has been as compared to the others. Again, thanks a lot. And uh, I'll move recommendation on this. Thank you. I see no one else choosing to speak to it. So with that, I'll call the vote. Please vote. We have four votes. And display the vote. And that is carried. Thank you very much. We are now at item 6.5. So we'll start with administration comments, and then we'll go to our speakers. Uh, Madam Chairperson, committee members, members of council, uh, today we've prepared uh, the report on gravel roads, and in particular maintenance and renewal. Uh, it does reference two external uh, bodies of work in terms of uh, assessing our program and our uh, investment in the maintenance. We have uh, with us this morning or this afternoon uh, Brian Simpson, our branch manager, of Parks and Roads, as well as Eduardo Sosa, our director of uh, infrastructure maintenance, and we have Colin Roy from the IBI group who conducted the uh, external uh, work on this project. So we'd be happy to uh, take any questions following the speakers. Thank you, and we have two speakers. Um, the first one is uh, Francis Roy. You have five minutes. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, Francine. Hello. Um, I have a... Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, I lived in the um, part of Edmonton that was annexed um, off of the 510 uh, in between Edmonton and Beaumont. And um, when we were a part of Leduc, our roads were fantastic. Never had a problem uh, with the roads. When we first moved into that area, that was like a walking path for the residents where we would take, I would take my grandkids up and down on their bikes, on the stroller. Uh, it's impossible to do it now because it's all gravel. It's like a huge rumble strip. And I phone in every week in the summertime, in the spring, summertime, and fall, because we have major potholes. The ro um, Back in this, this summer, they ended up taking all the asphalt off the 510 and redoing our road, but it made it worse. It's just one big rumble, and they've had the gravel or the grader go out there sometimes twice a week. And... Um, it hasn't done any anything. Uh, and when we were part of Leduc, like I said, we never had any problems. Um, and then this spring, the county of Leduc, when the ditches got too full so our property wouldn't flood, they would send out the pumping trucks to, to pump the water away from our property. And um, we have to do that now. Um... Yeah, and like I said, I call in once or twice a week. I'm like the queen, uh, the queen of pothole complainers on on your guys' hotline. Um, so yeah, I guess that's. Uh, I'm just going over my notes here. I think that's. Um, yeah, that's it. I don't know if you guys want the road or the address of it. Well, Ms. Roy, uh, we have one more speaker, and then counselors, if you'll stay on the line, counselors will ask you some questions. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Thank so, you for listening to me, guys. All right, thank you for sharing. So we're going to go to uh, Jane Smith now. And Madam Chair, uh, I was just notified that Jane Smith has withdrawn their request to speak. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Smith is no longer able to speak with us, so... I will open up for counselors' questions. I don't have anyone on the board. Oh, uh, Councillor Banga's just clicked in. So I'll start with Councillor Banga. Please go ahead.
Hi, sorry, I had to shut my phone down. Anyhow, uh, just uh, what the speaker uh, stated, I, my office has been getting complaints, especially between uh, Ellerslie Road and uh, and uh, 17th Street on Beaumont. It, again, uh, they, uh, I heard quite a few people saying that the roads um, were better when they Councillor were under... Councillor Banga, uh, we're asking questions of our speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Okay. Roy. Yeah. Do you no, have I questions for her? Um, her? Yeah, but anyway, uh, my question to the speaker is what kind of... Uh, when you're saying uh, you are, uh, you can't and uh, bike or do whatever. Could you be able to uh, discuss more in detail? What would be like? What What is the real concern? Is it uh, Is it the gravel? Is it the dust? Is it the water damage? Like what What is the most important? Hi, it's Francine. Um, the problem with the road is the four, I'm not sure what you guys call it. I call it Chinese asphalt. Um, that's what we had. And then over the first couple of years, you guys, like the first year, you guys would just gravel, uh, just go over it with the graders, tear up that asphalt that we had, and it created it to be um, like gravel. So, and then with the young kids, it just is not a place where you want to take the kids, the younger kids on a bike. Like, I, I'll still ride my bike to go get my, my, my mail at the end of the street. But it's not a place you want to take the kids falling off onto the gravel, uh, the younger kids. It's not a place I want to take a stroller in the winter or in the spring. It's like potholes. Um, and I did have damage on my car. Um, it's just not what we had when we were Leduc. It's disappointing. Okay. So could you be able to tell me approximately where you are located? Yes. I am on 56th Avenue and 80th Street Southwest. I am just um, south of Summerside. Okay. Yeah. No, I got it. So, um, I'm just uh, on a road there. The, the road is, it's about a two kilometer road, maybe. It, it, it's a two kilometer road, and it's, it's a nightmare. Okay. And I'm just trying to picture that road because I, I live in that area, uh, area. So, it's right along where the transmission lines go. Okay. I got it now. Thank you. Yeah, there's a uh, one, two, three, four, five, five, uh, sometimes up to six different families that live on that road. A couple of horse ranchers. And of course, I'm right at the very end, so I have to hit every pothole going home. Okay, thank you very much. We'll ask those questions from administration. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roy. I don't see any further questions, but Councillor Banga did indicate we'll ask those questions of our administration. Thank you very much for your time today and sharing with us your concerns. And now we'll turn our, okay. we'll turn our attention towards the administration, and we'll start with Councillor Banga. Please go ahead. Thank you. So um, we heard the concerns from uh, our speaker, and we heard that, I heard that concern many times from others before. But if I'm reading the report correctly, we are, we are uh, following the same standards that everybody else is following. So could you be able to tell me where is the issue. 
So, Councillor, uh, it's Gord Seberg. I'll start uh, by just providing a little bit of overview, uh, and then I'll have Mr. Uh, Sosa provide some more details. So I think part of the challenge is the condition of uh, the roads that we uh, inherited from uh, the annexation. Certainly, uh, we're not in as good a condition as we initially in, uh, anticipated that they would be. So we've been uh, tasked with doing quite a bit more maintenance than we had anticipated initially. So there was a, a situation that the roads weren't actually what we had anticipated they would be. So Mr. Sosa's team has been pretty, uh, pretty diligent in trying to stay on top of it, but it's been a bit of a catch-up uh, game in terms of the... Uh, condition and, and staying on top of it because of the, the deteriorated condition it's required significant more uh, work and it's also been more susceptible when we do get the rains and such so with that I'm going to ask Mr. Sosa to provide a little bit more insight into the work he's done as well as some of the challenges and again we do also have uh, our consultant on the line that did the uh, independent assessment of the program Thank you, Gord. Um, yeah, I think uh, I want to start by uh, acknowledging that this, been, this has been a process in terms of uh, annexing uh, the areas in the Old Leduc uh, County. And I also want to assure Council and our residents that we are listening and learning uh, in order to lead effectively the maintenance of these roads. And specifically, something that happened recently um, was also getting a specific maintenance data from uh, the county in terms of what were specific locations and practices that they for decades have been maintaining in a specific way. And one of the things uh, that they shared uh, is uh, the benefit of a winter graveling uh, program, which we are going to start piloting this winter. So again, uh, listening uh, and learning from uh, those experts that have been maintaining those roads that are um, that don't have specific engineering information uh, in terms of soil condition, drainage pattern, uh, traffic impact assessments, and even hydrological assessments. And and all, those, uh, all these type of information that we need to manage those roads uh, proactively, those have been identified by the consultant uh, in terms of long-term um, actions. So, um, so overall, uh, I think one practice that uh, will improve the conditions uh, overall uh, is a pilot winter graveling program in a specific areas. Uh, given how we had uh, different type of pre pre precipitations in 2019, for example, where we had almost double the amount of rain that we typically get uh, in the city. Uh, those, uh, the spring conditions have been particularly challenging, and those uh, spring conditions has actually uh, allow us, as Mr. Uh, Seabrook said, to be always on catch-up mode uh, for these roads. So we are hoping that putting gravel down through the winter, uh, following some of the practices as the county has shared with us, that will allow us to buy some time uh, through, the, through the spring time and actually preserve uh, some of the structures uh, in the road. So uh, overall, it's been a learning uh, for the city to take over these assets and we are uh, engaging with our counterparts in Leduc to be able to provide a better service to our residents. Okay, and then uh, my next question is about uh, our city's approach for maintaining gravel roads. Does it differ from, from uh, Leduc county, uh, county? And if so, in what ways? Are we in constant consultation with them, like what they did or what they, we are doing right now? Yeah, um, that's a question, uh, Councillor Banga, and and actually I want to elevate that uh, and more not not to only focus on on the Leduc area, but also on the overall city. So we have different type of on paved roads uh, in many of the different wards that we have here in the city, and some of those roads don't have the same structure uh, that we have in the Leduc annex area. Some of those roads have different engineering standards. So what we did with a third party. Uh, consultant was 
to look at actual engineering standards uh, or best practices that we should follow for different type of unpaved roads. And as they, uh, as they confirmed, we are following those best uh, practices. There are specific um, improvements or opportunities for specific areas uh, that those have been also um, identified. But uh, overall, in some examples, they actually found our practices to be exceeding uh, industry best practices. And some of those have been attached uh, to the report that we have provided today. Thank you. My time's up, but I do have a, more questions once everybody's on. Great. Right, so click on again. We'll go to Councillor. Henderson. Well, just curious about one thing, you know, having listened to uh, Ms. Roy's story, it sounds like we have changed actually the treatment that we're using from what uh, the county would have used. Um, I'm, I'm just guessing what was on there before, but it sounds like it was some kind of um, rough uh, asphalt on top, of, on top of a gravel base. Uh, and I'm just wondering if that if that's our practice, and that we've that we've gone from that, taken that off, and put the gravel on. Um, I mean, I can imagine why we might have done that, but I just wondered a bit. I just thought I was curious about um, how we dealt with those kind of situations, where it may be because I, I I saw in the report we had oiled roads and we had right uh, unoiled gravel roads, but the kind of product it sounds like she's referring to which I'm guessing was just a thin asphalt layer over a gravel base, um, is something that we don't use. Is that, is that part of what's happening here? Councillor Henderson, it's Jason. Uh, the specific reference that the, the resident used, I'd say, is uncharacteristic or doesn't have any legitimacy in terms of its uh, reference. And I just want to be able to specifically identify yeah. that. Um, I believe um, what she's referring to is cold mix asphalt, which is a product which essentially uses an in situ type of situation where yeah. you use um, existing gravel and you mix oil essentially in situ in, in place on, on the existing roadway. So it's basically, um, there's no instrument that allows for bonding of the asphalt with the oil. It does yeah. help um, a little bit, um, but it's not a perfect solution. It helps with dust suppression. It holds some of the major product together, but it's not, and that's why we, we um, reference it as a gravel road because it actually hasn't been properly bound oh, together. Oh, no, I, I understand it isn't. I'm, but what I'm wondering is, is if our practice is different, if that's part of what's happening here is, is our practice in terms of going with a true gravel road rather than that kind of mixed product, it, would there be a shift there? Perhaps Mr. Sosa could answer, yeah. but I know cold mix is, is one of the, one of the systems tools we that use. we use from yeah. a maintenance perspective. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Melista. Yeah, basically, when we took over the roads in the annex area, we did look at what type of material we had uh, on those roads, and we referred to them uh, in our report specifically uh, with, with basically um, roads being created by pushing material into the center of the road without following any specific engineering standards, different to what we have in some of our uh, industrial areas. So uh, they are called great roads uh, in some part uh, of the states where basically you put up the material, including some organics, and then you cap it with some gravel, then you put some calcium chloride in there, and then you have some kind of a crusty surface. Um, we have not uh, intentionally changed the road surface in, in the annex area. So basically to try to allow the residents to maintain the same service level that they had before. So, and that has actually, um, uh, that has actually required that our maintenance teams not only do, you know, the consistent graveling or profiling that we usually do, but basically we have a mismatch of different maintenance standards, which we are trying to regain now by, number one, replacing some of the bases uh, in some areas where drainage has actually uh, undermined the structure uh, of the roads. So uh, and I mentioned this just to give you an example with the type of asset that we're managing. So to your point, it's not, uh, are, are not roads 
built based on the standards that we have. Yeah. And our maintenance response is truly to try to provide the best service levels by matching what's uh, in there uh, and, and reacting uh, sometimes to uh, weather patterns, which are challenging, like last year we had uh, twice the precipitation that we had, uh, and also working uh, in the overall area trying to provide a certain type of uh, drainage uh, so that we don't have uh, compromised bases uh, so, everywhere. So is it, is it possible, therefore, that um, by, going, by going to our treatment of the gravel, you might end up with a better base for vehicles, but have created a product that might be less good for the kids on the bikes? That's possible, then, I'm guessing. So it may have improved one condition, but actually changed another. Yeah, and we, we haven't truly really changed uh, the actual surface uh, on the roads specifically. Uh, what we are trying to do, though, is to strengthen the road structure yeah. by yeah. putting down more gravel so that we have less recurrent of failure uh, throughout the network. Um, so, and uh, also really listening and learning from, from the residents. Uh, I, you know, I, we are really proud of the team basically speaking on a weekly basis with uh, with the residents um, uh, in those specific areas just to be able to match uh, the service levels that uh, we have. But to your point, uh, more the ongoing construction and catch-up that we've been in, that, that might have created challenges for some road users. So Short-term sure. change may give long-term benefit. Yeah, okay. I'm Agreed. out of time. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just have a question about the drainage. Um, the speaker talked about... Uh, Previously, Lee Duke would come along and drain the ditches, and now they're responsible. And I'm just wondering um, uh, how that impacts the road conditions. Um, I, it's alluded to in the report from IBI, but it wasn't the scope that they were looking at. So could you speak to me about that? Is it a factor? Should Is that one of the reasons that they're seeing something different? Uh, perhaps I'll have Mr. Simpson just provide some in details on the drainage work that we've been undertaking. We're working to get a mic for you. It's coming here. There we go. We can hear you now. Sorry about that. Yes, Councillor, we, the, the drainage is very much part of the road structure in terms of just uh, what the impacts may be on the actual road design and impacts to the road. Uh, we're doing work in the, with the drainage relative to when we have impacts and when we see it. We're trying to get ahead of it and get an asset understanding in terms of what we have in the rural areas. Uh, this process is not part of EBCOR as Fortis has these areas. So that's another challenge in terms of the process that we're working through. Have a good working relationship uh, with the utilities, but the drainage piece does actually fall to the city for maintaining these roads right now. So is that a factor, because we're working through that, the, about the road conditions? Uh, I, I guess the speaker said now that they have to, to pay to drain their ditches. And, uh, just speak to me about that. Yeah, we, we do respond to uh, drainage issues uh, in terms of impacts to the roads, and if we do need to re, uh, do repairs or maintain those roads. So it is a factor in the process, but I can let uh, Mr. Sosa speak to that because we have been doing this on an ongoing basis as a, as a service. Yeah, thank you, Brian. We have actually uh, been uh, doing a lot of pumping uh, of uh, spring melt uh, uh, throughout different locations in the Ledux uh, Annex uh, area. Uh, there are some uh, some practices that are more around uh, historical components that the county used to do um, 
partnering with uh, some some residents basically uh, to prevent uh, some roads uh, failure. So what we are doing right now is connecting with uh, the county to get uh, specific locations where we know if flooding occurs there, then the road uh, will be um, will suffer uh, some of the consequences. But um, overall, as Mr. Uh, Simpson said, we have uh, been taking on many of the activities around uh, drainage, including uh, culverts, uh, replacing uh, many uh, of them, uh, and also doing some localized uh, ditch um, repairs. Uh, and profiling. Uh, this year, particularly, we had one of the biggest uh, ditch profiling projects that, that we had uh, uh, in city history, basically, uh, aligning some of the, some of the storm water flow uh, in, in, in the area. Uh, we can actually commit to, to also uh, reaching out uh, to uh, Ms. Roy, so to make sure that we uh, can learn more about uh, the specific area that she's uh, referring to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Those are all my questions. I'll go to Councillor Katarina. Thank you for that and thanks for the report. So just remind me, uh, the annexation happened. We took responsibility a year and a half ago, two years ago. So this is what, the second winter now that we're going through or second summer or second spring? Yes, Councillor, we, we, this was the completion of the second summer and we'll be going into our second winter. Right. So, I mean, it hasn't been a lot of time in that. And uh, so, Mr. Seabrook, uh, you know, you've mentioned it, uh, Eduardo's mentioned it, others have mentioned it, that you're learning. Uh, so tell me what the difference is between Leduc County annexation and uh, Sturgeon County annexation to our north. What, what's the difference? Since we've had that uh, for the last 45 years, no learnings. We're just learning now on how to deal with uh, rural. Uh, Councilor, no, I think we've been dealing with rural roads for uh, <coughs> a period of time. And certainly um, we have a, a practice and a procedure which was outlined in, in the report. Uh, I think what we found, again, I alluded to earlier, was the fact that the condition of the roads uh, in Leduc County in the areas that we annexed was not to the same level uh, that we had anticipated, and and we're playing a lot of catch-up now. Uh, I think that was part of the challenge, was that the infrastructure was was less than what we were um, led to, to believe, and I think yep. we were also in a situation where uh, we probably had a different maintenance program than Leduc, as Mr. Uh, so said, uh, spoke to some of the differences. So um, not that they were doing it wrong or we were doing it wrong. It was just different, and we're trying to get the condition of the, the base and the network up to a, a sufficient level that it'll be easier to maintain. Um, and then also, you know, we, we are a different um, municipality, so the process of engagement with uh, with the res the new residents is is probably a little bit different than what they were used to. We've certainly placed a lot of emphasis on trying to uh, work with them on a regular basis so that they have um, you know they have contact points with us. Okay, so the question uh, can you answer the second part of it. What's the difference between Leduc County and Sturgeon County, and more specific, Horse Hill? In terms of the, the county, uh, the, the condition of the roads? Yes, yeah, the conditions of the roads. They're both rural. They both have about 700 uh, residences, uh, the same. The only difference uh, uh, that I can think of is that one is two years old and one is 45 years old. So, so what I are you doing up north that you're not doing down south or vice versa? at this point in time, because it seems to me that there's been plenty of uh, years worth of uh, experience uh, with rural, residential, and county lands, uh, and we're still learning today. So uh, um, maybe it wasn't clear. So I, the process that we're using in terms of maintenance, I think, was outlined in, in the report, but it, it is consistent in both areas again, but we're trying to, to bring the um, 
condition of the roads up. So the big difference is we've had to put a little more effort into bringing the condition up to um, what we would call a you know a, a consistent level. So perhaps Mr. Sosa can speak to some of the specifics in terms of the differences between the actual road conditions in the two uh, different areas. For sure, yeah, uh, maybe uh, just boil it down to uh, is one better condition than the other? They both in the same condition as each other. Yeah, I'll say there are factors that are absolutely different uh, between the two areas. And, uh, and namely, those uh, factors are number one, traffic volumes. Uh, number two, uh, vehicle weight. Uh, also, the specific hydrological uh, conditions uh, of the area uh, and also uh, soil conditions. So those parameters uh, will not... Um, make for both areas to be comparable. Um, and this is what's unique about maintenance and, and construction practices, that even if you build two houses yeah. next to yeah. each yeah. other, Mr. you can Kuzla, find... Can you tell me which one's in better condition today? Well, there Just are... In general, which, which roads are in better condition from the two areas? I think there are challenges uh, in both. Uh, Councillor, we have actually uh, identified uh, several opportunities in the northeast uh, section uh, of the city uh, as well, and we've been also working with residents uh, in those areas as well. So I'll say uh, rural roads uh, overall, in, uh, specifically unpaved, they are sensitive to things like weather, uh, drainage. Uh, in the northeast specifically, we have challenges with uh, beaver dams uh, that are flooding the roads, and we are intrinsically working uh, to get those to a better uh, condition. So they're hard to compare, but overall, I think we are uh, keeping an eye on both closely and putting our best foot forward to maintain them. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one more speaker, and it's 3.30, or one more question from Councillor Banga. Uh, I just want consensus. We could finish this item before we take the break. Noddings? Perfect. Okay. Great. So Councillor Banga, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just a couple more questions. Um, uh, our process for uh, managing gravel, uh, gravel roads is it, uh, again, is it same throughout the city or is it different for different areas depending upon the soil conditions and et cetera, et cetera? Because that might explain some of the differences uh, why certain roads are in uh, seemingly worse condition than the others. Councillor Banga, it's Jason speaking again. I, I can offer that different areas of the city do experience different geotechnical conditions and hydrological conditions as referenced by Mr. Sosa. And both of those and the presence of water and the ability for the road to drain um, influence the, the rate of deterioration of those roadways. So depending, that's the information that helps inform what we want to put into our design for building new roads, but it's also part of the information that helps inform why a road might deteriorate at a different rate um, than another road. Um, just to respond to the previous question too, that the condition of the roadways, the gravel roads in the north and the south are relatively comparable in terms of their existing condition. Okay, that's good. And then my next question is about, uh, um, about upgrading of these roads. So these roads, are not going to be upgraded until a developer comes along and uh, I guess develops a subdivision. Would that be correct? Councillor Banga, I, I think that the report next to this actually, the Meridian Street, outlines a couple different paths for council to decide, you know, given the context of Meridian Street, that the same options that are presented as part of that report could be applied anywhere. And I just um, bring, bring to your attention again the work that we're doing as part of our um, municipal stimulus program funding that uh, council approved. So we are going through and specifically within the areas where the industrial roads, which have gravel roads, uh, we are upgrading the condition of those. That's, that's referenced as growth because we're increasing um, the pavement structure 
So we are um, converting those from gravel to asphalt roads within the industrial areas. So that was a choice that council made to invest and put capital resources, capital funding behind those projects. Okay. And since the damage uh, to the roads is caused by uh, traffic volume, uh, drainage, number of vehicles on the road, and of course the weight of the vehicles. Could you tell me who mon monitors the weight restrictions? Is it the city or is it somebody else? Community standards for the bylaw process, uh, does it also, the city police through their commercial, commercial truck uh, unit would also monitor those, Councillor? Okay. And uh, would you be uh, able to comment on how aggressive we are in that aspect? What I can say, we will set the road bands in place uh, based on the weather changes. And if we see an issue with a particular road, we'll notify uh, community standards just to be aware of it and be on the lookout for. Two challenges we have in the rural area are potentially overweights and also the illegal dumping of uh, litter into the rural areas. Okay. Uh, Ms. Sousa, I got one more question for you. Um, I see some roads, they are, uh, I would uh, take an example of 34 feet from, from Ellerslie to Anthony Handy. This road is probably getting repaired about, I would say, minimum four to five times in summer. At what point in time we think, or you think, uh, it is going to be upgraded to a priority where the cost of maintenance is more than, more than uh, uh, cost of uh, revitalization in the in the, I guess, short run? Yeah, that's, that, that's a really good question, uh, Councillor Banga. So, um, yes, we do need to go uh, to some areas to make sure that we maintain access uh, and proper service level to our residents. And uh, we also work together with our life cycle management team uh, in, in IIS. And they are working uh, on on creating an asset management plan for uh, unpaved roads where uh, some of those aspects are going to be clearly defined um, and also um, basically uh, approved on uh, uh, as a corporation. Um, so basically we do find uh, opportunities uh, to rehab section of the roads when the maintenance uh, is, is becoming too, too taxing. Um, in our recruits, and those are basically um, those are basically say uh, ad hoc, unique uh, type of projects where we work together uh, with our capital team to work uh, and to define where can we uh, rehab instead of uh, maintaining. Um, I'll pass it on to Mr. Melista or to Mr. Lehman if they have anything to add. Yeah, I, uh, all I can offer is that the the work that that happens at a maintenance level is closely coordinated and integrated with the work that we do from a capital planning perspective. So the work in order to make sure that we're being proper good stewards of the investments that are happening at a maintenance level and at a capital level, the work needs to be coordinated and planned uh, together. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'll move the recommendation. Thank you. So there's moved receipt of information. Anyone wishing to speak to it? Uh, no, it's all good. Thank you. Seeing that, please vote. We have four votes. Display the vote. And that is carried. We will take our 15-minute break. We'll uh, recess until 4 o'clock, and we still have 6, 6, and 6, 9 to do. And Thank Madam you. Chair, just for your awareness, Chris Nicholas, who was the registered speaker on item 66, has withdrawn his request to speak. Okay. Thank you.
Pardon? Act three. Act three. Do I need to do another roll call? Uh, if you wouldn't mind. So I'm just confirming. I see Councillor Banga, and I see Councillor Katarina, and Councillor Henderson and I are here, so I think we're good. They're all waving now. <laughs> so we're all back. And we're going to go on to item 6.6. .6. Uh, good afternoon, committee. Uh, we've got a short presentation for this item. I've got Kim Petron here, who's the branch manager of development services, and Kelly Sizer, who's the general supervisor, one of the general supervisors in development services, who's going to do the presentation. Over to you, Kelly. I hope they're online. Oh, Thank you. Go. Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Sizer, and I'm speaking today about Meridian Street upgrading options. Next slide, please. The typical process for upgrading and constructing roads in developing areas is that the developers fund and complete construction to an urban standard. Costs are shared with other developers for arterial roads up to four lanes through the arterial roads for assessment bylaw. Required upgrades are determined at subdivision and conditioned through a servicing agreement. The first stage in a new neighborhood typically constructs an arterial road from an existing urbanized roadway to the access point of the new subdivision. This ensures that new residents have an upgraded surface to drive on, including pedestrian facilities. And in some areas, these upgrades can be considerable. Administration negotiates and works in collaboration with developers to determine arterial roadway upgrades that can accommodate growth, enhance safety, meet residents' expectations, and allow for a financial investment that permits development to proceed. Quarry Ridge was developed prior to the arterial roads for assessment bylaw and without a neighborhood plan in place. It did not see the arterial roadway upgrades that we expect with the new development today. Administration is currently working with active developers in Horse Hill to negotiate staged upgrades to Meridian Street as reflected on this slide and shown in three stages. But there are currently no committed timelines for construction. Next um, slide, please. Options for Meridian Street upgrading were reviewed and next steps are the following. Current levels of roadway maintenance will continue annually in the months of May to October, including blading of the cold mixed portion of roadway every two weeks or on an as needed basis as received through 311 notifications. Administration will continue negotiations with developers for staged arterial upgrades. The portion of Meridian Street between 153rd Avenue and 161 Avenue will be reviewed and considered for possible municipal stimulus program funding. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. We will be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, and we'll open it up for speakers. My understanding is the uh, registered speaker is, has withdrawn the request to speak. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so we'll open up the speakers now. We'll start uh, with uh, Councillor Henderson. Did you have questions? Uh, I selected this because there was a speaker, so no, I don't have any questions. Okay, we'll go to Councillor Katarina. Uh, thank you for uh, for that. So, um, in recent uh, history, this past uh, uh, in the think number of months, we had a uh, development application uh, uh, there between one fifty third and one sixty seventh for development, which would have been the first one in the area since the NSPs were uh, were done. Uh, that was refused by council. So if, am I correct in saying that if that development would have uh, proceeded, uh, that the developer would have contributed two and a half million dollars to that road upgrade, uh, but yet we saw fit not to uh, approve that development. So now we're left at our own device uh, uh, in maintenance and possibly city funds going to improve that uh, stretch of road. Uh, Councillor Katarina, it's uh, Ms. Petron here. Just um, the application that Council considered was related to a rezoning application 
and the nature of um, the recommendation from administration to refuse that application was based on policy. There was no approved neighborhood structure plan for that area. Um, and so the, the subsequent processes would have included subdivision up, uh, the subdivision application and requirements, but that, that application was refused because there was no neighborhood structure plan. Yeah, in place there, as there was no uh, neighborhood structure plan with Quarry Ridge phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, but the city saw fit to uh, approve those. And uh, uh, this one would have uh, fit basically across the street from Quarry Ridge which they would have had the benefit of uh, that two and a half million dollars. Am I correct on that uh, point, Ms. Petra? That the developer uh, would have contributed to the upgrades of that uh, stretch of road? I don't have the details of what the contributions would have been associated with the subdivision. There was an application that we had received, but we were in the process of, uh, it wasn't approved. so. Um, it is my understanding, though, that in and around um, that $2 million was uh, approximately what the contribution would have been. Right. So that, that's, yeah, just a confirmation that you understood the same thing that I understood, that uh, this could have been developer-driven uh, and paid for. Uh, now we have to find a way to uh, uh, actually pay for it ourselves if we want to uh, make those upgrades. Yeah, and, and Councillor Katarina, those are the many trade-offs associated with the, and ultimately the decision that Council made to refuse that application. The zoning itself wouldn't have included the contribution. It would have still been the servicing agreement. So, uh, right, yeah. yeah, no, uh, uh, understood. I guess I just wanted to, uh, to make sure that I understood uh, uh, that application and what the contribution could have been. Uh, uh, to it, I know that there's development uh, being proposed that will come later on uh, uh, for uh, approval or not uh, further north uh, of uh, of that site uh, uh, of that uh, intersection of 167. So, okay, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, uh, could you uh, remind me why when this uh, uh, Quarry Ridge was developed. Why wasn't uh, the similar condition applied to that area? Because that, that would have solved at least a portion of the problem. Councillor Banga, um, for the original stage of Quarry Ridge there, um, it was a similar situation where that rezoning and associated subdivision applications were approved despite a neighborhood structure plan being in place. Uh, or being in place, sorry. And there were subdivision conditions associated with some upgrades, but because of changes to Anthony Henday, um, it has impacted how the access area works in that area. Okay. And uh, then my next question is about uh, um, the municipal uh, grant there. Is it, is it uh, MSP? Is it... Uh, when we applied to have this road done, is it with all the other roads or is it just this road? Councillor Banga, it's Jason Malifsta speaking. Uh, the MSP applications that we brought forward to Council in September, um, as part of that $115 million contribution under that grant, we did include an application for $43.3 million of primarily industrial road upgrading. Within that program, though, we did include a smaller contingency for emergent needs in rural areas of approximately $5 million. And I just, um, we could probably spend that money three times over. I just want to be able to caution that it is limited. It's $5 million. And that's really all we had in terms of the available funding within that program for that types of type of work. So administration is working on prioritizing um, different potential candidates um, based on uh, a, multi uh, a number of criteria to help um, identify how or where that $5 million should be, should be spent and we can uh, provide that information to Council and we have that analysis complete. Okay. Is, uh, what would be the, I guess, the cost to repair or actually improve this road from that section uh, that's indicated in the 
in the, I guess, the information package? I believe at a very high level, we're anticipating it could be up to approximately a million dollars. It's a relatively short section, so just to upgrade it on the basis of, uh, so essentially just paving it with hot mix asphalt, so not upgrading it in terms of adding additional amenities or sidewalks or curbs or underground services or utilities, but just simply paving it could be upwards of approximately a million dollars. All right. And uh, just a uh, concern, uh, I guess I got to represent my area there. Is it in any way this portion is uh, being accelerated and uh, some others left behind? Perhaps I'll let Jason speak to the capital budget prioritization, but at the end of the day, for development, it's developer-driven. So the fa phasing and staging of development within new neighborhoods is based on when uh, new development is coming online. Uh, for the component of uh, this that's being looked at for the capital fund, it's put through a pretty rigorous um, capital budget prioritization criteria and it would not it would it would have to go through that criteria uh, process before we'd make that recommendation to council okay thanks a lot councillor Benga. just to add um to that just to be clear that what we're working through in terms of advancing upgrades for this area of meridian street is working with the area developers um to negotiate a staged approach to having it upgraded not necessarily accel accelerating it it's it's developer driven Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Henderson, then Paquette. Well, uh, this is sort of, Quarry Ridge is just before my time, I think, but I wouldn't mind some history on that because I think, you know, to follow up on Councillor um, Katarina's uh, observations, you know, what we're paying for right now is the price of letting a development go ahead without a plan being in place, a larger plan in place, correct? I mean, if there'd been an NSP, if there, if there'd been an NSP in place when Quarry Ridge went ahead, which the council decided decided not to wait for, and I think it was contentious at the time for exactly that reason. Um, this would have been dealt with. Yeah, Councillor Henderson, and that's why we brought that last uh, rezoning forward with a non-support because there's not a plan in place there. Yeah, um, and and I guess the other piece of that puzzle is when Quarry Ridge did go ahead there must have been an understanding at that point that this road could be a long time to come before it got paved, that, you know, the green light was given on Quarry Ridge, understanding that the, in, the existing infrastructure was the existing infrastructure. Is that, is that the case, that is, or is, have I missed something? No, that is my understanding, that that was communicated at the time, uh, that there would be uh, challenges um, as a result of that, uh, but... Uh, yeah, that's, that's the information in the context I have. I'm not sure if anybody else would like to add to that from the project team. Councillor Henderson, I would just add at the time that phase one of Quarry Ridge was advanced, um, it was an application that was uh, recommended that not, would not be supported again, yep. given similar to the recent Quarry Ridge application where there was no neighbourhood structure plan uh, in terms of the policy direction for that area. Yeah, that, 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 that was, I, I have a vague memory of that, although it wasn't, I wasn't part of that debate. Um, so at this point, ultimately it will get taken care of by an ARA, um, which I'm guessing Quarry Ridge will be a non-participant in. They're going to get it for free. Is that also true? So um, in terms of what we're working with the active area developers to negotiate, um, you know, there, there is a, a basin and I'll, I'll maybe let Kelly Massizer uh, speak to that further in terms of the existing residents. Yeah, because um, how would we, how could we retroact, we, we, we don't have a mechanism for retroactively collecting from them, I don't imagine, do we? Ms. Sizer? Councillor Henderson, that's correct. So that land has been developed, and unless it redevelops, it will not be charged ARA fees. Um, the ARA assessments will be charged of any new developments that go into the area. So the, so the irony of this is, if and when it gets paved, um, everybody else will pay for it, and it'll, it'll go into the price of their, of, their, of their housing, and Quarry Ridge will essentially get use of it. Yes? 
Yes, at the time when Quarry Ridge was developed, there were some negotiated rural upgrades that did take place. So there were some upgrades attached to that development at that time, not to the standard that we see today, though. Uh, higher standards or lower standards? Uh, the rural upgrade would have been a lower standard. So it didn't include things like underground um, infrastructure, sidewalks, which we would typically see with an urban cross section, gotcha. and that's required so, in yeah. the arterial so, road. So when this gets done, it will be a, it'll be a much higher standard than it is today. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's helpful. Just getting a bit of the history. Thank you. Thank you, and Councillor Paquette. Thank you. Um, welcome to the north side. So, how on earth? Do, uh, so this was basically just council deciding to go ahead and leapfrog development to allow this community to be built. Is that correct? I would say not quite, Councillor Paquette. Okay. Um, I would like clarification because this is really a, a thorn in uh, the side of the residents of Quarry Ridge who have bought into the area and built all in, uh, in good faith that the city was operating in good faith with them. The assumptions at the time, some of the assumptions have changed over time. So Quarry Ridge was advanced based on the upgrades and access via 167th Avenue. And at the time, Northeast um, Anthony Hende was not in the picture. So the traffic flows in the area have definitely changed. Yeah. Um, and the information that council would have had, council at that time, definitely had different information than, than what we have here now. Okay, so they had an access road that got disrupted by the construction of the Hende, forcing people to use Meridian now as one of their main routes out of the area. Um, and of course, we know the situation with Meridian, which is why we're here. There was no neighborhood structure plan. So I'm really failing to understand the logic here, because even if they had this access on 167, if there was no neighborhood structure plan, this really was a leapfrog of development, was it not? And Ms. Petron had spoke from a previous question. She can answer, uh, answer it again, that at the time administration had brought forward uh, a non-support of this and the council made the decision to support it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now we're in a situation that uh, what happened happened. We've got to deal with it now. We know that developers are working right now on a neighborhood structure plan. We also know that the money that would go into this road is $2 million dollars would not have built out Meridian. That was going to infrastructure, not that segment of Meridian exclusively. Is that right? Go ahead, Ms. Blazer. Meridian would have been the first stage of development. So um, that probably would have contributed to uh, upgrades of that portion because it provides access to Quarry Ridge and also the Marquis neighborhood, which is the currently active development today. Okay, but we would still be in the same position of having no neighborhood structure plan because there would be no impetus to create one if that other development had gone through. Potentially. Most likely. Yeah, yeah. okay. But now we're going to be getting a neighborhood structure plan, which will facilitate the actual building of the road. The question we have before us then, in my mind, is do we invest in, in the creation of this road, of upgrading it, knowing that there's a neighborhood structure plan coming and knowing that there is a desire to continue to build in the area. So we know that we will get recouped and it actually won't be a very extended period of time before we get recouped that in investment. So thoughts on that? That's ultimately the trade-off before council in terms of there's a lot of asks in the capital budget and where do you put the, the funding? We are working with the developers in the area right now on a negotiated agreement and perhaps Ms. Petron or Ms. Sizer could add some more to where we are at with that. Okay, because this road is also used by Evergreen, it's used by folks living uh, north of this area and it's been we what do we spend like fifty five thousand dollars a year on this road over what the past ten years or more? Uh, when you add it up, I mean we're getting to a point where it's kind of it, it kind of begs the question: Why don't we just deal with this? It is a challenge, Councillor Paquette. Um, we don't have the budget to fund this arterial road, and it is an obligation of the area developers. Um, but nonetheless, we do have a number of developers working in the area that we're negotiating um, various ways to see improvements to Meridian Street. And it's really balancing both the residents' expectation, which is what, we're, what you're hearing, um, with servicing standards, safety, uh, the financial implications to the basin, as well as, you know, looking at how we're supporting or accommodating growth. Yeah, sure. 
Now, uh, one thing we can basically, all things being equal, without any major disruptions, we can basically assume that with a neighborhood structure plan and uh, based on that, we can now uh, approve new development because there is actually a plan uh, that within the next few years we will see movement on Meridian. Is that what I'm hearing? It's my understanding that there is um, intentions to move forward with a neighborhood structure plan within the, the neighborhood by Quarry Ridge, um, which would allow for us to be in a position to support rezoning in the subsequent planning processes, which is subdivision servicing agreement, and we would see the improvements to Meridian Street that way. Okay. And uh, that'll, I think they're coming back with an application this, uh, you know, within the year. And uh, at that point, uh, as ground breaks, we know that we can either uh, expect Meridians to start developing uh, fairly soon after that, or we can jump the gun and maybe start, um, you know, six months or 18 months before that. Is that basically, do I have the, the gist of it? If the city took it on, we could start a little earlier. If we leave it to developers, it'll start a little later, but either way, it's going to happen. For the, the city to take it on, we need, we need to find uh, the funding and budget to do so. But nonetheless, yep. yes, you've got the, the approach and process right if a developer uh, intends to advance the projects okay. in that area. So, Councillor right. Burkett, your time's up. It looks like you. you might need a second round. I have no one else on the table if you want to request a second round. If that's okay, I beg the indulgence of the committee. They're all, oh, wait a minute, I have Councillor Katarina, so you'll have to sign up and come back around. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Councillor uh, Katarina. That's not to jump in. I know somebody had asked for uh, why some of the decisions were made and when they were made about Quarry Ridge because it was out of the ordinary. Uh, that preceded prior to 2007. So Councillor Henderson and I were not there for that discussion. Quarry Ridge 1 happened for whatever reasons it happened, uh, before the hand day was uh, even contemplated uh, there for 167th. And the reason for that, if, if nobody remembers, uh, was the fact that we wanted mixed use even back then. And the only thing that Northeast had was low valued homes. And this was the mixed use that would bring us to a standard as everyone else in the city a little higher priced product. And that's why Quarry Ridge was uh, uh, first established. Phase two and three uh, made sense because of the fact that phase one had gone ahead and there was room for phase two and three at the time. So that's sort of the background behind, uh, behind this. And obviously the thinking uh, in 05 or 04 when this thing actually started was completely different than what we're uh, thinking uh, today as uh, as a city. So there's no blame to go around on why it's there. It doesn't matter why it's there. It's there. And now the area needs to develop. So, and it'll do so uh, systematically with the uh, rules that we have in place today. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. And back to you, Councillor Paquette. Thank you. And that's a good point. Uh, Hopefully we're not leaving future councils with uh, bizarre decisions. So um, at this point though, um, we say we can't afford it or we don't have it in the budget. So obviously that would be a choice of council, but we are spending $55,000 a year on maintenance. I don't know what we're spending on snow clearing. And I don't know what the cost is to businesses who have to reroute because they simply can't use that road. So if you add it all up, it seems to me that we're throwing uh, money away on this road when we could just be dealing with it. So I'm just wondering if it actually, um, in the end, when it come, all comes out in the wash, if we actually get ahead budgetarily by just the city going ahead and, and uh, finishing this segment and uh, then collecting back the fees from developers uh, over the next couple of years. And I'd just love to hear uh, if we've done any analysis on that or if there's any thoughts on that because there really are costs and they do mount, especially over time. Uh, potentially, and perhaps Jason can add a bit more on the payback periods of some of the analysis that we've done, but I think the challenge is that this is probably not just, this isn't the only road like this in the entire city. And so uh, if you were to look at it overall, it's probably more than, more than one road. And so it's 
more than just a, a $1 million um, issue before council as you look through the budget process. Jason, did you want to add to the payback periods? Yeah, no, exactly. You've got it right. It's, uh, it isn't just one road in isolation. There are a number of locations around the city where we're put in similar positions. So I'm hearing an echo or a something. Um, the, uh, sorry, that just threw me off a little bit. Um, the payback period for this one specifically, what we're looking at in terms of the pavement life of if we were to just simply upgrade it to a hot mix asphalt roadway and pave it, the million dollar, up to a million dollar fix that I referenced earlier, would likely be about 10, 10 to maybe 15 years. So if you think about $55,000 a year, it would be probably in excess of 20 years to pay it back. So the payback period doesn't equate for the investment. And that's where to be able to fix it, we need to fix it right and probably minimize the amount of throwaway money that we're putting at this by looking towards the permanent and long-term solution of the urban urban cross-section. Okay, I'm a little bit confused if I about just... the payback question. Sorry, uh, just... So one is the investment that we make to maintain this road the way it is. And then the other is developers would be paying into uh, um, the road itself. So I'm not sure I'm understanding the timeline or what we're referencing. Just sorry, I'm doing straight um, a straight um, equation around. So not looking at the lost business impacts and some of the softer costs that you're referring to that I'm just looking at the direct city administrative costs to support the maintenance. So $55,000 a year in 20 years, roughly, you would generate $1 million worth of investment. So that's 20 years for an investment that would last 10 to 15 years. And okay. And that's assuming that we get no money from developers to pay back into the road. But that's obviously not going to happen. Correct. So it's not 20 years. Correct. That's simply looking at uh, the equation from a city investment perspective based on our existing patterns of maintenance. Right. Now, back to the question about there are other road segments like this across the city. Is, are, were the conditions here at Quarry Ridge the impetus for these other road segments, like the reason for them? And also, do these other road segments, do they have the same kind of history and the same kind of uh, resi resident uh, frustration around them? Because if you ask me, I I've heard about Meridian uh, the whole time I've lived uh, in Edmonton and aware of the city, but I haven't heard of these other road segments. So it just seems like there may be a little bit of a, um, you know, maybe they're not exactly um, good com uh, comparisons to each other. And Councillor Paquette, perhaps not the exact same history, but definitely um, different histories with different contexts that give us some of the same traffic problems. So Ellerslie Road, I don't know, is one that came to the top of my mind. Uh, and there's others I know for sure um, out there. So, uh, you know, uh, there's also um, the, the level of uh, standard to which the road has been constructed. And we run into issues with that as well because the design and construction standards have changed over time. So, you know, there's definitely other challenges out there. Okay, well, uh, I think we need a strategy on this. I'm out of time, but if anyone wants to answer, that would be great. Councillor, we've outlined what we think is the best strategy here is that we continue to negotiate with the developers in the basin and and uh, uh, see what we can do uh, in this as well as uh, prioritize this in the overall capital budget ask. Thank you. I'm, I'm way over time. So at this point, at this point, receiving this information allows it to go through the next steps as suggested as just confirming that. That's correct. So that would continue your negotiation with uh, developers and follow the schedule as suggested here in stages. That's correct, Councillor. So I'm looking for a motion to receive for information. I'll move this uh, for information, Madam Chair. Thank you. That's moved by Councillor Katarina. Did you wish to speak to it? 
No, thank you. Okay, I have Councillor Henderson as well. Well, just just for clarity, because uh, I think this is the reality is if if we believed that it was that developers were going to step up and do this in the next few years, I think this was Councillor Paquette's point that you you know that you might we might be able to save ourselves two or three years of fifty five thousand by starting it now. But the thing that we would start now would have to be the full build, which is a lot more than a million dollars, correct? That would, that, the million dollars just buys us something we would tear out in three years. Yeah, correct. I, I made an assumption based on, on the questioning. I, w I wasn't sure if Councillor Paquette was specifically referring to the rural upgrading right. or the urban upgrading. Well, no, I think his model only makes sense if we, if we, if we go with the full, if we go with the full mail deal now, which, and, and, and there's, all we would be really doing at that point for the risk of sitting there and having to finance it for a decade or more, depending on when it gets built, um, we would uh, we would save ourselves fifty five thousand a year. And I'm guessing the financing would be more than fifty five thousand a year. Yes, yes. Yeah, to, and I, I'm, I'm to not have a throwaway product. Speculating too that perhaps maybe Miss McCabe or Miss Petrin could confirm or Miss Sizer, but uh, if we were expecting any kind of a form of recovery through the ARI, um bylaw. By the participating developers in that area, it would be towards the permanent, ultimate yeah. um, construction. Yeah. So, so the only point in doing the temporary one is if we thought it was going to be there for twenty years, then we might break even. Exactly. If we if we were speculating that the development activity could be prolonged based on current conditions, or that that's where you're right. That's, yeah. So, so probably from a short term point of view, it is actually probably less to us to wait, assuming, you know, because there's a gamble with us going in and doing it. Um, if we do it, we could be sitting on significant debt for, for a significant period of time if the developers don't step up and start building it themselves, correct? Correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I see no one else on the floor wanting to speak to it. Then I would call. Um, if, it, if it's okay, sir, I couldn't click onto the. Um, but is it okay if I say a few words? Yes, I thought you might, but I hadn't seen you clicking in. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I do want to thank administration for the work they put into this. I mean, it is good information. We've got a number of scenarios to chew on. And uh, Councillor Henderson makes a good point. This is really, you know, we have to balance, especially now, how we uh, approach the budget, what we do with debt financing, what we don't. Also understanding that we anticipate, uh, you know, a moderate amount of growth uh, in the next several years, which means that, again, within a year we'll be uh, approached again with development plans, but also with um, a bit of a neighborhood structure plan. So we will have more surety and we will have um, uh, a more sensible way forward um, it's not ideal for the residents because they would love to have that road done 10 years ago, but we are where we are. And uh, the fact is that within the next several years, there will be a finished road and to the standards uh, of an urban standard, not a rural standard. So um, it is a bit more of a wait. Uh, I do lament the fact that we may be losing uh, a few bucks uh, on a road that we're not going to keep at this point, but uh, Councilor Henderson does make a, a very good point if we were to build it out to that standard. So um, the lesson learned here is that, uh, you know, we just need uh, more sensible plans when it comes to development so that no one is sort of left in the lurch, which is a little bit of what's happened to the folks who moved into the Quarry Ridge area. And that's just a flag I think that we should always have going into the future is that the people of Edmonton expect us to actually be approving plans that make sense and that are actually implementable for the benefit of the, of the residents. They don't expect us to approve plans that end up hooping us down the road. They don't expect us to approve new neighborhoods with low density that just end up costing us more and make it so that we can't even afford to give them the standard that they should have by living in the city. And I think that, we've, that we're going to accomplish that with the city plan, but many of the frustrations from the decisions of the past persist, and we're dealing with them, and we're living with them, 
uh, and that is a frustration. And so, you know, in the end, this is really, it all circles right back to um, the city's responsibility in setting uh, the stage so that there isn't a massive split between uh, suburban and urban and, uh, you know, that we actually have these really good conversations with developers about responsibility to the people who buy into our plans because they expect us to have very, very good plans that will benefit them uh, for trusting us with their investment in our city. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else on the board to speak, I will call the question. Please vote. We have four votes. Display the vote. And that is carried. Thank you. And now we are moving on to 6-9. Good afternoon, committee. We've got a short, or just got some quick opening comments for this item as well. We've got Kim Petron, the branch manager of development services here, Travis Pollock, the director of planning coordination, and Holly Mickelson, one of the senior planners in planning coordination as well. And recognizing the restrictive nature of the zoning in central McDougal that limits the opportunities for existing commercial and industrial buildings, administration intends to advance option three as noted in the report, as it retains the redevelopment emphasis in the area redevelopment plans vision, while providing for increased flexibility for existing business owners and balances the time and financial costs for administration. The administration will provide the amendments, conduct public engagement, and return to a future City Council public hearing uh, prior to the summer of 2021. Uh, that uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, we'll open it up for questions. Um, oh, there it is. Councillor McCain, you would, are oh. ready to go? Yeah, and I, I'll try to be really quick, and I appreciate uh, committee's indulgence on this. I just wanted to double check. So option four might actually be the prudent option, but we're uh, you're recommending option three because of the constraints the city would be under as far as finances and capacity to do that bigger amount of work, yes? Correct. Uh, so option three is a, uh, we'll say a quick um, zoning bylaw change to the existing zone that addresses the immediate problem of uh, not allowing businesses to be created uh, unless they operate in a brand new mixed use building. Right. Now in this work, would it allow, and, and I'm trying to remember this, could a residential project be proposed without needing to be mixed use or do we still have that sort of requirement built in there? So currently the zone actually doesn't mandate that it be mixed use. Uh, it can only uh, house new commercial development if it is mixed use. So if there's, if there's that residential component, so it's not, it's the opposite of uh, what you're saying right now, councillor, is that in order to have commercial, you have to have the residential, but you don't need to have commercial in order to have the residential. Right. Uh, I think this is a really great piece of work and I really uh, appreciate it. And it means, does it not, that if you've got an old light industrial warehouse, you could convert it into a commercial use um, without having to go through major rezoning once once this work is done. Correct. Um, and and you don't need any sort of motion from committee or council to do this work. You're it's on your agenda, and you're going to return in the spring. I think you said. That's right. Correct. Good. Well, thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Well, so having been around when the plan was developed, I, I just wanted to do a couple of quick double checks. So the advantage to option three is it actually leaves the essence of the plan in place correct but allows for a little bit of flexibility um, in in being able to repurpose existing commercial buildings one it does and two that it takes some it allows for 
uh, for some smaller buildings to be considered that wouldn't have been considered before that there was minimum number of, of the so that's that's the other piece in option three is it allows is it means you don't have to, to necessarily build the, the kind of density that was originally expected in some you know because that's been restricting some of the smaller sites is that am I capture, capturing it correct currently you have to build a minimum of 50 units in order to right. get that mixed use part so we're just removing that condition to be it a little bit more permissive right so you could now build mixed use with you could it, it still would have to have a residential component unless it's an existing building but it doesn't have to have as many residential units as it would have had to have before is that essentially correct it? Um, correct Right. So, I mean, theoretically, that could be still applied to some of the bigger units, bigger bigger lots, but that's not the reason we're doing it. Hopefully, anybody sitting on a larger piece of land is not going to do that anyway, because economically, it probably, they'll, they'll want to do the, the larger unit count. I mean, there's a risk there, but it's probably a low risk. Is that fair to say? Yes, I would say it's low risk, uh, and the trade-off being that the additional opportunity to create activity and vibrancy through the, the new businesses that would open up in the existing buildings or a smaller building that's not 50 units. Yeah. So what we're hoping is that people can use smaller lots without having to assemble larger pieces of land. Correct. And there, there's a risk that they could use a larger piece of, they could under underdevelop a larger piece of land, but that's probably not likely given what they're probably going to have to pay for it. Yeah, given the location uh, just across uh, the street from downtown and uh, the likelihood of them not maximizing their their lot is quite low. Right. Okay, good. Great, thanks. I just thought I'd do a double check because I know there were parts of this that were really important to the community, And but we, we've done a check-in with them on this, have we, or is that the next step? Uh, we've checked in with both the Beat North Edge BIA yeah. and the community yeah. league on okay. it. That would probably catch the people that I know had a lot of invested in this, so as long as they're aware of it because um, we hear from them every time we get with us. So, great, thank you. Are you willing to move it? Receive? Happy to move this receipt for information and expect to see it back probably in the form we have it in front of us as a real bylaw. Great. Does anyone want to speak to that? Councillor McKean, did you want to speak to that? I, You've disappeared uh, on. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I would just uh, thank the administration, uh, Travis, Stephanie, and others who worked on this. Uh, it's good work, thank you. Thank you with that, I will call the vote. Please vote. Display the vote. And that is carried. That concludes our agenda today and uh, I need to ask for notices of motions and councillor inquiries because I forgot earlier. I see none. I uh, had not received any, but we wanted to give you that opportunity. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Good night. <laughs>